Nintendo. Welcome to All Star 2024. Hey, superstars. Get ready for a new season of NACT. This year, we're gonna be dialing up the intensity like never before. We're gonna have two rounds of open qualifiers so we can give more teams and more players the opportunity to join this tournament. This season, you can team up with friends from anywhere around the world. The NACT battlefield just got more diverse and thrilling. This season, the winning champions will be heading to Saudi Arabia to represent North America at the MSC. This season, I'm not just aiming to win, I'm here to dominate and show that my journey to the top is just beginning. Watch out NACT, the best is yet to come. For next NACT and next international tournament like MSC, you're probably going to see me play with some of my older teammates. Who you gotta, you gotta reply to what he says. More assassin games.
The Ohio Brothers stand. The Brothers! Stay tuned, everyone. You won't want to miss what happens next. NACT 2024 spring season. Registration starts February 4th. Showcase your skills on this grand stage. It's time to make your mark in history. In the world of NACT, every single player has one dream, to raise the ultimate trophy. It builds alliances. It defines rivalries. And it creates superstars. The only question is, who will be next? A little bit of a contest from Ramsey's, but by himself, I don't think he'll be able to pull it off of Black Dragon. Yeah, he's and actually Pro Destroy is very low here right now. It doesn't actually want to get into this fight. You can see him sleeps looking for the kill. Is he gonna be able to find it? Pro Destroy still alive, looking for the retribution, looking for an opportunity on the backside. Uga Booga laying waste on the Gahari. Pro Destroy finds the retribution. In a good position. Go down, looking for some damage. Here comes the last insanity. Mystic Gush is out, but oh. Nicolai with great positioning. Tarzan still gets the turtle. White Chicken able to get the I'm offended. Tarzan Cutie goes down. Maybe they should have just gone for the Lord, but they decide not to. They want to try to force this right here. But Jay is bursted. Shark back on the field. Area 77 are falling. Did they push it too far? Gaming Gladiators don't come to our base just yet. Cutie does pop to Purify, so they get that out before the turtle. Best Ooh. player able to hint out in the bush, get the Violent Requiem off onto Tarzan Cutie. And Tarzan Cutie goes down first blood. Lapu with the bravest fighter forces to get Ooh. away, but no, finally a nice two-man stun, but the Minoan's Fury able to delay them just enough time. Oh my foe finds Templus, and Ramsey's now on the run as well. Sleeps looking for a target though, trying to lock on Momo here. Ramsey's has fallen. It's three members down for Bloodhounds. Make it four. The exact oh, wait a second. Nice suppression. Nice grab. They're able to get the kill on a Sayori. No black shoes for her. Oh my foe takes a turtle. Gets it to welcome. Lands it down. Ugabu takes a lot of damage. Tries to dash away, but Nakoko is on the trail. The last insanity gets the kill. Oh my. And now a clash to the midside. Violent Requiem locks on my foe, but he still stands tall. Finally falls, but takes Ramsey with him. Fiends is definitely up right now. Uneven gonna dash in, looking for Kush there. Mikasa with the last insanity. Still not enough damage. Final slash able to lock on. But Bonnie and Protostory here to help out. Yato on the run, gonna get stunned up. But Protostory taking a whole lot of damage. Karu oh. once again with the blazing duet. Able to shred down several members and oh. down goes T, Toru, Yato. Cutie Gang not looking too good right now. Fly Chicken trying to close the distance. Black Shoes pops, but it brings Mark Cutie back into all members. Welcome to home. Gaming Gladiators is here. Knock, knock, FBI. They're kicking down the door right now. A terrified Jay Cutie falls. Mark Cutie going to be next. Fly Chicken, Fly Keto, Puck Keto. Take them to their graves. GG takes game number two. It's time. It's a little bit of a contest from Ramsey's, but by himself, I don't think he'll be able to pull it off of Black Dragon. 
Yeah, he's and actually Pro Destroy is very low here right now. It doesn't actually want to get into this fight. You can see him sleeps looking for the kill. Is he going to be able to find it? Pro Destroy still alive, looking for the retribution, looking for an opportunity on the backside. Uga Booga laying waste on the Gahari. Pro Destroy finds the retribution. In a good position. Go down, looking for some damage. Here comes the last insanity. Mystic Gush is out, but oh. Nicolo with great positioning. Tarzan still gets the turtle. White Chicken able to get the I'm offended. Tarzan Cutie goes down. Maybe they should have just gone for the lore, but they decide not to. They want to try to force this right here. But Jay is bursted. Shark back on the field. Area 77 are falling. Did they push it too far? Gaming Gladiators don't come to our base just yet. Cutie does pop to Purify, so they get that out before the turtle. Best Ooh. player able to hint out in the bush. Get the Violent Requiem off onto Tarzan Cutie. And Tarzan Cutie goes down first blood. Lapu with the bravest fighter, forces you to get Ooh. away, but no, finally a nice two-man stun, but the Minoan's Fury able to delay them just enough time. Oh my foe finds Templus, and Ramsey's now on the run as well. Sleeps looking for a target though, trying to lock onto Momo here. Ramsey's has fallen. It's three members down for Bloodhounds. Make it four. The exact oh, wait a second. Nice suppression. Nice grab. They're able to get the kill onto Sayori. No black shoes for her. Oh my foe takes a turtle. Gets it to Tona's welcome. Lands it down. Ugabu takes a lot of damage. Tries to dash away, but Nakoko is on the trail. The last insanity gets the kill. Oh and now a clash of the midside. Violent Requiem locks on my foe, but he still stands tall. Finally falls, but takes Ramsey with him. Fiends is definitely up right now. Uneven gonna dash in, looking for Kush there. Mikasa with the last insanity, still not enough damage. Final slash able to lock on, but Churro Bonnie and Pro Destroy here to help out. Yato on the run, gonna get stunned up, but Pro Destroy taking a whole lot of damage. Karu oh. once again with the Blazing Duet, able to shred down several members. and. Oh. for another year of MLBB Esports. And our vision of creating excellence is crystal clear. We've expanded this year's playoff structure to three stage qualifiers to ensure the most deserving teams move on to the next round. The long format playoff bracket brings the most captivating matches so the action never stops. Each team in the North America Challenger Tournament has a chance to qualify for many of our global events like the Mid-Season Cup. So they better come ready to dominate because it has more teams and the biggest prize pool in MLBB history. But for now, they better keep their eye on the prize. Over $25,000 and tons of diamonds. The competition is stacked and the teams are ready to prove themselves. It's time to dig deep, focus up, and see what team will stand out from the rest. So, are you ready to meet the teams? Bloodhounds. Their roster is united and full of charisma, but does Boca have what it takes to lead his team to Vegas? Area 77. They have proven that they have what it takes to succeed, but will they put it all together this season? Devious Activity. They've assembled a team of powerhouse players from former NACT Titans, but will their skill and determination allow them to dominate the bracket? Bloodthirsty Kings. It's Moba Zane's third refreshed roster in three years. Will this be the one, or will it be his last dance? Fiends. They have emerging synergy and skill, but will they be able to compete with the best of the best? Legacy. With a last-minute surge, Legacy narrowly secured their NACT spot. Will they ride this momentum to the top of the bracket? The Night Horde. They've already defied expectations, but can they continue this push for greatness? Game and Gladiators. With a squad full of NACT champions, will anyone step up to snatch the crown or will the Gladiators dominate once again? The teams are locked and loaded and the world is watching. This is the NACT Spring Season 2024. Who will have their name etched into glory?
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the NACT spring season, week number two. Last week was full of excitement as we opened up the gates for the top eight teams competing. And hey, now we're back at it again to see these teams rise up for points before we step into the playoffs. Joined on the desk with me, I have the amazing UA, the Rush Hour duo is back that you've seen cast inside of Los, uh, Long Beach, California. UA, how are you doing? Oh, no, it's been a great show going on. You know, thinking back to Long Beach, California, we definitely had a good meetup to uh, push the rush hour, but now we're back in business for NACT. Lots of great, exciting matches, especially the last one for today. But before we go in it, uh, we got a lot of exciting news to come to you guys with. That's right. And first off, to start off the schedule, for what we will be seeing today, it is going to be Area 77 going up against Bloodhounds. Both of these teams are going to be fighting it out in a best of three. Bloodhounds currently sitting in that last position, needing to find a way to climb back up that ladder, whereas Area 77 still doing pretty decent at that fourth place. Right after that will be the Night Horde up against Devious Activity in UA. Why don't you take us through the remaining series? Yeah, so we got Legacy versus Fiends right after that exciting match. It is between a team that doesn't is trying to climb out of that zero position and also Fiends trying to defend their spots. And for our last match of today, we have the most exciting match, the one that the people has been all waiting for. It is going to be between BTK and Gaming Gladiator. I know it's definitely been the talk. Everybody wondering who will we be able to rise to the occasion against these two teams. We saw them fight against each other in the open qualifiers and Gaming Gladiators was able to push through. But speaking of pushing through, let's go ahead and take a look at the season format. And yeah, the season format is coming on to your screen. We do have eight teams playing in a round robin season format. Every team is only going to be playing each other once. So it's very important that every single time they do match up against any teams, they're trying to get that victory. It is going to be a best of three series. But now we do have a point system coming through. Three points for teams that do get that 2-0. Two points when they get the two and one. And of course, if they still get a point, if they get a win in any of those series, then they still get that point. So I think it's really important that a lot of these teams are playing their best in every single match, Weezy. That's right. And speaking of matches, let's go ahead and swing on over to our playoffs bracket. And now looking at the playoffs format, as you are going to be seeing it, all these teams fighting it out through each round in a best of three all the way up into the semi and grand finals. The grand finals will be a best of seven location still being disclosed on where it will be. But nonetheless, only two teams will make it out of the regular uh, out of the playoffs into the grand finals to fight it out, not only for the titles champion for the NACT spring season, but also to be able to compete in MSC for that three million dollar cash prize. But speaking of prize pool, here's what we're looking at for the NACT spring season. Yeah, there's a $25,000 grand prize total and lots of more diamonds added onto that. So, you know, each of these teams is a really, really big prize pool. And, you know, every single one of these teams are trying their best to get onto the very top spot to earn some cash to bring home, maybe grab up a new device or try to fly out to some vacation, Weezy. That's right. A lot on the line for this NACT spring season. And not to mention a little bit of a bonus with this season. Every single series that a team wins is an extra $100 in their team's pocket to rise those stakes even higher. But yeah, we talked about the points, right? We're all everybody competing in a point system similar to MPL uh, Philippines. And currently the number one position is held by Gaming Gladiator sitting at six points right behind him in second place is Devious Activity. Third will be Fiends, then Area 77. BTK tied up with Area 77 for that fourth position. Then you have the Night Horde behind them. Bloodhounds and Legacy tied at last place. And today, there's going to be a lot of amazing matches on the way to kind of climb up that ladder. I think one of the most anticipated ones that I'm looking forward to seeing is uh, Bloodhounds up against Area 77, right? Bloodhounds, they're a team that we've seen competing time and time again in the NACT and able to get a little bit higher than the previous one. So this season, they haven't had the hottest start, but they need this victory over Area 77 to kind of have a higher position on the points. Yeah, they're really trying to uh, climb out of that last place position. If they can get any wins off the aliens, of course, that's going to be quite good. But Area 77 has also been a team that has quite dominated in a lot of the performance they had played against the, the, the series against Gaming Gladiators, almost took a game off of them. So definitely a very strong team to look out for. But Bloodhounds also, you know, a formidable opponent. We've seen them quite a bit in a lot of the NACTs before they have been, you know, kind of the staple team. So, 
you know, this time around, maybe we get to see them turn things around because so far they just haven't found the success that they're looking for. Yeah, I mean, these teams are rising to the occasion as we progress through these NACTs. I mean, Area 77, they took the world by a storm with their debut up against BTK. They were able to get a 2-0 sweep against them, looking stronger than ever. They're possibly the strongest Area 77 we've seen in a long time. So, Bloodhounds definitely going to have to bring their A game if they want a chance to take them down. I mean, we saw last uh, Sunday... Bloodhounds did lose over there to the Night Horde. They got swept. And then before that, they were also swept by Fiends, the up-and-coming team with some brand new faces on the scene again, who also uh, was one of the first to take down Gosu. So, I mean, that's another team that I'm kind of keeping my, a close eye on, uh, the new faces of North America, possibly a dark horse in the making, as uh, they'll be fighting it out today, too. We'll be seeing them go up against Legacy. Uh, and speaking of new faces, they've got Assassin Riles on their team. Barely made it into the NACT spring season in that final position after the open qualifiers. And now we're gonna see, can they fight it out, especially with the uh, the top teams in North America? Yeah, and I think this is a very important match for both Legacy and Bloodhounds if they want to stay competing in the NACT, right? Both of them are still on the very bottom of the bracket, but these are still the strongest teams in North America, right? We cannot count Legacy and Bloodhounds out, even if they haven't gotten the success that they're looking for. There's still plenty of matches being played. This is only week two, day one, so plenty of actions coming through. And yeah, I know you talked about Legacy and the Fiends, but what about the last match coming through between <laughs> BTK and Gaming Gladiators? Because I know all the fans out there are waiting for that, waking up, putting their alarm clock set. Like, it's going to be an exciting match. Well, the thing is, this is the only time we'll be able to see them face each other in the entire regular season, which is a bold statement already with this being a single round robin. Now, we saw Gaming Gladiators go up against BTK in the open qualifiers. It went in Gaming Gladiators' favor, though. Mobazane, he, put, he picked the Fredrin. I was actually able to catch that game. And they put a lot of CC against him, which really punished him inside of his jungle and rotating around the map. And uh, maybe they have a game plan to work around that now. But now, uh, speaking of these teams getting ready to fight it out, let's go ahead and take a look at Area 70. Yeah, so A77 actually has come into a roster swap. Jules QT is going to be taking the mid position away from Mark QT. And this is quite interesting, right? We perform extremely well uh, during the last uh, NACT. So this time around, I'm glad we get to see him back into the action. A77 with the roster. ISO onto the gold lane JQT in the Rome position. The imports player along with Yurishi on the XP and we have Tarzan QT. The QT gangs have come in line like Power Rangers and they're definitely trying to push their lead up in this series. Yeah, and without Mark Cutie being on the team, how will it impact the rotations? I mean, Mark Cutie was the one getting those MVPs. He used to be a marksman, switched to the gold lane or the mid lane last minute for this new Area 77 lineup. But he's been performing. He's had such a high hero pool, and he's been able to kind of provide what the team needed to push through the victories they had, especially the game up against uh, BTK. But now, with Jules Cutie on the scene, somebody who's probably been playing that role a little bit longer than Mark Cutie, is that going to be what they need to take it up a notch and maintain not only that fourth position, but climb even higher on that ladder? But speaking of their opponents and speaking about these games, let's take a look at the Bloodhounds. Mm, another roster swap coming through. It's going to be Ramsey for Templis coming through. And, you know, we've seen Ramsey kind of dominate in a lot of the performance, especially on the XP lane. Sometimes he does kind of do the multi roll and go into the jungle. But this time around, Templis is going to be taking over the XP position. And, you know, Bloodhounds has secured this roster where they've always kind of played with the same group of people that's why we've seen bloodhounds quite consistently you know get into the top eight position quite often so this time around having templis back into the roster it might just make the difference to get them to you know a point standing here but their team coming through sleeps is going to be coming through in the gold position uga booga is going to be their roam boca the team captain and the mage player the voice of the team easy peasy the jungler the the fighter the martis god the savages and you know templis rounding out their whole entire team yeah, I mean, in Bloodhounds, they need this victory, right? Changing their roster, kind of similar to Area 77, but a different position inside the XP lane could definitely affect their synergy. Now, they haven't had the hottest debut. Like we said, they haven't won a single game this entire regular season, but maybe today will be the difference, especially with the new additions, some new faces on the team to be able to fight it out. And I think that's what we're all going to be kind of keeping an eye on. We know Bloodhounds is the team that has fought time and time again in multiple NACTs, multiple tournaments on the North American scene, and they have what it takes to go that extra mile. 
but these teams are evolving and area 77 they definitely have showed their merit so far i mean they took down btk with the 2-0 sweep not too many teams have ever done that in NACT up against a team like BTK. <laughs> Usually you see BTK and Gaming Gladiators go almost undefeated unless they face each other, uh, which we will be seeing today. So we'll see how that kind of plays out. But this is going to be huge for the Bloodhounds, right? They need a victory here. They need to claim a match. That way they can have a better standing, at least in their favor though. With the point system, everybody will still be playing it out in the playoffs, but this will determine who they face in the playoffs. If you sit in that eighth position, then you could have an opening day one of the playoffs going up against possibly a, a team like Gaming Gladiators, uh, and that's not the team you want to face for day one of a playoffs. Yeah, that's most definitely not. So Bloodhound's trying really hard to climb through. I do think there's a lot of potential coming out from both of these teams, right? If they decide to sweep and, you know, if they're able to get so, they do rank up in points and they deny the opportunity of the other teams and it completely shifts the standing and i feel like the standings right now it's still quite skewed right some teams have gotten a better uh standing in the beginning not playing against you know the strongest of the strongest warming up to it but bloodhounds right now they definitely have to cross this uh th this block of wall because a77 is the team that is still beatable um, you know, we haven't seen them contend for the championship in quite some time. It's always between, you know, BTK and a uh, gaming gladiators, just like you said earlier. But it's still really important that Bloodhounds is able to get over this hump because this is one of the closer matches, I think, in our series. So, you know, A77 right here, they definitely have to play quite well and, you know, get this victory on their end too because the, the standing isn't that great so far for them too. They, they, they definitely wish they were like the top you know one two teams but they're only in standing four behind the fiends so both teams have a lot to lose and a lot to gain in the series yeah i mean just looking at area 77 we were talking about bloodhounds on what they needed just to claim a single point in this entire season uh, to get up <laughs> on that ladder they haven't even left the ground yet <laughs> but looking at uh, area 77 i mean they're hanging on in that middle point right they lost to gaming gladiators which prospectively is um the best team out at least with the statistics right now sitting at that number one position and uh they were able to beat the team that was previously in the number two position which was btk so now it's like okay where do you go from here they need to be able to secure a victory against majority of these teams so that they can have a good team to face off inside of the playoffs and taking down btk was a great start for them but now it's like these are teams that cannot afford to lose to right i mean you can't beat btk and then lose to the team that's in the, the <laughs> last position because then it's really like i'm scratching my head and wondering where do we kind of put this team as uh, we jump through the regular season. So it's definitely going to be something we're going to be keeping a close eye on. Like I said, both sides have changed their rosters. And at least from what we've seen in the North American scene, every time there's a roster switch, it doesn't usually work out in a team's favor. You can definitely tell like some of the synergy is off, but hopefully it will be good for both sides as we are going to be jumping into the draft. Game number one, it is going to be Bloodhounds up against Area 77 and a couple of bands already on the table. Yeah, the Minotaur, uh, the Nolan, and also the Varia export has been taken off the shelves. Now, it's quite interesting. North America has developed a meta, especially the love for the Barats, right? I think a lot of the teams have been picking that up. We're talking about GGs, we're talking about BTK. So, for the side of Bloodhounds, maybe they're looking to take out or deny that pick because I know A77, they love to pick up the Barats, especially in the hands of Tarzan. On the other hand, Bloodhounds have been quite good with a lot of the fighting junglers, um, especially on Easy Peasy's hand. So definitely look to uh, draft up Martis potentially or taking that up early on. So, you know, the draft has been opened by both sides so far, but the, you know, the long range mage Navaria has been taken off the board. Yeah, Navaria has been taken off. It's one of those mages we typically don't see uh, in play anymore as it's always banned out. But the Vexana up for grabs and this time Bloodhounds may be able to get it. You know, funny fact. Bloodhounds has not gotten a single Navaria this entire NACT, and maybe that's the reason that they're not winning. You know, I'm just going to point it out there. The Vexana is one of the highest uh, win rates over there. I think you said, like, what was it, 60%, 70%, something like that yep. for the NACT. And, hey, it's up for grabs. Do they take it here? I mean, I, I honestly think it's worth it. It's not something you want to give to a team like Area 77, who, on the other end, has been able to pull out that Vexana and dominate. Uh, but it's not going to be Mark Cutie on their side. It's actually going to be Jules Cutie. So we'll have to see if he can put that same pressure on for the aliens. But hey, speaking of picks, there it is. Vex on a first time debut for the Bloodhounds. Yeah, and in terms of NACT, the Vexana has won nine 
out of 11 matches. So quite a very high win rate in that perspective. And I, I do think the matches that Vexana did lose was against the Navaria. So this time around, they should be able to pick this one up without too much of a counter. Now the response coming out from A77, they decided to pick up the CC, securing in that XP position. I feel like there is other picks that are quite viable. You could go for the Ruby, the Arlot, which both has been let go. The Joy also is available now, but the Angela gets picked up by Jules Cutie. And it's quite interesting because we thought Jules Cutie was subbing in for the uh, Mage position, but you know, the Angela gets picked up so early on in the draft. There's definitely a combination paired with the CC, paired with the Joy to embody some of the back lines that Bloodhounds is looking to draft here. I feel like Angela is just one of those heroes that's a secret weapon, right? A lot of people overlook the utility that she provides to the team. Able to stay from afar, get something like an Ice Cream Wand, provide some slow, use a heart guard, jump onto one of your teammates and keep them alive through the heart of the battle. And this means that they may pick a frontline hero such as a Barat, who is still currently available on the table. Boxia is also Ooh. another valid option. Now, you Boxia actually just got taken over there from the Bloodhound, so we may be seeing a Barat paired up with that Angela. I think it still would work out. There is a carry and a Vexana to go against those, so it can be a little bit challenging, but again, that Angela and that Barats combination is just something that works out really well and synergizes to keep them alive, not only for the neutral objectives, but stops teams from invading, especially with a player like uh, Boxia. Boxia is mm -hmm. one of the most mobile junglers. He's beefy as well, and he likes to take that fight to the enemy side of the jungle. Uh, but speaking oh. of picks, going a little three-dimensional here, Area 77, gonna go ahead and pick up that hair. Yeah, this is something that we've seen quite a bit, especially in the North America's pro circuit. The hair to go up against the carry. And even in Asia, a lot of the teams like to pick that, right? The short range Harith, along with the same exact range of the carry, the Harith should be able to trade out pretty much every single opportunity he can, especially in the early game when carry doesn't have that much damage. So it definitely a good pickup and a good counter move by the side of A77. But this makes me wonder though, right? The Arlot, the Joy, both has not been picked up by either one of those teams. But we do see a Kufra being banned out. I know, Weezy, you talked about this earlier before the draft. Ooga Booga has been known to be a menace on the Kufra. And, you know, honestly, we haven't seen Ooga Booga perform quite as well as we expect them to. But I do think we are on this week too, where both of these teams are warmed up. So maybe Ooga Booga is going to have something up his sleeve to be able to deal with the aggressiveness coming out from A77. You know, it's funny. Um, I thought a Joy would have been possibly picked up from Area 77, but now that the Harris in there, I don't know if they go the Joy because that'd be a, a lot of mm -hmm. magic. That's three magic uh, dealers on the side of Area 77. So I don't even think they'll go the Joy route now that they decided to go that Harris. Funny story though, this is the first time Area 77 has picked up the Harith this entire NACT regular season as well. And I am right there with you on picking it to counter that carry. It's just been, it's just been shown time and time again. It's an excellent counter to deal some damage. Now, we're looking at the uh, the side of Area 77, right? They have the CC, very mobile hero, great in the XP lane, able to outcut and pretty much outperform whoever she goes against. It may be a little bit of a challenge though, especially up against a Boxia who likes to take that fight up close and personal. He can throw that shield out on her and make her a little bit slower in her tracks. But as we are seeing some of the picks on the board, we are gonna see that Kufra band out and the Kaja, no suppression on the table, trying to limit the roam capability over there from Bloodhounds. Now, they may want to go in for support i mean they could go in for some additional cc they could even pick up a um a ruby if they really wanted to to provide some cc on their side but hey there it goes there goes the barats we were talking about <laughs> with the angela combination back in effect it's literally like thanos just collecting those infinity stones and waiting to snap his finger as they jump into the land of dawn but there are some problems on the table the carry can give him some trouble alongside the vexana who can rain down that cc so we'll have to see how this plays out for both sides yeah, I think Bloodhounds, now they're missing that XP and also the roam position. So something like an Arlot could be flexed onto both sides. I know Ooga Booga loves to pick up the child. That could also be an opportunity there for them, forcing out the Purify uh, for the Herod, right? Uh, but I do think the Arlot can be a potential if they want to look for a suppression, maybe even the Franco, right? We've seen the Franco do so well against the Dinosaur, especially when the hitbox is so enlarged. Right, you could get a couple iron hooks and you know that can turn the whole Ooh. entire fight, but they don't go for the hooker. They go for the <laughs> other guy. The mince tar gets picked up by Uga Booga and Templis completes the Bloodhound draft with the glue pick.
They went for a hook, but it just in a little bit of a different way with that Minsethar. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going to be interesting to see. I haven't seen a Minsethar in effect for a very long time. Now, this oh. is Booga Booga we're talking about. He likes to get creative. On the other side, though, Area 77 will lock in this Tigreal. I think it can work out. He is going to have to watch out for that uh, Minsethar, though. Definitely grabbing him uh, could be a possible way to stop him from getting the sets he's looking for. And the King's calling on top of that to deny the uh, abilities from him. Now, the glue is interesting as well. Uh, this is the first time we're getting to see uh, Templus in the scene. A little bit of a replacement last second. The glue, the last player we've seen run it was Fried Chicken. And he did really well on it. Honestly, he was being such a bully inside of the XP lane. And I think it'll still work out. Now, my question for the Bloodhounds is, where does Ooga Booga go with this, right? I mean, we've seen him run multiple different heroes. And a lot of the times, it just didn't work out in the way he expected. Uh, where him getting shut down within the first few minutes of the game was the little bit of the, the tipping point for the other side to take the advantage and, and ultimately win some of these games off of them. With the Minsethar, he's going to have to play a little far, try and get some hooks to grab the team in and then drop a King's Calling onto the neutral objectives. If he can play a little passive, but still know how to be aggressive with the Spears, I think it'll work out in his favor. Now, Looking at Area 77, though, they've got some great things on the board. Not only do they have the TIG for the Group CC, they have the strong front line from the Verats to combo with it, CC for the mobility, Harith for that up-close and personal damage, and then they also have Angela to keep the team alive. I I'm wondering, without having a traditional Marksman, though, how this is going to play out for them. Well, if they don't have the Marksman, they're definitely not going to be able to Siege as well, but the Harith has the opportunity to, you know, refresh that second skill dash, so he should still have the ability to push some of the towers, but I'm worried about A77's mid lane, right? The Angela, you know, it is a very strong level 1 character, but the clear coming out from Vexana is just going to be way too fast. The so Bloodhound should have a great early game rotation, but some of the advantages that A77 has in their draft is that all the players on their team don't really need too much help, right? The Angela can farm quite safely at mid, rotate with the hard guard if necessary. The Harith also has the ability to dash around and get out of trouble, right? So I do think A77 has a more well-rounded draft, especially in the laning phase, just, you know, taking away from Vexana clearing first. But on the other hand, Bloodhounds have quite an interesting draft with the Minsitar. But Weezy, take us in here. That's right, as we are now jumping into the land of Dawn, Area 77 up against Bloodhounds, fighting it out in their first match against each other. Will Area 77 be able to maintain their position and climb higher on that ladder, or will we see the Bloodhounds claim their first victory in the NACT spring season? Yeah, so this is going to be between the Hounds and the Aliens, right? The Hounds are trying to get their very first victory in the series, and the Aliens trying to push for their lead. A small flicker being popped off by Jules QT right away, but let's take a look at some of the spells that are on the board, right? Uga Booga has the Quantum Charge, giving him a little bit of more regenerative ability and a little bit of uh, movement speed there. And, you know, the rest of the members are quite uh, consistent with their spells. A the Quantum Charge on the Brats too. This is something we don't really see traditionally, right? The Concussive Blast is definitely something that helps with the jungle speed. Uh, you could also go um, for the other spell, which, you know, gives back some health. But this time around, we do have a Quantum Charge Barat. So definitely look for this dinosaur to run around quite quickly here. Yeah, and, you know, it's an excellent point. The Quantum Charge on Tarzan QD is something I'm going to be paying a close eye to. That movement speed, though, is probably what he's kind of banking on to get across the map mm -hmm. a little bit faster and uh, be able to engage inside of these fights. But both teams have some things that kind of work in their favor. I mean, there's sustainability over there from Templus running on this glue to be able to keep himself alive. But they have Jules <laughs> QD with the Angel on the opposite side for sustainability on top of that. And you're already seeing both sides with some early aggression. But I'm just wondering, how is this going to play out for the neutral objectives, right? First turtle is going to be spawning in the next five seconds. And we do know both sides are getting ready to hit that level four power spike. Now, can Bloodhounds take control of this objective or will we see Area 77 be able to take this first turtle and increase the XP and possibly lead the tempo for this match? Yeah, well, I think A77, they have a much better sustain. The longer the team fight goes, the better, but Retribution? Ooh, he's going to go in. Both sides fighting it out. A flicker from JQD. Tarzan QD will be able to claim the turtle for Area 77, but now needs to get out of there. JQD immobilized very low, and Boca Roscoe will get first blood with the debut. Vexana oh keeps calling, dropping down. Templus 
with the alley-oop. We'll get another. Down goes Tarzan Cutie, the jungler for Area 77. They were able to get the turtle, but lost two members. Yeah, the CC coming out from Bloodhounds actually does quite a bit, right? Uga Booga is able to get a couple grabs, a couple stuns here and there. Also paired with Volca Roscoe's, you know, uh, ability to get that CC off with the first skill. It's actually quite huge. And they're able to take two kills in trade for the turtle, pushing their gold lead back up in place. And, you know, now Bloodhounds, they definitely seem like they are contending for this match. You know, I was worried that their comp isn't going to be enough, especially with such an unconventional roam, but definitely feels like Uga Booga is taking this uh this matchup quite well here yeah and we're gonna have to keep a close eye on this right i mean even though they got two kills they lost the first turtle so it's pretty much a stalemate i think it was a good trade for both sides and this is really just gonna boil down to who can kind of take control of the farm possibly get down to the side lanes and get a gank but you also got to look at where those kills went easy peasy though hit with a little bit of cc should be able to get out of there detonus welcome is going to connect though jq d we'll go ahead and use that implosion for a stun and a knock up and look at how much he can sustain <laughs> through all of those abilities getting him down to about 50 percent hp and that just kind of showcases you know how beefy he is now like we said this is really just a battle of sustainability from both sides there's not even that much damage from the side of area 77 i mean it's putting a lot into the hands of iso on this Harith. Yeah, they're definitely kind of hypering the Hyrith at this point. The Brass is just an extremely tanky front lineman. With the Quantum Charge, he should be able to get in quite easily in and out. But JQT did find a member of the side of Bloodhounds. They're looking to go in on it. Ooh, King's Calling dropping down. A knockup from JQT forcing out a little bit of those abilities on this turtle. First turtle did go to the side of Area 77. Looks like they're trying to claim the next one. Have four members in position, but a slight contest from the Bloodhounds is on the way. The immobilization, a possible split split may be on the way from Templis. Doing a great job frontlining, forcing Jay Cutie to hit him with the knockup. Lord at uh, Turtle about 25% HP. Jules Cutie will get one though. Down goes Ooga Booga, the chase from Yureshi. Onto Easy Peasy, force him into the tier two turret. And it looks like the turtle, the second one will go to Area 77. Yeah, another strong neutral objective by the side of A77. Honestly, you got to give credit to Rishi and the Angela, right? Both of them just decides to go onto the backside, bodying a lot of the members from the side of Bloodhounds. They're really unable to reach even the objectives, pushing the gold back even for both of these teams. And now, A77, I feel like they have a groove into this game, right? The longer these team fights go, the more sustained the Angela can be popped. But on the other hand, you also have this glue on the bot side to be able to regen a lot of the health. And I think that's going to be one of Bloodhounds' strongest suit, right? Get this glue to zone out the same exact members that the CC is zoning out. Yeah, and right now, I mean, that, with those two turtles on the side of Area 77, it's going to allow them to get a little bit more additional XP up against the Bloodhounds, even though the Bloodhounds are leading by gold. Now, this is really just going to boil down to who can take these turrets. I mean, you're able to take some turtles, you're able to get some kills on the opposite side, but neither of them translating this into objectives on the map. We got to see who actually has the ground control in this game. And I mean, this is what happens when you have two sustainable compositions. When you're looking at a TIG paired up with the Barats and a Angela to keep the team alive. But on the opposite side, a Minsatar with a glue and a Boxy. I mean, it's just very strong frontline compositions from both teams today. But so far, when it comes to the fights, Bloodhound's able to kind of lead the way and kills a good spear, though. We'll connect to JQD, almost pulling him into that turret. Both sides kind of testing the water, looking for an opportunity to take control. Yeah, but I do want to say this, though. I think Bloodhounds have a very strong opening this time around, right? They're able to kind of just, you know, get the same exact gold and keep up with the side of A77, which has dominated and, you know, majority of their performance in, you know, NACT. So this time around, we get to see Bloodhounds kind of stand head to head, but ISO topside. Yeah, sleeps very low. Decides to go back in, though. Jay Cutie! Trying to get away. They were able to take the turret, though. So one objective does go in their hands. Uga Booga will find Jay Cutie. Just Cutie needs to get out of there. Eternal Guardian is going to drop down. Tarzan Cutie hit with a lot of damage down to about 25% HP. Able to expand that distance back to his side of the jungle. Heart Guard activated, though. Your uh, Cutie is going to find one. Takes down Boca Roscoe. Both sides fight it out. A flicker does go down. Uga Booga very low. The immobilization is split split. Your Cutie does get grabbed up by Tipless but not able to deal the last hits to take him out. The immobilization onto Ooga Booga now inside of the turtle pit. 1 HP forced to recall back, but Bloodhounds able to claim their first turtle of this game. Lost two, but able to take the third, and now will rotate around the map. So they got a turtle, but they lost a turret in the process. 
Yeah, I mean, the turret loss onto the top side, it is a big deal, but they were able to get that turret uh, quite easily for the side of A77 when they chose to, you know, put a lot of the members in siege onto the top side. But the reinforcements coming out from Bloodhounds, they're able to kind of, you know, uh, neutralize that whole entire team fight, pick up the objective, and continuing with their, you know, small lead onto the gold. Who's <laughs> being a lead? I know! Look like Neo from the Matrix! Just dashing, bobbing, and weaving, takes the turret on the bot side. Volcarasco will find him, though, in response. You are going to see Joe's Cutie not able to get out of there as well with that heart guard. Volcarasco is going to go ahead and take him down. It's going to be two members falling for the side of Area 77, but another turret loss for the Bloodhounds. Yeah, I mean, losing towers back and forth for the side of Bloodhounds is not really good, but at the same time, they are still keeping up the lead against the aliens, and I think that is still quite a win. Now, Bloodhounds on the bottom side, able to pick up the tower, so small neutralization coming out for them. Take a look at the items. The carry has already farmed the Croatian along with the Golden Staff, so he's going to be dealing tons of damage, not the traditional build of going Thunderbelt, and um endless battle but definitely a lot of damage output coming from the side of bloodhounds yeah and you're gonna look at um iso and also sleeps pretty even on gold right now i mean we were kind of saying the Harith is a counter over there for the carry but both sides able to claim a turret in the gold lane which is going to work in their favor i feel like it's just really going to boil down to who can get to the back line first right who can take down uh the mark especially especially on the side of area 77 because if iso falls he's their primary damage dealer outside of a cc from your reshi cutie now sleeps he is a ticking time bomb though he is running on this carry which is going to be a massive problem especially for a tig and a uh, Barat's combination as he loves to kind of soak into those beefier heroes. You are going to see the Lord spawn in though. And Bloodhound's now trying to gain control of oh. the pit. Implosion goes down for the setup. Triple knockup. King's calling to drop down, trying to negate the CC and spells. Tarzan Cutie will find sleep. Jurassic Cutie will find Uga Booga. They're not done though. There goes the chase. Boko Roscoe's been spotted out. Jurassic Cutie with the heart guard. Gets a double kill. Takes down Boko Roscoe. Easy peasy. Needing to get out of there. May not be able to expand that distance makes his way to the purple buff and now area 77 gains control of the lord pit yeah it was a three for one for the side of a 77 bloodhounds actually chose to initiate but now the dive looking to continue a 77 able to grab up this mid tower looking for the next neutral eject the great fight inside of a 77 tarzan was going to be the priority focus but in that whole entire fight where Bloodhounds was able to even get the Kings calling on top of the members. They still ended up losing. And, you know, the side of A77, they just have such a strong comp. The sustain coming out from Angela is just really, really huge in that fight. And, you know, Bloodhounds falling quite short in one of their first big neutral fights. Yeah, and now you're going to look at that 2,000 goal lead from Area 77, which was once a close game, now tipping in their favor. They're also able to take that first turret in the mid lane, which is going to open up the opportunity for Area 77 to rotate more around the map and invade the orange and purple buffs from the Bloodhounds and possibly take some of these tier twos if the Bloodhounds is not careful. Yeah, and, you know, inside of A77, we can take a look at some of the items right here. CC has already built up some penetration, anti-heal, the war axe, and the brute force is available. So he's going to be quite fast dashing around the Lord, marching down onto the top side. A77 opting to siege onto the bottom lane. I think it's a good decision. They got to push out all the outer towers before looking for a fight. Ooh, putting everything on you, Reshi Cutie. Heart Guard activated to keep him alive, but they baited out a lot of utility. Tarzan Cutie on the top side, though, will take the tier two turret with the assistance of the Lord marching into that inhibitor. And now the seeds for the tier two in the mid lane has been claimed from Area 77. And you were kind of mentioning about the ticking time bomb coming out from sleeps, and I do 100% agree, right? As long as the gold is quite even between the Harith and the carry, I think the carry should be able to stand up on top. But it seems like the A77 side, the front line is just quite stacked, right? The Brat's building full defense. It already has the Antique Radiance and the Guardian's Helmet, and even further looking to build up to that brute force. And the Nom Nom goes through. Is going to connect for the stun on the Easy Peasy Implosion for the knockup. And the CC, a lot going down. King's Calling will drop down as well. Isa will find one, takes out Easy Peasy, may be able to get another. Book Roscoe getting out of there. Rescue is going to take down Sleeps. Two members falling for the Bloodhounds. And it looks like they want more. Ooga Booga, very low himself, forced to go back to the base for some region. And Area 77 now in full control of this game. 
I do feel like the side of Bloodhounds, they are missing that front line set, right? The glue is still available onto the front end, but here you go, the siege. Yeah, trying to get another kill. Your executed will find Volcarasco, finds the backline mage. Now looking at Bloodhounds stripped down to their inhibitors. Split Split has been activated on the Tarzan. Cutie Yureshi on the bot side, though. Not really worried about going in for the kills, but going in for these objectives opens up the base for the Bloodhounds. Yeah, 8 to 5 is the overall scoreboard. A77 with a 6k lead 13 minutes in, right? We saw Bloodhounds kind of go even throughout the whole entire game, but this time around, they're losing a lot of steam, and it just feels like their team fight. The 5 versus 5s coming out from the side of Bloodhounds is just not enough to deal with the draft that's coming through from A77. The Harith is just going completely unchecked. The JQT on this tick wheel, getting like three four-man implosions almost every single team fight onto the back side and there's also some mispositioning from the side of bloodhounds some of the things that they do need to make sure is they could try to get a member down maybe lock the the tig reel down or anyone that's in the front line of a77 and let sleeps free hit because you got a demon hunter sword corrosions and also the golden staff but the conceal play on the back side yeah, Bloodhound's trying to contest this floor. Not sure if this is the right answer. Sleeps very low. Needs to get out of there. King's falling, dropping down. Area 77 still in control of the Wait. Lord Pit. Tarzan Cutie will get it. Triple knockup. Iso will find Tipless. You already can see Sleeps fall. Your Edge Cutie is going to take him down. Ooga booga. Very low himself. Jules Cutie going in for a kill. Your Edge Cutie will find Boca Rosca. One more member to go through in the mid lane. Easy peasy making that two. We'll go back into the base, but Ooga Booga not able to get there. Easy peasy by himself up against the full team of Area 77. The aliens are planning on landing here. And it looks like they will as they get a Maniac. Yureshi will find the final member and shut him down. Area 77 takes game number one. Yeah, complete domination coming out from the aliens here. 14 minute match 13 to 5 is the overall scoreboard i mean it was a pretty good performance coming out from a77 especially when we go past that mid game they did end up losing one of the turtles but after that every single neutral objective especially when it came down to the lords a77 was able to sweep in a very victorious fashion, right? They were going like zero for four, zero for three, almost every every single one of these team fights, not losing a single member. We can see Hoon on the, the very corner of the screen. A77 definitely have a strong comp this time around. <laughs> yeah, definitely having a strong comp in area 77. Just able to perform, even with the new addition, Jules Cutie stepping into Mark Cutie's position. I mean, he did really well. I'll definitely have to say, though, Yureshi Cutie coming alive over there on that CC was just very dominating when it came to rotating around, finding the back line, and they didn't have an answer to stop him in his tracks and was pretty much his game. I think if anybody got MVP, it definitely has to be Yureshi Cutie. Yeah, no, the combination between Yureshi Cutie and also Jules on the Angela, right? I kind of talked about the Angela and the Joy combination, but the Angela and CC, that was zoning out like three or four of the members, cutting down a lot of the squishy targets onto the backside. You can pretty much see that uh, the carry was zoned out almost every single team fight. And paired up with the Vengeance and the Heart Guard, like the CC has been quite an unstoppable force onto the backside. So definitely this time around, I think Bloodhounds, they should look to draft against uh, some of that type of aggression but I, I still think bloodhounds did quite well you know early on they kept up with the gold all the way up until the third turtle i think they definitely had a chance maybe look to team fight a little bit better or maybe allow ooga booga on more of a front line set right pick up the franco pick up something that holds people down to allow sleeps to get that full combination and maybe peel him off so Yurushi is not all over the place on the back side of bloodhounds yeah, I mean, they were able to get some kills in the beginning, but they lost the first two turtles, took the third one. And I, I do agree with you. They're kind of holding their own up against Area 77. It wasn't really one-sided uh, until after the, the Lord started spawning in, and then you started seeing full control over there from Area 77. And, I mean, there was a little bit of unorthodox picks in there, right? There was a Minsethar and a Glue combination. Honestly, I haven't really seen a Glue and a Minsethar on the same team in a long time. I don't even think you could find an MPL match at least this year with those two on the same side. So I'm kind of wondering like, okay, they're trying new things. Now, 
Do I think they executed it bad? No, I think they did really well on it, but I just don't think it was the strongest combina combination of what they had available to pick up. And it didn't really allow Sleeps to get online, especially running that carry already, going against a hero who's considered his counter, which is that Harith. When you're not able to get Sleeps to what he, what he needs, right, that Demon Hunter Sword, he needs something to kind of soak into a Barats, into a Tig as well, to deal some damage, because they had a strong frontline composition. But when he's dying super early, he has two deaths and no kills, and he's losing his turret, and you know, you're not really seeing the strongest presence from uh, Ooga Booga on that Minsothar, it really puts way too much pressure on a carry who's already considered a late game marksman to kind of show up to the table and allowed the side of Area 77 to pretty much close that out with ease. Yeah, maybe something like an R-Lot in the XP to provide a little bit of CC, especially onto the front or even the backside. They could also opt to go for the Ruby, right? That has a lot of stuns, a lot of CC, especially with the, the I'm Offended there to lock down the CC to force the CC to take some purifies, right? But the Vengeance CC along with the Heart Guard, which is able to body multiple members, grabbing up even a Maniac towards the end of the match. So definitely a very <laughs> good job, well done for Jules and uh, for Yureshi. But, you know, at the same time, right, I, I do want to see Bloodhounds go out with a bang, right? Make sure they can get a, some advantages onto the early game. Maybe even pick up something like a cheese pick, right? Pick up the Brody, guarantee that winning strat onto the top side. Maybe pick up some 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 suppressions like the Kaja, which got took an out um, and or even the Franco to be able to lock down and pair up quite well because right now I feel like the synergy coming out from A77, how they draft their comp, it's just too overwhelming, especially when you get into those later stages when we scale into the match. Speaking of scaling, as we are looking at a little bit of the breakdown from game number one between Area 77 and the Bloodhounds, I mean, 13 of five, you know, Area 77, after that first Lord spawned in, they are pretty much able to kind of close that game out. That's all they really needed to tip the scales in their favor. I would say, though, credits over there to Jules Cutie. I mean, he did just step in the scene, running that Angela in the mid lane, and he did well. I mean, he was just going pure utility, had 11 assists uh, to make up for uh, keeping the team alive in those engagements, but also Yureshi just on fire, dominating, and able to find a way to put that pressure and maintain it onto the side of Bloodhounds. Oh my gosh, 92% participation from Yurishi. Pretty much able to be in every single one of those team fights, knocking out opponents left and right. Another, you know, a, a guy on A77 that we haven't really talked about is JQT with the implosion onto the back side. He was able to lock down two to three members, almost every single one of those ultimates, changing the fights. And, you know, with the Mincitar, the King's Calling was actually in a great position. You saw multiple times the Herith had to purify out of that position. But the King, uh, but the, the implosion coming out from Tigril setting members onto the backside i felt like that really well rounded and you know made secured the victory for a77 in a lot of those team fights damn I, you know jqt definitely doing a good job with the realm there you know it's funny too because we saw the vexana and we said hey i mean maybe this is what bloodhounds needs to claim their first <laughs> victory and now the vexana it just didn't pull through for them which is Unfortunate because that's like one of the strongest picks that nine times out of ten. I will, okay, we'll go with statistics. Seven times out of ten, when the Vexana has been pulled mm -hmm. out, it's one. But now you know it does take a little bit more of a loss as we go through the regular season. So, looking at the Bloodhounds, we, we got to ask the question: Where do they go from here? Right? Was the problem the Minsathar and the glue pickup? Uh, is that where they kind of fell short? Did they need both of them? Could they have went something a little bit more traditional in the XP lane? Could they have did something more traditional in the roam position? Yeah, well, I definitely like how they drafted Sleeps on the carry, right? We've seen Sleeps kind of dominate and, and, and a lot of the performance onto the gold side. So definitely finding, you know, heroes that the side of Bloodhounds can lock members down and peel Sleeps in those team fights. Because quite honestly, Yureshi was out of control. Right, the CC 92% KP, like he dominated that game. That game was his. And, you know, from an XP laner to have the highest kill participation in those team fights, you could definitely see the imports coming out from him, you know, showing how, you know, the XP laner should be done for the side of Bloodhounds. So, definitely a little bit more conventional picks. I think the front line, the, the front side lockdown from the side of Bloodhounds may be a great option that the Hounds have to consider here. And I, you know, and I think A77. Them, they definitely have a well-rounded draft the angela cheese pick onto the mid something that is quite unconventional but worked out quite well in their case definitely a strong showing from the side of the aliens 
Yeah, I mean, they're going to ban out the CC for Bloodhounds. <laughs> it's like they were worried about uh, Yureshi. I mean, he, the man was a problem, right? He was able to get to the back line. He was pretty much able to do everything he wanted in that game with little to no penalty. And I think it's a good step in the right direction for the side of Bloodhounds. Now, you are going to see that Navarra taking off the table. You kind of mentioned this in the first draft as well. One of those mages that we don't really get to see picked too often just from the utility that she kind of provides for the team something a little untraditional though but has been picked up a lot on the professional scene is the x borg now i'm wondering if area 77 are they gonna try and lock in this vexana and, and boost that win rate again is i mean <laughs> it's literally like the hero that everybody tries to prioritize when you are looking at the side of bloodhounds though i mean they still have some options on the table right the um Mathilda does get banned out, so that won't be there, but they can go for a beefier composition. They could even pull out a Barats if it's available on the playing field. They can get Marksman Pryo, especially being second in the draft, to get them more comfortable on what they want. Not necessarily having to run something like the carry. They could even run something like a Claude. It uh, has a lot of mobility, a lot of survivability as well, especially like one of the main things that we saw was uh, Sleeps not really having the easiest time getting online with the carry i mean carry is not as mobile as other marksmen's and when it comes to survivability when your team's falling behind on the neutral objectives it's easy to put on that pressure yeah and i think this is extremely smart coming out from the side of a77 they take out the navaria and also the Faramis, which boca has done quite well with both of these hero and they take out easy peasy's you know bread and butter the export junk right and you know this export we haven't really seen a popularity rise in the export jumble especially in overseas in the professionals but for the side of bloodhounds that's definitely a hero that they've won a lot of games with minotaur gets taken out from the side of bloodhounds and a77 said hey man <laughs> we're gonna take the dinosaur we won in the first game you guys don't want it no respect to it let's pick this up and run it one more time yeah i mean but the vexana is still on the table <laughs> I mean, I thought that would have been the answer for Bloodhounds in game number one, but it looks like Area 77, hey, they're not too worried about it. Go ahead and pick up the Vexana. Hey, you can even get the carry if you want to. I mean, hey, you did it last game up against our Barats, and it really didn't provide much of a problem. And the Harith is still available for us, so we can counter that right back at you. And that is some top-tier drafting from the side of Area 77 looking stronger than ever, putting Bloodhounds in a little bit of a bind. Because if they don't go for this pick, if they don't go for the Vexana, then Area 77 gets a Barats and a Vexana on top of possibly an Angela to keep him alive. And hey, there it goes. Vexana and the R-Lot for the Bloodhounds. Oh, this is a much better draft coming out from Bloodhounds here. Picking up the R-Lot early. It is a flex pick, and I do think it's going to go into the XP position. But there's a chance that Uga Booga has done quite well with this hero, but I just have not been able to see it, right? But this is a much better setup this time around, especially to deal with the aggressiveness of A77, especially when their XP can dominate in such a performance. This R-Lot should be able to be, act as a small saving grace for the side of Bloodhounds, but you know, the joy is still available. The Ruby has not been picked up yet. And an early uh, IMU, the Valentina gets picked up here. We haven't seen this hero come out quite as often as it used to be. I think it is a great hero, but um, with a lot of the nerf that has been coming through, the damage isn't as good anymore. The cooldown is quite high, but I do think A77, especially coming out with the Tig rule once again, Man, like, Jay has definitely done well with the implosion. I definitely think this time around, he's going to do the same thing. Yeah, I mean, hey, if it worked in game number one, why change it, right? The only difference <laughs> here is that it's a Valentina. Uh, now, I do agree with you. It's a little early. I mean, maybe they're just trying to put a little bit of pressure in the drafting from the side of Bloodhounds. Now they're going to have to pick and choose who they want to slot in that roam position, especially when you're going up against somebody like a TIG, right? Normally you'd see like a, you could even run a Ruby. The Ruby would be good. It can stop the CC from the TIG, that implosion that's been had a major impact in game number one. The Diggy, I'm not really too sure how I feel about it. I mean, it took a little bit of a nerf in terms of damage, but it still Artist. can provide the utility you're looking Ooh. for. You are going to go ahead and see Sleeps though, pick up this carry yet again. Now, Harith is still on the table for the side of Area 77, but it is the second banning phase. Does Bloodhounds take him out? Yeah, no, I do think the Harith is gonna be taken out. This is kind of the response that A77 has to deal with the carry almost every single game, but Iso still has a lot in his pocket, right? He can pick up the Claw, the Brody is also available here. Like there's so many options that A77 has, even with the Harith being taken out, which, you know, Bloodhounds definitely goes with the response. Now, I do want to see Bloodhounds you know, obtain a few more frontline defense to deal with 
uh, the aggressiveness, the pathing of Yurishi. Because, you know, we've definitely seen Yurishi kind of just body onto the backside. Um, so something like a Ruby should be quite good. The Akai gets banned out here. That's also another good response coming out from Bloodhounds. I do think some of their strongest options could be like a Ruby Martins, right? Put Easy Peasy on, one of his best fighter heroes, and then give Sleeps a much easier time to deal with um, the dive coming out from Ryurishi. But once again, you know, both of these teams are still looking on to the last ban phase. What does A77 look to take away from the side of Bloodhounds here? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely looking at Bloodhounds still needing to slot something inside of the jungle. Now, uh, looking at what they're going against, still a lot of CC. I mean, Mardis, I was going to say, take out the Mardis because with the TIG and with the Rats, I mean, he'd just be perfect with the anti-CC. So they want to put something in there that they can kind of bully around, especially with that TIG. I mean, this kind of reminds me when I see Shark running the wrong position. When he runs something <laughs> like a TIG, he's always rotating around the map and putting on that pressure inside of the jungle. Bloodhounds now has an option to kind of turn this back in their favor. I mean, they could even pick up something like the X-Borg, which I'm not sure if the X-Borg got, no, oh, actually, no, it got banned out. So they can't even pick Boxia, the X-Borg here. Boxia, Franco. It could be. I think that's a, I think that's a good wombo be. combo, right? You, you have the Roly Poly coming through, hitting that stun, and you have the Franco onto the backside with the Wilderness Blessing, you know, able to kind of catch up to the movement speed and get that hook and set up for a perfect Sleep's ultimate along with the Arlock coming through. But they have a Valentina, so if you go for the Franco, then you give them the bloody hunt. I mean, so it's mm. kind of a catch-22. They are going to go in for a little bit of a Mopa Zane pickup. That's, I think he's the only <laughs> jungler that I really see go in for this alpha. And it didn't have the hottest debut last time we've seen it. But hey, this may be a different story as uh, Bloodhounds is going to be able to pick that up in their favor. Now, this will be kind of mm -hmm. interesting to see this play out. I mean, you know, crazy enough, BTK up against Area 77 in day one pulled out the alpha and area 77 beat them so uh as we are going to be jumping into this we got to see if this will really work out in their favor i mean if zane couldn't pull it off and that was his signature pick it may be a little bit of a challenge for easy peasy but if anybody oh. can do it it's definitely him but speaking of things interesting the nolan it walked through the draft and it got picked up well the nolan is great right there's a lot of physical damage on the side of a 77 side and a lot of the indo teams or the ph teams they love to pick up the nolan paired up with natan right it's heavy magic versus the heavy physical but what i want to kind of focus on is where is this barats going to go is it going to be an xp barats on your <laughs> rishi oh my gosh the flex the mind games coming through but this time around Uga Booga brings up a set and i do like this so much better right the uh the edith right giving a little bit more magic damage to you know balance out the heavy physical that bloodhound has and the one two combination to kind of just zone and stun out an opponent so steeps has a much easier time on the backs and i think this draft is much more well-rounded here we see the only thing with this draft that i see is it's still unorthodox to me uh for the mm -hmm. side of bloodhounds like i said the last time we'd never really seen a glue and a minsithar work together <laughs> now we're seeing an alpha and it and on the same it. team. <laughs> I'm kind of like wondering, like they're they're trying to make all of these different heroes fit together for some new type of meta, and it's gonna be a little bit of a challenge. Um, I mean, when I look at Area 77, we've seen the Barats all the time be picked up. We've seen the Valentina, we've seen the Tig, the Natan. Even though it's not the hottest prospect, it's like a secret weapon that's pulled into the goal lane, even out in MPL. And then the Nolan. I mean, it really speaks for itself on how well it's been uh recently with the meta but when you look at bloodhounds when you see an alpha i only see one player pulling out the alpha and that's moba zane i only see i don't really see too many edis i'm not saying either it's not a great pickup uh but it definitely can be a little bit of upscale battle it's going to require a lot of execution to pull off this synergized composition but speaking of compositions into game number two area 77 up against the bloodhounds will the aliens be able to take over the planet with a 2-0 sweep or will the bloodhounds bring us to a game number three yeah no this time around we do want bloodhounds to be able to grab up a point against the aliens but a77 has played such a good mid to late game that it's quite honestly scary to see if you know the side of bloodhounds is able to get the victorious here now let's take a look at some of the emblems here quite standard across the board edith going with a lot of armor there the wilderness blessing for both of the mages so lots of good rotations coming out from both sides i do think bloodhounds once again with the vexana pick should have a much stronger early rotation right vexana you know it's not a hero that should be able to clear the wave fast but definitely provides a lot of that wave clear 
um, early on, especially with the passive. So definitely look to pair that up greatly with Edith and have them rotating around from both sides. But A77, once again, they have such a well-rounded draft, right? The Nolan on to the jungler, heavy physical damage. You also got the Natan on the top side with the heavy magic damage. But the more unconventional pick, the one that stands out more to me is going to be the Brats on the XP lane. I'm wondering how Yurishi is going to create that impact, the same exact zone that he did in game one. Yeah, and you're already seeing some damage on a Tarzan as he tried to get a little bit more of that farm away from Bloodhounds. Now, I mean, yeah, it is interesting seeing Yurishi over there on this Brats, but I mean, look at it. He's doing a good job, but overextension may be costly. Ooh. The Flicker! able to escape that would have been ggs right there if he would have caught him out of position for a first blood now i like the barats in the xp lane do i think it's better than the jungle no but i think it's a uh, flex pick that a lot of people don't realize uh, can actually work out in that xp lane i've seen it in mpl work in their favor i've seen fried chicken pull it off uh really good too templates though speaking of pulling things off very low still gonna go in and burst it down by his own. Oh, you're going to go ahead and see <laughs> Jules Cutie get that kill using the IMU for the final slash. I, I, I don't know why he decided to go in right there, but first blood for Area 77. I do think that's a small questionable mistake coming out from Templus. A little desperate attempt. Um, looking to see if they could get a few more than they can chew, but on the mid side, they're coming Ooh, through. Both teams fight it out. Turtle at 50% HP. The knockup from Jay Cutie. Tarzan Cutie able to get the turtle. Jules Cutie finding Ooga Booga. That is going to be two members falling and one turtle for Area 77 and no trade for the Bloodhounds. Yeah, the side of A77, another strong opening coming through. This time around, they're able to get the advantage early on. It smells a lot of trouble for the side of Bloodhounds, especially when they've been struggling in that mid to late game team fights. Now A77 has the lead. They should be able to kind of just walk through a lot of these opportunities. And you can even see Tarzan going aggressive here, just dashing around. The mechanics coming out with the Nolan is quite good in the hands of Tarzan here. And this is why I say, like, that Barat's pickup kind of opened up this opportunity, right? I mean, they expected him to run in the jungle and then last minute swapping him into the XP lane. And he's holding his own. I mean, he's 1-0-1. One, and, one, and even when it was a 2v1 gank, he has that flick of escape. But speaking of escaping, an implosion on a Boku Rosco and Tarzan Cutie will find the kill, extending the lead 3-0. to Yeah, small, perfect fadeaway come out from Tarzan onto the midside. Picks up the leader. Of bloodhounds now the side of bloodhounds they have to kind of look to see what they can do to get back into this game and i think they are doing that exactly right put a little bit more pressure onto the gold side make sure that sleeps can scale a little bit better because i do think from the side of bloodhounds they have to have sleeps scale well into the comp but look at natan dude pushing him away solo on the top side here yeah, and that's going to be a problem. I mean, if they keep getting these neutral objectives and they're leading the way in kills, Natan is going to start hitting like a truck. And you're mm. already seeing some great rotations from Area 77, not trying to give Bloodhounds any breathing room, trying to close this game out with a 2-0 sweep. I mean, Tarzan already dealing massive damage on this Nolan, who's been such a threat inside of the jungle, a last-minute pickup and working to Area 77's advantage. Yeah, and you could see there's a small XP gap already between the junglers. Level 9 versus <laughs> level 7. So Bloodhounds not only behind in the gold, they are behind in a lot of levels. And look at the damage and look at the clear speed of that objective. Whoa. And look at the swiftness. Templus blinks and is <laughs> taken down by four members of Area 77. Easy peasy joining the party. Your Reggie Cutie will find him. 5-0 lead for Area 77 and climbing his Ooga Booga needs to get out of there, but your Reshi on his tail. Yeah, it's a 4k gold lead. Five minutes in for the aliens. A dominating performance. You can even see Tarzan on the bot side getting that tower up. No problem. The you know the game is just in the hands of A77 at this point, right? They have a strong dominating performance in the early game. Kills are completely clean on the board. You can see Rishi even coming onto the top side here poking onto sleeves and you know i was questioning how the brass is going to be able to do in this matchup but it seems like Yurishi is able to pull it out two zero and two right only falling behind jules qd in that ranking so definitely a 77 they have a lot to work with they could even flex the brats onto the gold lane like that is huge for the side of aliens yeah, I mean, just looking at a couple of key plays over there as Area 77 went in for this turtle. 
and Bloodhounds with the three-man composition trying to get the contest, but the implosion from JQD having such a strong impact for the double knockup on top of it. And the Tarzan Cutie claiming that Turtle Jules could be finding Ooga Booga and not losing anything from that trade. Oh, no. losing anything, massive implosions, three-man set. Make that four. Tarzan Cutie takes out both Carrasco. Gets a double. Finds Sleep. Jurassic Cutie finds Easy Peasy. And Tarzan with the triple. A maniac finds Ooga Booga. A full wipeout <laughs> against the Bloodhounds. And now full sending through the mid lane. It was a flicker implosion paired up with the, the flicker. Daytona's welcoming. Gets a double man stun into that whole entire team fight. Bloodhounds completely destroyed in the team fight there. And, you know, it's a lack of vision. And honestly, like a lack of everything at that point like they thought they were safe in that team fight but the side of a77 proved that they were completely underneath the same control and now a77 with the complete lead is able to grab up the mid tower looking to go for another siege onto the mid tower yeah they're already up by 9,000 gold and climbing timeless will be bursted down your cutie able to deal the last hit but the massive damage came out from tarzan cutie on this nolan area 77 Whatever planet they've been training on, they're definitely scaling miles over the Bloodhounds right now for game number two. Bloodhounds needs to find a way to turn this around and fast. Not able to claim a single kill this entire game. No kill, no towers, 11 to 0, a 10k gold lead, 7 minutes in, like the side of Bloodhounds unable Whoa. to do too much, but a shutdown. Now finally in favor for the side of the Hounds. It's not going to make too big of an impact there, but at least they are on the they're on the clock now for the kills. Did you see how focused Bloodhounds was for that kill? Everybody <laughs> full sitted that. They needed to get something on the board, but look at the engagement in the mid river. Tarzan cutie finding sleeps. You're resting easy peasy, getting the kills. The implosion, the detonus, welcome too much to handle, and the maniac from Tarzan. It's still more in the mid lane as we spawn back in. You see Jules Cutie get another, finds Ooga Booga, can still play on the way for They're the going for another one. Buff. A contest may be on the way, as they are going to go ahead and claim more of the jungle away from the Bloodhounds and starve them out. Yeah, no, A77 definitely has this game already in their hands. They, they, they just have to look to play quite disciplined here, because honestly, the side of Bloodhounds, they are just unable to find a good team fight. JQT already higher level than most <laughs> of the players on the side of Bloodhounds here. Yeah, JQT just... A strong impact, a key player over there for Area 77. The rotations with this TIG, very hard to handle for the side of Bloodhounds. Not able to find an answer. He's just being such a bully when it comes to that CC. Able to get one, two, maybe even three if Another? they're not careful. And there goes one. Templis knocked up. Forced to rest out of there. Barely able to get out alive. Yeah, that's a flicker being used by the side of Bloodhounds. I don't think they're going to be able to contest this objective, even if they really wanted to. The damage coming out. ISO is just shredding the objective. Whoa. The flicker! And the stun knocks him into Ooga Booga. Trying to get some more kills on the board. Possibly trying to open up the base. Tarzan Cutie is going to find Ooga Booga. He will fall. Templis able to make it back to safety. But they are now going in for the siege. Templis does not escape. Jules Cutie will get the kill. Yureshi, what in this world is the flicker mechanics on the Daytona's welcoming? You know, it's quite good. We haven't seen this quite often, especially, you know, nowadays where the Bratz honestly has only been used in the jungle, but Yurishi definitely pulling out in this XP lane. Bratz, it's honestly doing quite a good amount of work. Four, zero, and eight. Definitely the candidate of MVP, but we also got Jules on the mid side along with the same score, providing pretty much just as much support as the Bratz is in a lot of these team fights. Yeah, now the base has been opened up. Lord on the bot side, but they do not have Tarzan Cutie. He's still rotating around. Looks like he's going in for that purple buff, which may be a chance for the side of Bloodhounds to burst down this uh, Lord with little to no contest, already at 50% HP. Now, looking at the Bloodhounds, if they want to turn this around, Sleeps has to get online. I mean, he hasn't gotten a single kill this entire game. They have to play into that 16 to 23 minute mark to even have a chance to contend up against Area 77. But I mean, look at the Jay? pressure. They're already looking to try and close out this game. Yeah, I do think the side of Bloodhounds, they do have a chance, right? Uga Booga has quite a bit of skills in his arsenal. Like, he should be able to get the flicker onto ISO and maybe get the flip, allow allow Sleeps to be able to get a couple free hits here and there. But JQT has been dominating on the counter sets, right? The side of Bloodhounds, if they get one member, Jay! Whoa! Flicker! It 
explosion play for the set. Iso will claim the turret. Tarzan will find Ugabuga, gets a double, finds Templess. Three members standing for the Bloodhound. Sleep to find JQ. He takes down one member of Area 77. But down goes the last inhibitor on the top side. And it looks like they're trying to close this out. Iso rushing in. Trying to connect onto Boca Roscoe. Tarzan Cutie will get it though. Boca will fall and down goes the base crystal. Area 77 claims victory against Bloodhounds with a clean sweep. Victory. Yeah, clean sweep coming out from the aliens here. They're able to grab up the victory 2-0. That was a 13k gold lead there. And we haven't really seen a 13k gold lead in NACT. That just kind of tells you the story of A77. They are here to contend. They want to represent as the top team. They're able to grab up three points in this series. The team statistics 17, 2 to 45. A complete dominance from the side of the aliens. And look at their rating. I don't think the rating can be any better here, Weezy. A one-sided story, I think, is the only way we can <laughs> describe that match. And can I just say, Jay Cutie on this TIG, okay, I know he was running a, a flicker, right? But I don't yep. even think that was a flicker. I, I think we need to change that to like an instant transmission. Well, how fast <laughs> he flickered over for that implosion to set the entire team of the Bloodhounds and able to kind of push through for that victory with a clean sweep. Area 77 again in day number three, week two of the NACT spring season, not disappointing. Yeah, dominating performance by the side of Aliens is something that we've honestly been looking at, especially after the performance that they had against Gaming Gladiators. We knew that this team was trying to get into the top three spots, right? And, you know, with this game coming through, they're definitely pushing their points up onto that scale. A clean performance from the side of A77, only losing two members in 12 minutes in. And they were able to grab up pretty much every single objective, every single Lord. No towers has fallen. And, and you know with a flex comp the urishi on the brats and i honestly thought the brats isn't going to be doing as well as he did in this game but the flicker mechanics coming through flicker daytona is welcoming or just reverse you know before he even eats them he flickers forward able to grab up so many different members and let's take a look at some of the team fire participation tarzan here 82 percent team fire participation along with urishi and jules qt that kind of just tells the story of that mid and xp duo that a77 has <coughs> completely dominating in this game two of the best of threes that's right and still able to maintain their position on that ladder climbing up to trying to be the best north america you are going to go ahead and say the rich guy go over to tarzan cutie alongside the carry the sandbag was your and jay cutie the forgotten one but not in that last play with that implosion <laughs> set i think he should yeah, be, we did. i think we need to change that to the remembered because i'm not we... going to forget about that one as we progress <laughs> through this series yeah, no, we definitely did not forget about JQ. We had a good sh small shout outs coming in the very first match. I thought his implosion was quite good, even potentially overlooked to deny a lot of the purifies coming through. But, you know, ew, we got Liz back onto the show. <laughs> Welcome back, Liz. Thank you, guys. I'm I caught up to the show. Definitely amazing performance from Area 77. Nothing that we haven't expected, but still quite stunning to see. Yeah, I mean, it was funny. I feel like that implosion set to close out that game grabbed Liz into the stream today. <laughs> Back into that, the earth. That amazing <laughs> performance. And man, that was a quick series. Bloodhounds, a little bit of a struggle. They were not able to find their rhythm so far this entire regular season. That's their third loss so far. And, you know, crazy enough, they had Vexana both games. So now Vexana takes a little bit of a dip in that win rate. Yeah, and I, you know, the side of Bloodhounds, they really have to try to find their rhythm pretty soon, right? They they have to do their homework. They have to study up on these teams, maybe copy some of the rotations because right now they're getting outclassed by almost every single team in NACT. And when we talked about Bloodhound, especially early on in the season, we were saying, hey, these teams are contenders. This, th this team has been through almost every single NACT, has a similar roster every single time around. So they should have the dominating performance. But right in this season, they're not having a good, uh, strong performance at all. And, you know, I feel like Bloodhounds, they have to change things up, right? Either they have to change some of the players or they have to change the strategies or even the draft. Because quite honestly, they're just getting outclassed in, you know, a lot of these late game fights. Well, I'm sure right now changing the strategy is more is is more likely than changing the players. But the real reason is 
every team pretty much in the NACT right now has upgraded, has done significantly better than previous seasons. And it's not because Bloodhounds is really necessarily falling off. It's because everyone else is just constantly improving. So for Bloodhounds, maybe, maybe they just need to try to figure out how they can power through. Yeah, they just got to find the rhythm. And I do agree, you got to find it fast because that train is rolling and uh, these teams are looking to kind of find a seat ahead of them <laughs> on the point system. I will say for the Bloodhounds, I, I think it's really going to boil down to, I mean, even if we kind of look at their gameplay, yes, it was a 2-0 sweep, but there were some things that worked in their favor, right? I mean, they weren't losing too hard on the neutral objectives in the beginning, but it, the, the trades were just too even. And when it wasn't even, it just didn't work in their favor. And also... The unorthodox picks just really didn't work out for them. And we, we saw what a uh, Mythothar and a glue combination. <laughs> then we got to see uh, the second one was an Edith and uh, Edith an Alpha. And an Alpha, right? And I mean, Alpha, I'm like, okay, I've only really seen one jungler do this. And when the jungler did this, he played against Area 77 and he lost to them. So I don't understand why it, that was the game plan to, to do that against them when it looks like they already know how to play against an Alpha. So I think a little bit of research going back to the laboratory should be the game plan for the bloodhounds but hey they're not out yet this is the regular season they still get a shot to face every other team before we get into the playoffs and this is where they have to grow yeah the season is still quite long here inside of a77 to kind of do their homework and try to figure out what is wrong with them because right now they just they're, they're they're not competing in a lot of these series right um although the first game it was quite close they were able to kind of uh you know even out the gold lead for a very very long time they just were un unable to get a lot of the five versus five fights. And especially when Yurishi's on the backside, just doing what he needs to do. Like it's so hard for Bloodhounds to even get a strong team fight. But you know, the season is still quite long. Bloodhounds still has many games to prove that, hey, they are still trying to contend. And you know, quite honestly, even after the round robin, they still have the opportunity in you know the double elimination during the playoffs. Yeah, like you guys mentioned, the playoffs, every team is able to enter the playoffs. It's just the placement is going to be a little different. But for this series, definitely congratulations to Area 77. They did they did amazing. They've been doing amazing for the entire season. So now we have a little player interview with one of the A77 members to get us get an insight on how their team comps are. Hello, Tarzan, looking good with that with that rotating camera congratulations on you guys' performance this season and also on your nolan gameplay last game thank you thank you wait how do i mute oh. you're you're not mute right now oh, i'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> well for for you guys you actually pulled an amazing performance last week i mean this game it was very swift a little too swift to go too deep into it but definitely your synergy is coming together this season any secrets on what you guys have been doing before the series uh we just watch mpo games before our games that's really it mm -hmm. have you been practicing yeah. a lot before the season lately we haven't been practicing that much it's just synergy oh, really us. Yeah, Filipino the synergy, synergy is really you know? coming together, right? Because I noticed even yeah. with Jules QT coming in instead of Mark QT, you guys still had a very strong team fight. And the team fight is really where you guys shine at. Even with last week against GG, you guys had it all through the early game. What happened late game there? Which game? Um, the one against GG that you almost, almost won. Oh. So basically, I still was calling that we could end the game, but then mm -hmm. I guess Chicken hooked the minions, so we couldn't end. Yeah. So from that game, what would you reflect on for your next series? Because you guys could have had that game, and it showed how strong you are in the beginning, but there's just some decision making that might need some improvement on. Uh, I think we should work on our discipline more. Like we could have done mm -hmm. Lord there, not end. You know, it's pretty much it. Yeah, for sure. And did you guys expect your dominating victory against BTK or was that something that also caught you guys at a surprise? Oh, yeah, definitely. Because as you guys know, I'm Moba Zane's dad. So he's like, <laughs> he's like my son. Man, the chat is going crazy right now. 
But yeah, th thank you for joining us with the interview. Your Nolan, I saw thank the chat. We're going crazy about your Nolan as well. Yeah, I've been practicing Nolan, guys. So watch out for my Nolan. Yeah, watch out for Tarzan's Nolan. Tarzan is the jungle king and he's going to dominate the lane. Thank you, Tarzan, for joining us. We'll see you guys for Thanks next for series. Thank you. Dominating performance, dominating confidence. Their confidence is definitely pulling them in. Yeah, I mean, hey, he definitely should be proud. I mean, the Nolan performance was phenomenal. I mean, especially that last, it was a last minute pickup, right? We thought it was going to be Barats in the jungle. <laughs> and uh, they kind of caught the world by surprise. And that's that three-dimensional drafting, uh, which kind of led the way to their victory because the Barats in the XP lane was not something that Bloodhounds had expected. And a last minute Nolan, they just didn't have an answer for it. Yeah, and, you know, paired up with the Nolan and the Natan, the, 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 the magic damage dealer onto the gold lane. It honestly provided us such a well-rounded draft for the side of A77, you know, that it was very, very hard for the side of Bloodhounds to even defend against the magic damage that's coming in from the gold lane and also the physical heavy damage coming in from the jungle. Yeah, and definitely demonstrate the versatility of all the players in Area 77. And it shows that they can really go with any picks. And like like Tarzan was saying, they haven't even been practicing that much. But it shows that <laughs> the players just kind of clicked. They have their synergy. It works out somehow. So A A77 cemented their place as one of the top contenders this season. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, they're not just a new team on the block. Area 77's been together for a while. A lot of their players have been playing for multiple years together. I mean, I feel like two of the players on their team are like brothers or something like that, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> uh, which is more synergy than you could ever ask for when it comes to a teammate. So uh, they definitely have the uh, execution when it comes down to these neutral objectives. And, you know, it's kind of funny because so does Bloodhounds, technically, uh, because they have been on the scene for a while just like them. But Area 77, I mean, they just have that that beast in them, uh, that alien from a different planet that's just uh, able to be tapped in when it, when they need it most to claim victory on these matches. So another 2-0 sweep. They're able to take down BTK. They've been able to take down Bloodhounds. They lost to uh, GG. So, uh, you know, where do they go from here? They, they're looking promising. I mean, this was a victory that they needed to kind of raise on that ladder and also uh, kind of put them ahead of a lot of the other contenders who we thought would uh, be a little bit hotter this season. Yeah, and you know, the side of Bloodhounds, they do have the the team, the, the team composition that they've had pretty much throughout the years. So I definitely expect them to do a lot better. Um, A77 is a extremely strong team to go against. And especially in this season, A77 has dominated, you know, even better, even, even more than they have in previous seasons. So definitely a very hard match for the side of Bloodhounds. But again, there is still a lot of games being played. I do think Bloodhounds should be able to rise up, especially, you know, doing a little bit more homework. And for the side of A77, right? The Tarzan saying that they don't really practice too much. It's, you know, like they're able to <laughs> perform at such a high level in this game. It makes me wonder if they just put in, you know, a little bit more effort to, you know, group together maybe they're going to be the strongest contenders for the championship especially going up against the gaming gladiators who have not dropped a single game in this series and it could really happen i mean there was one season or a period of time where area 77 was the that one team in na that no one can beat it's definitely possible, especially coming from Area 77. But I really doubt when Tarzan said they're not practicing. It's the, it's the star <laughs> student of every class always says, oh, I never actually study, but still does extremely well at a high caliber. So A77 is something to look out for, as, for absolutely. But for Bloodhounds and for other teams who are on a lower tier, like what you guys are saying, they have the whole season pretty much to prove that they can improve to continue working on them. But the momentum is hard to get back. When you start losing in the very beginning of the series, it's kind of hard to pull yourself back and believe that you can win it and actually win, right? That's correct. I mean, we have four weeks of the regular season before we jump into the playoffs and we're kind of getting to close to that halfway mark, right? And looking at uh, Bloodhounds, they're definitely gonna have to pick up the pieces if they wanna be able to have a, a spot uh, against a non-top team in the beginning of the playoffs. That's really what they're fighting over, just like not fight, fighting the strongest team right out the gates to improve their chances of making it to the grand finals. Area 77 though, I mean, 
They took down BTK. They're looking stronger than ever. I think they are definitely stepping up to the scene and showcasing an Area 77 that we didn't even see, I would say, last season. I mean, they made it into the fourth position, so I guess they made it to the semifinals. But I just feel like this time around, they're a little bit stronger, right? I mean, they're able to execute. I don't even remember seeing them take down BTK uh, in the fall season. But showcasing their mastery now, their hero pool, three-dimensional drafting. There's no way these guys aren't practicing. If they're not practicing, <laughs> hey, I mean, maybe we need to just tell all these teams, hey, everybody, just stop practicing. That's the secret. No, don't do that. Don't try that at home. But, uh, no, got to give them credit. That's what easy said. No, no, no. You ain't told me credit that. Credit too easy. When, when you guys were in the interview, he said, I think teams just need to stop practicing. <laughs> Yo, definitely not. But I do think a strong match coming up is going to be between Devious Activity and Night Horde, right? Night Horde was able to sweep Bloodhounds 2 to 0 in their series last week. And this time around, they're facing against Devious Activities, who dropped a game against the Fiends, right? And, you know, going back, if we had A77 versus Devious, that's definitely a strong matchup between those two. But Devious and the Night Horde, they both have to get through their series tonight, right? And Devious Activities has the higher point on the scale uh, but uh, going up against Night Horde which has the momentum coming in did not take a loss in their last series you know I think this is gonna be an extremely strong match coming up for sure now like you said Night Horde versus Evie's activity something to look out for in the next series but before we get there the MVP of this series will be for Area 77, and it's going to be JQD on that Master T grill. Ooh. Did extremely well on that roam, especially with that last engage. So, Easy, why don't you break us down a little bit more on uh, JQD? Well, I'll tell you what. I mean, it speaks for itself with his gameplay. The implosions, the triple sets helped his team close out the game with the winning set. At the end for the second series, definitely showcases mastery on the TIG. A hero that uh, Bloodhound let them select twice. Uh, and, it, and he performed twice on it to be able to get the assist needed on the neutral objectives. And he's just such a bully. Now, I think uh, going forward, you got to have a game plan for that TIG. If you let him pick that up and you don't have anything to counteract it, like a Ruby, like a Diggy, uh, you see, he's just going to make you pay for it and just be that bully with that chain CC that he provides. Yeah, and you know, another MVP candidate should be Rishi, falling quite close there. You know, he wasn't on the scoreboard, but I do know in game one, he was dominating in his performance. And even in game two, he showed us definitely something that we haven't <laughs> seen before, the Flicker Barats, the mechanics coming through, you know, lots of respect to that pick. But once again, the implosions from the Tigreal from both of those series, three, four man pretty much every single time. It's almost like a counter set, right? He's not always the one initiating the fights. He did get a few initiation, especially the game two at the very end but a lot of those fights he was delaying the implosion he was catching the members of bloodhounds off guard and it led to like like four for zero five for zero team fights that was in favor of a77 allowing them to close the game quite easily there yeah especially with roams as well as the silencers they're the ones who really create that synergy and master that engages so with their dominating performance and their team fights it really shows how strong these players are so congratulations to jjqt congratulations to area 77 with another dominating series coming back after the break we do have night horror versus the of his activity so don't go anywhere we'll be back in five Tarzan, good positioning for Area 77 for this first turtle. Cole will trying to stop, uh, I want to say, doing the best he can to kind of harass this turtle. Now at about half health, Nicola. Oh, Position. Looking for some damage. Here comes the last and sadly Mystic Gush is out, but Nicola oh. with great positioning. Tarzan still gets the turtle, and this might be bad for BTK. Cole will end the same. Great turtle and two kills for Area 77. Back online, he was struggling early on, but he should be able to find a kill here now. Ooh, red side, lots of people. PA once again, bringing in four members, five coming soon. Koharu with the place to do it, more to get away. Toru bursts him down, sends Koharu back to base. Oh, the Otto! Force the pot drop the passive just to get away. That eternal guardian is starting to hurt. Uneven, a little bit of trouble here though. Getting shredded down. T able to pick up the kill. 
DA with the advantage, taking out two members from Fiends. Lord marching down. It's gonna be an extremely hard clear for the side of Fiends. No one's fury something. Kohari is able to start down the warp. He's pulled in with the Alpha Fendon. No one's fury does lock on. Oh. Blazing duet just to get away. Protostroy back to the base as well. But Uneven locks on to Kush here. Mikasa also pretty low. Trilbani looking for some sort of pickoff. Kush finally goes down but still has the immortality. Protostroy looking for an angle as well. Gonna come in but locked up and down they go. But Mikasa saving the day time and time again in these team fights. A lot of damage on to Yato. Oy. Comes in, able to pop back on to Kohari. But DA not done just yet. Kohari back onto the base. And DA has locked down. They're going to take us to a game number three. That walk just splitting the whole entire strategy of Legacy of Hearts. Getting this neutral objective without any problems. Holy Baptism locks on. Terrified. Boom. Knocked out. Koyaken hit by the Hayaken. But Yanash might just be next. Riles gonna take a lot of damage. Bloodthirsty Kings on the prowl. Oh. Here comes in, gets a knock up on three members, but no one there. Follow up. And oh, the members are all onto the top side. Is BTK gonna clash with the uh -oh. advantage that they have? Tonus oh. welcome. Not able to land on it. Buddy. But it doesn't matter because the rest of the team is here oh. to help out Ken. Taking a lot of damage. Swansong comes in though. Able to unload on several members. Nicolette goes down. Toya Nash with a shutdown. And Double. Will it be enough though? Because BTK is still riding forward. As Nash falls, it's three for two just when Legacy had a shot. They lose it. A lot of these objectives and small fights. I mean, it's definitely a tough game for Bloodhounds. Already a 4,000k. This is the exact, oh, wait a second, nice suppression, nice grab. They're able to get the kill on the Sayori. No black shoes for her. Oh, my foe takes a turtle, gets it to the as welcome, lands it down, Ooga Boo. Damage, tries to dash away, but Nakoko is on the trail. The last insanity gets the kill. Oh and now a clash from the midside. Violent Requiem locks on my foe, but he still stands tall. Finally falls, but takes Ramsey with him. It's a bloodbath right now. Templus falls next, sleeps as well. Nothing but Boko Rosco left. And also, Fo was able to peel off the quad on the Blazing Duet, and that's going to be quite tough for any of them to come back. Explosion does land. It... Members back fall in. But wait a second, no one's here to counter back. Members are knocked up, and Chaos has unveiled the crystal. Two members down for Bloodhounds, one down for Night Horde. They find another. Boca Roscoe's next, and Templus is alone. The Night Horde should take this game two to zero. I mean, that's definitely been the winning ingredients for GG in these fights so far. Tarzan was the first turtle. He gets knocked up, found out. Now best player, Ooh. even though he's had a slightly rough game. Gilbin Huge Resi takes it a turtle guardian to the face, locked up by Chicken, knocked up by a best player, and Hoon gets the kill. Looking a little bit rough, Mark Judy's gonna be the next to fall. Tarzan not able to get away, the ammo fender locks on, his mod's force dropped by ISO. He's moving in on a several. He's unable to get the kill, and he might just go down to Tarzan. Finds best player. It's one for two. Getting how they want to fight out these fights, and the best player getting caught again, but decides to jump away. It's a good just drop from ISO. He's going to use it to zone. Implosion? They try to collapse up. The implosion connects only on one member, though. The pushback on a several. The big guardian slams down. Shark taken out from ISO, though. Best player might just be next. A double kill for ISO. The final slash. Fly Chicken trying to fight it out. It's a bloodbath. The monster force drops and Hoon drops as well. It's three members for Game and Gladiators gone, and all five of Area 77 still stand. We're back, guys, for the second series of the Night, Night Horde versus Divas activity. Very swiftly tonight, what's your take on the series, guys? 
It's going to be a fun one to watch. Honestly, I think uh, it should be a lot closer than the last series that we just watched. <laughs> uh, I, I think we might have actual a split in predictions. Well, I can't wait to see the predictions on this one, but uh, it's going to be one to kind of watch out for. When it comes to the Night Horde, uh, they lost in game one in their debut against Gaming Gladiators. Nothing too surprising there. Not too many teams are able to beat GG right out the gate. Uh, but then they're able to beat Bloodhounds, who we just talked about a little earlier, not having the strongest performance this season. So right now, I can't really gauge how I feel about Night Horde because I didn't expect them to beat GG, and we all expected them to kind of beat Bloodhounds with the way they've been performing so far. So we're kind of gonna have to kind of see how they play out, but when it comes to side of Devious Activity, I mean, they just got a sweep off of Legacy uh, in day one, and then they won the first game that went all the way to a game three against Fiends, only losing one match there. So it's definitely gonna be one for the books. Yeah, Devious is gonna be the second place in our standings currently, and uh, for the side of Night Horde, they are actually in the fifth place. So Night Horde is trying to climb out into kind of the top four position while Devious is trying to maintain their position as the second placer in this uh, in this NACT. And I think that, you know, tells the story for the side of Devious. I do think they are the stronger team in this series. But Night Horde has surprised, us, has surprised us with, you know, all the brand new rosters and being able to compete at such a high level. And honestly, a lot of the, the, the names on Night Horde is relatively new to the NACT. We definitely have some old faces, but majority of the roster is quite new. So definitely excited to see if there's going to be an uprising revolution or will Devious Activities keep these guys at bay? And speaking of roster, we do have a little roster swap. So Weezy, why don't you take us through it? That's right, it will be in the gold lane. Toru, Gina will be swapped out. Uh, Melon is gonna be stepping into the scene. So this is going to be uh, something to kind of watch out for. A lot of roster swaps have been happening today. Every single team <laughs> that we've watched today has had a roster swap. I'm wondering, you know, what's going on, but again, with new players comes new opportunities and also some possible problems we'll have to see how they kind of play it out in the land of dawn as you are now looking at the full roster for the side of devious activity mel and t yato kush and mikasa like we said former btk members former ackerman uniting for a possible super team yeah and you know the devious activities roster is definitely quite strong um they have the yato t synergy at mid and now they have melon subbing in for toru which toru has done a great job in nact so far but melon also a very experienced veteran right they were able to kind of go to the top two position underneath the team name osp which some of the members are on different rosters now i know btk has a cold world which is the leader of that so definitely you know strong and experienced players coming out from the side of devious i'm excited to see what night horde has to uh bring to the table this time around and let's take a look at night horde's roster for today for Night Horde, I believe we have Sauri in the mid lane. We have Oh My Fo, Momoi, R, Nikonko. So, same roster as the first week. Um, definitely doing. They're on the fifth position, but they're trying to see if they can climb back up with this series. Oh, okay. So um, we do have Sleepy on on um, that roam position or which position is he on might be gold lane i think gold lane xp sleepy on xp here <laughs> but definitely an exciting roster coming out from night horde once again a lot of the players we haven't seen them you know in nact as often as a lot of the other teams we have seen the brand but again this is a complete different roster so coming against devious activity this time around like that's the surprise of element versus kind of the veterans that have done super well in majority of the events so you know definitely going to be a hard battle between both of these teams yeah but we're not counting them out because anything can happen and let's take a look at our predictions for the caster's desk i know my prediction is going down the drain <laughs> Probably the lowest rate right now, but Yue is looking pretty good this season. It looks like Yue is competing for that top spot. So it does seem like Yue is the only one who actually voted for the Night Horde. So tell us about it, Yue. You know, Night Horde is a great team. We want the Blue Dragons to go victorious in this series. You know, I've seen their dominant performance in uh, the Collegiate Tournament. So this time around, I definitely wishing for Night Horde to take victorious in the series. Easy. You know, it's, it's so funny because I was like, I, 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 when I see the predictions and it's like, 
five out of the six casters go to one <laughs> side, and it's always you who's that outlier. But then you think, okay, is he trolling? Is he just like doing it on purpose? But then he Does has he know some something we crazy, don't? <laughs> like he just talked about them competing in a tournament. Like there's actual statistics behind these predictions, which makes it even sweeter. <laughs> But he has a better prediction rate than the majority of the people on the desk this season. So, I mean, he's, he's definitely earned the title of the Mad Scientist. Uh, but, hey, we'll have to see how it plays out. I did go for Devious Activity instead of Night Horde. Uh, I will have to see, though. I, I feel like with Night Horde, they're in that awkward spot like we mentioned. They lost to Gaming Gladiators in Day 1, and then they went up against Bloodhounds in Day 2 and were able to take them down. But it was these were expected, right? This is not You could pretty much walk up to any guy on the side of the road and say, hey, who will win between this team and this team? And the results would probably be the same if they knew anything about the regular season so far. But um, when it comes to Devious Activity, I think they have a lot of superstars who have went that additional mile, whereas there's still a lot that has to be kind of earned from the side of Night Horde. Yeah, and you know, I do think we have the draft coming up. So Liz, a pleasure to come back onto the screens. All right, let's get to the draft, guys. <laughs> Into the draft we go. As we are now seeing both teams fight it out, the moment we've all been waiting for, which may be the spiciest series of today. Actually, one of the spiciest ones. No, it's we not. got a banger at the end. <laughs> but anyway, as we are jumping into this devious activity up against the Night Horde, let's talk about the UA, all right? You're over there on Night Horde side. I'm for devious activity. And funny enough, you voted for them and I voted for DA. So. Let's see who can kind of win in this predictions. I got to climb back up that ladder, man. So looking at the band so far, Barats, CC, Angela taking off the table. Yeah, it's a surprise for both of us. But the side of Night Horde, they take out the Claude and also the Arlot. The Claude, you know, we were starting to see a lot of focused bands being come through. A lot of these teams are opting to switch out the bands, right? We saw the Navaria pretty much get taken out every single game against the Bloodhounds, along with the Faramis. Now, this time around, both teams are not opting to ban out those heroes and going for a lot of different priorities, right? We saw the CC do so well and the Angela combined with it. But this time around, they do not have that available. The first pick goes for Matilda onto the T, and this is a little bit untraditional, right, Reezy? We talked about the, the fighters coming out from T. He's so good at the Arlot, at the Kaja, at the Ruby, but now it's going to be a support roam for the side of Devious. Yeah, I mean, and they've been going for frontline composition junglers, too. We saw them running a Kai. We saw them run a Boxia. You stack that up with something like Mathilda, it provides even more utility on the table. And I like the way this draft is going so far. They are going to go ahead and lock in this carry. It's going to be good to soak into uh, that Fredrin who, and that Ruby. Both of them strong frontline heroes. But they have a lot of CC on the table for the Night Horde so far. Another thing that walks through is the Navaria the combination. I don't think we've got to see a Navaria and a Mathilda combo this entire regular season. Yeah, but this is interesting, right? The side of uh, the side of Night Horde, they opted to go for a two front line opening, and traditionally, a two front line opening, I feel like it's I I would have to disagree myself in terms of the draft, right? I, I like how they closed it out with the fair miss, but it, two two front line provides a lot of weakness. That means a lot of the range carries are going to be banded out, like the Brody, which does well against the carry and the Harith. <laughs> And you know the, the and and without a magic damage early on, the side of Devious gets to be the first one that picks it up, and they pick up the Navaria, which has caused a lot of headaches for a lot of teams. The range that she has, along with the snipes, it's just so hard to deal with that, especially when you're playing a lot of immobile heroes like the Fredrin and the Ruby. But the close out for Night Horde is quite good. I like the Fair Miss pick, and it kind of completes their draft. But the side of Devious, they don't have the front line, and I think Night. Horde is going to take advantage of that. Okay, I was about to say for a second, UA, it's too late to swap sides. You already placed your prediction. You can't change it. <laughs> I'm just throwing that out there. Ain't no switching before the draft. <laughs> like, yeah, so far, I do agree with you, though. I think uh, Navaria, the Mathilda is a, a crazy combination to be able to see together. And Night Horde needs to make sure they're prepared for this. Is this what they want? When you let Meta walk through the table, it's been proven to usually win when it comes to the trades and when it comes to the series matches. So they answer back by taking the Faramis for the sustainability and a Ruby for the CC sustainability and the frontline uh, composition in the jungle of the Fredrin. Now they do need more damage on the table. They need something to possibly give Carry a little bit of a harder time as well. They can run something like a Claude. I think it would actually no Claude is gone. So they can't run the Claude. They can run the Harith. 
if they do want to counter on to this uh, carry as well, something that we've been seeing on the international scene and now trickling its way into the North American scene as well. Who could be a possible problem. We still have yet to see the jungler for the side of uh, Devious Activity. Boxia is still on the playing field. Can be picked up. Would be good. Especially rushing into that Fredrin. Trying to be that bully. Providing that slow. They are going to have to watch out though for this... Uh, pick up with the sustainability right the ruby and the fair miss combination should be able to keep the team alive especially on the first neutral engagements but how will the mathilda play into these team fights oh the lapa lapa gets picked up by the side of nightheart but i just want to say r kind of reminds me of like the rq alberts overseas like he's got that big build and a confident smile up there like he's definitely out there uh you know fighting against the demons but just like you're saying the box here gets locked up for the side of devious i do think that is a good option but now mikasa i feel like he has to go heavy physical right maybe the freya gets to come into play or you know potentially uh something like a yuzong to deal with some of the back lines but night horde a great comp so far they're picking up very very strong level four heroes right the bravest fighter from the lapu lapu should build his own away quite well in a lot of uh the team fights and also the fair miss the cold altar it's very very hard to deal with especially if you don't have the burst available but devious activity completes their draft with the black dragon and i think that's quite good too also yeah, I mean, it's a very strong composition. Textbook drafting from the side of Devious Activity, and I think me and you could agree the last two picks uh, was the best that they could possibly pull out there. The Yu Zong, able to get to the back line, able to possibly get the Faramis out of position, get a knockup, hit the Petrify before he can use that Cult Altar, that Nether Realm, to keep the full team alive. Last pickup Ooh. from the side of Night Horde is going to go ahead and be that Natan. UA, I see the smile over there. Maybe that's what you were looking forward to seeing. I know you voted for the Night Horde for game number one. <laughs> but if I, if I got to vote... I got to stick with Devious Activity, at least in the draft. It's looking a little bit stronger. Well, you know, we cannot take away how much damage the Natan does. We saw earlier in A77, they were able to use that with the Nolan. Now, paired up with the physical damage coming out from the Lapu Lapu and also the Fredron, I do think the side of Night Horde has a very well-rounded draft, right? The heavy magic damage coming in. And if they choose to not build any physical armor, right, Sleepy is going to be able to hit through a lot of the damage. And when you look at Devious, they don't have a significant front line besides the box. Yeah. The, 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 the Yuzong can get onto the backside, but with the Purify, the Natan has that dash to be able to kind of escape. But Devious Activities, they don't have a good set in the front line. And, you know, paired up with the carry, which traditionally requires a good set, it makes me question if Devious Activity is able to make the impact on the gold lane. I will say one thing, though, UA. They need to be able to get back to the Navaria. They need to be able to get back to the carry. The Ruby's going to have to get out there with the I'm Offended uh, to possibly do it, uh, or that Fredrin. But we are going to be seeing both teams jumping into Land of Dawn. Devious Activity up against Nighthorn, our second series of the day. Fight it out for day three of the NACT Spring Season. Who will be able to claim victorious? Yeah, it's going to be between the Black Dragons on the red side, both starting on the blue or it's gonna be the demons on the blue side. Traditional uh, rotations coming out from both of the members. You can see the wilderness blessing on both the roams and the magic uh, and the mages. And you know, quite traditional in terms of majority of their emblems, not really something that we've seen anything that is uh, out of the world, but bot side already a good trade coming out from both sides. I do think that a ton has a slight advantage, but Melon definitely playing this lane out quite well. I would say the same thing. I mean, the Natan has the entropy, so he can kind of expand that distance at a moment's notice or escape when necessary. Mm -hmm. But both of them kind of similar, right? They're going to need to rev up and get their core items to be able to deal that massive impact of damage toward that mid to late game. Now we're talking about who can get to the back oh. line. Speaking of back lines, Kush, full sending R. Maybe it'll take them down, Sayori. Momoi joining the party, but Yato will get first blood for Devious Activity. Takes down R. And, you know, Yato is able to kind of just go in through the wall, hits the second skill, and kind of just bounce back, even with the stun that is available on that ruby. So the mastery of Yato on this Novaria, you know, it's definitely something that, 
you know, teams are trying to ban out because Novaria is one of those heroes that have quite a high skill cap, right? You have to aim the first skill quite well. And, you know, the second skill also has that instant damage provided with a little bit of slow and CC. So definitely annoying to deal with. And the first kill already on the board for Yato, it's definitely going to smell a little bit trouble for the side of the Black Dragons. Yeah, and he didn't just take down anybody. He took down R, the gold laner for the Night Horde. What's going to delay that Natan getting online as early as they want, especially up against that carry? But both teams fight it out for this turtle. Mikasa with the Black Dragon drops down. Double knock up with the Petrify. Got to stop on my foe. Momoi in their tracks. Oh, my foe. Need to get out of there. Retribution connects. Mikasa will find on oh, my foe. One member falling for the side of the Night Horde and the turtle in control from Devious Activity. Momoi will find Mikasa. A one for one trade. They do not have the Retribution, though. His foe is out. And that is going to be Kush claiming this turtle for the side of Devious Activity. Yeah, the demons are able to claim a free objective there, right? Mikasa was able to kind of single out the Fredrin there. Even though he was able to be taken out, the turtle still goes to the side of Devious Activities. And we could definitely tell the scaling of the turtle, right? A lot of the, ex it's not even almost about the gold that you get from the turtle. It's almost the, the global experience that every single member from the side of Devious is able to get. And you can already see a small level gap in between. Even the bot side, Melon is having a much greater time on the bot side compared to R for the side of the Black Dragons. Yeah, Melon ran on that flicker. So he's going to be a little bit more mobile when it comes to these fights, especially trying to escape if Mamoi or uh, Sleepy tries to engage and find a way to him. It's going to be a little bit of a challenge. Not only is he scaling on the bot side, but he having the mobility of the Mathilda, as you just seen with the Guiding Wind, is another thing that we have to talk about when it comes to these engagements, which may give Night Horde a little bit of a challenge. But hey, they let these walk. So I'm expecting them to have a possible plan, but look at the full scent of the bot side again. R! Need to be careful. Devious activity <laughs> up to some treachery. Oh, you had Devious Activity actually opted to use the Circling Eagle, but a disengage, a great disengage actually from the side of Devious because Night Horde has been closing on to the bot, the bot side. Four-man Siege coming out from both teams. A good priority, both of the teams are understanding that they want these marksmen to scale well into the late game. And I do feel like R needs a little bit help onto the bot side, but honestly, it's still even for both of these teams early on. Yeah, you're already seeing Kush doing a little bit of damage to Foe. Black Dragon from Mikasa hovering around. Does drop down. Another Realm has been activated, trying to keep the Night Horde alive. Mikasa very low, but the shot has to keep him in the game. The stun connects. Sleepy will find him. Kush need to get out of there alongside T. Both of them very low. Sleepy on the chase. May be able to find him. T with one HP, able to escape the wrath of the Night Horde. Yeah, right here are actually looking to push onto the mid side. Nightheart, unfortunately, unable to grab up any of those kills there. And the bot side goes down for the side of Devious. So a little bit of a kind of, kind of a missed rotation from the side of Night Horde. I don't think they should be dropping the bot side tower that early. And especially when we're just five minutes in the game, the gold, the, the gold plating was still available. So Melon definitely up ahead in terms of the gold. And especially since the side of Devious was able to take the objectives early on, they're quite strong in terms of a lot of the gold and the experience. Yeah, really, I'm offended. Connecting to Melon. Flickers out. A lot of utility has been used. Appraisers wrath as well. Melon still alive with the carry. Gets out of there. Back to safety. And the turtle is going to go to Kush. Getting everything they came for. And a little bit more. Sayori. Very low. Momoi trying to kite. Trying to allow the Night Horde to get out of the turtle pit. Devious activity. Two turtles in their favor. And another kill is Melon in the mid lane. Will find R. His second death of the game. I just want to say, like, the circling, uh, the, the guiding winds from the Matilda paired with Kush trying to retribute. Ooh, Whoa. a snipe coming out, able to take out Mamoy on the roam position. But again, the synergy coming out from T and Kush has been quite good in all of the retribution. They're able to kind of get Kush out of a lot of the dangerous situation. And this time around, Kush looking to push onto the red side was unable to get so, but a small deny on the top side. Ooh, and some pressure on the top to oh my foe 2v1 kush able to find him that's going to be his third death of the game the jungler for the night horde off to a rough start within the last six minutes devious activity looking to siege onto this mid turret to open up the map even more in their favor but r and momoi there trying to contest the stun 
are very low. Mikasa with the Furious Dive will shut him down. Momoe Sayori forced it to turn to start. Sleepy going to join the party. And Devious Activity shifting focus to the purple buff. Yeah, 72 is the overall scoreboard. 4k gold lead, 6 minutes in for the demons there. And, you know, of course, a clean game coming out from them. The side of Night Hordes, they have to kind of choose their battles a little bit better, right? Focus on the clear, maybe prioritize specific targets, but Devious is just kind of getting away with everything so far. Yeah, taking that tier two turret, or no, tier one turret in the mid lane. Now they're down to their tier twos for every single lane for the Night Horde. 2,000 almost gold lead. Over there for Melon up against R. Already having the Corrosion Scythe and the Golden Staff for the enhanced basic attacks and the slow. Needs that Demon Hunter Sword to really pack a punch, especially up against Oh My Foe and Momoian. I mean, he's going to be a ticking time bomb ready to explode here in the next five minutes as he does pick that up. You are going to see the Night Horde now uh, needing to find some answers and quickly as it's a 5,000 gold deficit turtle inside of Devious Activity's hand. Sleepy. Hit with the circling eagle. Melon will find Sleepy Connects for the kill. Black Dragon from Mikasa. Oh, my foe trying to get away, Sayori. <laughs> Both of them forced back into the base, and the tier two turret will fall. Devious activity and complete control of the early game. <laughs> Yeah, it is a complete control. Eight minutes in. It's already eight to two on the scoreboard. Devious activities, they're kind of just going around bullying unpunished in this game so far. And it's going to paint the picture pretty much throughout this series, right? Night Hordes, they have to kind of try and find a better team fight, maybe even a better lane situation for the toss side dive. Yeah, that's right. Echo will connect to the four members of the Night Horde, and they're going in for the opportunity. Another one keeps the team alive. Amoy is going to find Melon. A little bit of a misplay from Devious Activity. Sayori will find Kush. Two members falling for Devious Activity. A slight opportunity sought out from the Night Horde and they capitalized. Yeah, this is the first team fight that Night Horde has genuinely kind of won. And it's due to Mamori on the Flicker Ruby, right? He was able to grab up both the Boxia and Melon underneath the tower. And they didn't have the spells able to kind of get away from that position. So definitely a good job coming out from the side of Night Horde. They definitely have the ability to win some of these team fights, but they have to play it very, very carefully. They have to make sure that their spells are landing onto the right members. Because if they get the shutdown on Melon, they should be able to win some of these team fights but are here getting taken out <laughs> by the navaria one versus one on the bot side yeah yato a wizard in the making the mid lane menace for devious activity running on this novaria three kills highest kills for the entire team of devious activity and highest kills in this entire game with what we would say is the staple child for the mid lane especially early in the draft a great pickup for Devious Activity, who is now in the lead by five kills, not even at that 10 minute mark and having some good control, but we did see a little bit of a possible turnaround from the Night Horde if they play their cards right, waiting for a mistake. Astro Echo will connect though. Another opportunity for Devious Activity to seize. Momoi very low, it's reactivated. Melon will find, oh my foe, Yata will take down Momoi. Two members out for the Night Horde and climbing R and Sayori left to defend the mid lane. Yeah, it's a huge team fight coming out from Devious once again, able to take out two of the members from the side of the Black Dragon. It's a 4K gold lead, right, for the side of Devious. Another strong performance. And, you know, a lot of these teams right now, we're kind of seeing a lot of snowballs, a lot of good early game aggression, but we're not getting the, those late game comebacks that these teams are looking for. And maybe Night Horde has it in them to be able to do that in this series. And definitely in terms of their draft, they have the ability to do so, right? Natan on the backside, dealing tons of magic damage. Sleepy forcing a lot of physical defense from the side of Devious. So, you know, they do have what it takes. Moi does use the I'm offended, but I don't know if that's going to be the right target. Yeah, both teams fighting it out inside of the jungle, but still working in Devious Activity's favors. The tier two on the top side will fall. Good rotation over there from Akasa, Lord on the bottom side, and it looks like the tier two for the mid lane. The last tier two standing should be falling here momentarily, putting Night Horde in a checkmate position, needing to be careful as you see that Astro Echo connect over there from Yato. Some great placement with this Navaria pickup. Tier two does fall, Black Dragon from Mikasa hovering around, not allowing Night Horde to get out of their base. And from here, Night Horde really has to kind of pick their battles, right? They're down by 6,000 gold. They, I don't even think they're in a position where they can contest on this well, next Lord. I think they need to get R online, right? He needs a couple more kills. He needs a kill. He needs a, some gold in his favor to really start scaling, especially against uh, Melon, who should be fully uh, online now, almost getting the full build to possibly shut down the frontline composition.
Well, the side of Night Horde, I do think they have to secure some of the backline presence that Devious can dive to, right? Kind of peel the Yuzong off the Natan and try to make sure that all the members can be set well, but it looks like Devious are going in. Whoa, triple knockup. Certainly Eagle and the Astro Echo combination from Devious Activity, a Black Dragon. Almost able to seal the fate, but Night Horde makes their way back into their base. Devious activity, maintaining their pressure, keeping their foot on the gas. Yeah, I still think Night Horde should have the ability to clear a lot of the waves, especially when it comes down to their inner tower, which they're doing quite a great job here. The conceal coming through the I'm Offended misses here, and it seems like T might be caught out in a position here. Yeah, even when caught out of position, he's just so mobile and able to sustain himself. Sleepy, on the other hand, though, will fall. T is the one that gets that kill to Mathilda Melon. We'll find Oh My Foe, and back to the base, Night Horde goes. Another trade in favor for Devious Activity, increasing their lead to almost 8,000 gold. Yeah, two for zero trade there for the side of Devious. They're able to get pretty much whatever they're looking for in any of these team fights. Now the Siege goes on to the mid side. The Black Dragon is there available. And the three-man Astro Echo trying to get a wipeout, trying to open up the base for the Night Horde, but a little bit of pushback. Night Horde able to fend them off. Minions are in play for the top side and the mid. Mikasa and Melon still putting on that pressure. Will crack open the base for the Night Horde. 13 to 4 is the overall scoreboard. 13-minute match. AK gold lead the side of Devious looking to grab up the next neutral objective. And, you know, I honestly feel like they have been playing this game quite well, right? Devious played extremely cleanly. They haven't really lost a significant team fight yet. But if Night Horde is looking for a win here, they definitely have to go in here. Ooh, big I'm offended. Momoi able to catch Yato. Finds the back line for Devious Activity. Off to a good start for this engagement. Black Dragon from Mikasa, though, trying to find a member of their own. Melon will find Sleepy a one-for-one -one trade. Devious Activity still in control of the Lord Pit. Momoi trying to find an opening. Rushes in, but caught by four members of Devious Activity. Forces out the Netherrealm. Oh, huge. From Sayori. R with entropy finds Melon. Oh, my foe will take down Mikasa. Stun. Sayori will take out T. Four members falling for Devious Activity. A complete turnaround for the Night Horde. But look at Kush in position. Retribution. Does he go in for a UA? One shot. <laughs> one opportunity. Trying to get around. Oh, my phone spots him out. I don't know if he'll be able to sustain himself long enough. I mean, look at the Lord. It's not low. You're going to see Momoi. Very low mortality. Be proxy. Yori will find Kush. R will fall. Yato. Shuts him down, wraps around, has oh, no. a sniper, finds Momoi. Will he be able to get this Lord though? Oh my foe, able to claim it. No retribution needed. <laughs> Night Horde will take this Lord. That was uh, too close to comfort for the side of Night Horde. They had the lead there, but you know, Kush was there kind of making things extremely hard for the Black Dragons. But the Lord now is marching down on to the top side. This is the first time that Night Horde is able to get victorious in this team fight. And it's due to the I'm offended from Momoi, right? He was able to kind of cleave onto three of the members, grabbing them all up to one spot, letting uh, R there kind of getting the free hits. But take a look at the top side here. The Lord does go down along with the uh, Matilda second skill, being able to kind of just take the melon away from the team fight safely there. It is going to be the Lord going down, but Night Horde with a breath of fresh air. Hey, I mean, I don't know about you, Yue, but the way that the Night Horde was able to turn that around and get four members taken off the board for devious activity, that's pretty scary. That's letting mm -hmm. you know the later this game goes, the higher of a chance they have to turn this back around. I mean, if they can pull that off one more time, they may be the ones who close out this game. Devious Activity, yes, they had the massive advantage in the early game, and now getting to that 16-minute mark, it's going to boil down to who can execute a little bit better. Yeah, and definitely Night Horde has that mo like that moment of greatness there. They're able to kind of just cleave through the members of Devious Activity and get that winning team fight. But that's also <laughs> due to Devious Activity, a little bit of a, mis uh, a misposition along with just being a little bit greedy, right? Everyone kind of dove in into the I'm Offended and then the Taunt just kind of cleared the, uh, the HP bars of the Devious members. But this time around, I do think that Devious has... Um, you know, is a little bit more conscious on that. And 
if Momoe is able to get another good team fight there, get the I'm offended onto multiple members, I do think that is going to be uh, the winning condition of the side of the Black Dragons. Speaking of winning conditions, both teams fight it out over the purple buff. Some nice engagement, but neither side will find a body. You did mention, though, the Night Horde having the opportunity to possibly turn this back around. I mean, hey, you stay in the barbershop long enough, eventually you'll get a haircut, right? And it looks like they're trying to get that full Caesar <laughs> up against Devious Activity. And they may be able to do it. I mean, if they can get to that 23-minute mark, I mean, it's anybody's match. I would even say right now they have the potential to possibly be able to close it out in these engagements. It's just going to boil down to Mikasa, right? He needs to find a way to get to R, shut him down with the Petrify. But it's a hard battle when you have Momoe to rush up against you. He has to chain CC. You have the Nether Realm to keep the team alive. And you have Oh My Foe with that Walking Petrify, that energy eruption. Not to mention Sleepy. And I think this is where they're starting to kind of shine a little bit better. When there's no turrets that they're really fighting over, when it's just an all-out 5v5 engagement, they have a good composition to take that fight. Yeah, and also like the cold alter impact coming out from Sayori. It's almost perfect every single team fights. They're baiting out multiple spells. They're forcing the Black Dragon to come down when that cold alter is popped. So I feel like Night Horde, they definitely have a very strong team fight composition. But one of the key factors that allowed them to win that team fight was taking out Yato in trade for Momoi. And, you know, if they're able to do so once again, it might smell a lot of trouble here. Ooh, they're gonna risk it all. A lot of ultimates going down, trying to find Kush, but the Guiding Wind to bring him back to safety, and now the counterplay! Oi. Triple knockup from the Lord, assisting Devious Activity, Mikasa, like Superman, rotating around, Yato will take the Lord for Devious Activity. Mela will find Sleepy, one member falling for the Night Horde, needs to get back to the base. Yato not gonna allow them to go back with ease. Momoi, very low, Oi. double set, I'm a fitness to Yor, will find Yato, one for one trade. Knockup, Furious Dive, onto R, very low shot, Essence trying to seal his fate. Mela but the speedy light ones will find him. Sayori takes down Kush. Two for two trade. But wait a second. Oh my foe needs to get away. Mikasa right behind him. They're not going to go in. They're going to go for the ender. Look at the Lord at the base. Momoi. Right. Sayori there to defend Melon. Speedy Light Wills is all they need. And Devious Activity takes game number one against the Night Wolf. 18 to 12 is the overall scoreboard 19 minute game 2k gold lead devious activity was able to become victorious in the best of three game one up against the night horde and a great performance coming out from the side of devious 18 12 and 41 is the overall kda and devious came out with kind of a bang as usual right they're able to pick up a lot of good heroes and they're able to kind of get the map up in their favors winning pretty much every single small fights and trades that this that, that the side of night horde was trying to throw at them and you know if you take uh, if you take a look at pretty much the whole team statistics the towers were in favor of devious the lord the turtles everything was kind of in favor of those demons so definitely a good job well done for the demons there Oh, it was a little tricky though, man. That was too close for comfort, honestly. <laughs> like jumping into game number two, if the Night Horde plays like they did at the end, I mean, we may be seeing a game or a series go all the way to a game three. There was a lot of things that went right over there for Devious Activity, but there's a lot of things that went wrong. And I think it really started with okay, early game. They got to neutral objectives. They had it on point, laser focused, able to claim what they needed and took total control. But when it came to that mid to late game, we saw them fall into a pattern that we see a lot of teams fall into where you're not able to close it out with the major gap that you had. I mean, I think there was like a 6,000 gold lead at one point and they fought it out in a 5v5 clash and <laughs> the Night Horde actually won that trade against Devious Activity, which to me is kind of crazy. Uh, but to be able to see that lets you know that they have a shot to even out this series i know me personally i hate seeing matches that are one-sided i don't like seeing games be two zero sweeps with the series so i'm hoping for a game number three but uh at least i do have a little bit of insurance so if we're going for predictions i'll know you way I, I might i might get you on this one if, if they're not careful <laughs> Yeah, well, Night Horde coming in 19 minute game here. You know, they, they just felt a little bit short. I felt like, you know, R on the Marksman, he definitely, if, if he died just a few more times less and got a few more kills, they could have definitely turned things around. You can see Sayori with a perfect score there, but Devious was going to be the one that becomes victorious in this series. Melon is going to be the rich guy. Carry is going to be Yato Sandbag on Kush, the Forgotten One on T. So all the members 
members of Devious able to kind of get the uh, the status that they're looking for here, grabbing up all the trophies and, you know, Devious, again, a wonderful game coming out them in the very, very first game. Golly, look at Yato's damage on the Navaria. Just <laughs> outscaling everybody by a massive amount. Just such a problem on a mage that we don't really see too often because it's always banned out that Navaria, such a strong impact with the Astro Echo, with the Astro Meteor, those snipes across the land of Dawn, just catching somebody off guard. And um, I just think it was some great execution. It's really interesting seeing the way this played out though. For them having such meta picks, having a Mathilda, having a Navara, two heroes that you normally never get to see on uh, a team. Not a lot, especially being on the same team. That's even harder to be able to pull off. And to be able to see how close of a game that was at the end, you gotta give Nighthorn a little bit of credit, right? I mean, maybe they can turn this back around in their favor. But for the side of Devious Activity, I think it was some great execution. If they have one thing that I think they could do a little bit better, it's closing the game out when you have such a major advantage. But other than that, I think the early game, they have it on point. Yeah, and I think for the side of Night Hordes, they definitely had a, a lot of those skills in the bag. A lot of the heroes that they did choose was quite meta. If they could focus a little bit more attention on the boss side, give R a little bit of time, because quite honestly, Melon did a great job on the gold lane. He was able to kind of take advantage of uh, the bad early game that Natan has, win a few of those trades, and actually having the, 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 the lane to himself on the bot side. You can see him hit the gold crap a few times. He had kind of the flexibility to just go around, and he just wasn't scared because he was able to see the pathing of the jungler. So I think Night Horde, if they were able to kind of stay in more bushes, try to get a surprise attack onto the gold lane, maybe they could shut down Melon a little bit early on because, you know, it definitely shows that these both of these teams have some sort of weakness, right? It wasn't a complete clean landslide, even though in terms of the towers, right? Uh, DVS was able to kind of defend majority of it. But in terms of the late game team fight, it was definitely like both teams had the advantage. Both teams was able to get the victorious. It's just that DVS had a little bit higher in terms of the gold and the experience and was just able to prevail and secure a lot of those fights. Yeah, and then jumping into game number two, one thing I would love to see, at least from the side of uh, Night Horde, is a little bit more pressure in the early phase, right? Especially uh, getting a trade on these neutral objectives and also keeping their gold laner alive. Uh, too many times we, we've seen a rotation to the bot side to shut down Natan super early, which gave Carry a massive power spike, not only to farm on the gold plating for that turret, but also to be able to take down the turret. I mean, there was one point in the game when me and you were kind of scratching our heads and we were wondering like, okay, everybody rotated to the mid lane to, to try and do a mid lane siege before the first five minutes and they just completely gave up the bottom side turret for free to a carry. And they didn't you know? even trade so, for it. No, there was no trade. So I, I wonder, well, first of all, I wonder why, who made that call and I, I, I would uh, highly advise against it. But uh, other than that, yeah, just some some heavy focus in the beginning to not allow that one-sided snowball to start forming from the side of DVS activity because I don't think they're going to give them that chance again uh, at, to get to that 16 to 20 something minute game to be able to turn it back around. And I think if they need to improve on anything, it's going to start with the early game. Hmm. And I do think we're going to head into the second game of our draft this time around. I feel like the side of Night Horde, if they're able to pick up the Novaria, it's definitely going to be a good option there because unfortunately they didn't really have too many uh, assassins to get onto the backside. They had the Lapu Lapu, but the Navaria is just way too far in the backside. So maybe picking that hero up themselves, forcing DA to have, uh, you know, that backline counter, maybe, you know, forcing that Yu Zong to come out to play because quite honestly, Night Horde, you know, they were struggling to deal with Yato and until they were able to find the shutdown onto him, then they were able to get the winning team fight. So I think that's going to be a great option. It does get banned out here in the first phase and another hero that got banned out that was not picked the joy in this time around and you know the joy has been quite good in the jungle we didn't get to see it in the xp lane but definitely a good ban for the side of night horde yeah we have to see how this kind of plays out because now night horde has first pick 
inside of uh, the draft, which is going to open up some opportunity for them. Yes, the Navarra is off the table. Uh, the Vexan is off the table as well. So Mage Prowl is kind of lost right there. And Hilda has been taken off the table. They may go in for an XP laner. This is something that we kind of see from them. It could be a possibility. They could go in for something like an Angela too if they want to play it on the safe side. There is still a Valentina that they do have to watch out for. Those, so they need to be a little bit careful. Uh, they are going to go in for the XP link. Like we mentioned though, it is going to be the R lot. So... And that's off to a good start. We'll provide some great uh, damage. And also, if they stack it up with some CC with that Demon Gaze, those eyes that he kind of procs on with any CC that his team provides, will be more of a menace on the team fights. I do like the Arlot pick, but if we take a look at the bands, right? There's two mage bands, there's one XP, and there's two junglers. So I definitely feel like, the you know, in terms of the hero pool, the mage and the junglers are going to be a little bit more priority. Even if the side of DVS decides to pick up the Arlot, there's still plenty of other choices, right? There's the ruby that can counter the Arlot, but DVS decides to pick up the carry. And this time, Toru is actually going to be subbed in for Melon, both of them picking up the carry this time around. So a very big flexibility from the side of Devious. I actually think the Kaja that T has been loving the most could be an option for the side of Devious, but they opted to go for the Angela. Again, whenever I see the Angela, it's kind of like a small cheese play, right? You know, the, the, the heart guard early on, the level one aggressions with the sustain, it just provides a lot of support for, you know, the whole entire Devious lineup. But, you know, now they have the now they have the choice. Do they want to put this Angela into the Rome position or maybe act like A77 where they had Jules QT pick this up in mid lane? Yeah, but the thing is, there's still a Valentina on the table. So, I mean, Night Orc could pick that up they want. But no, they're going to go in for the Nana. Not a maze that we've seen too often, but it definitely Ooh. can hit very hard in the mid lane stacked up with a uh, Tig. Now, we all know what Tig is capable of for anybody that watched the first series <laughs> with Jay Cutie can be a possible problem and i mean they can't really pick anything to stop him from getting those sets at least in the wrong position unless they do an angela in the mid and pick up a ruby i think that's a, a great option for the side of devious activity to stop the implosions to stop him being such a threat because if not i mean he's gonna be a very big bully but they're gonna go ahead and secure their jungler looks like they're going in for a little bit of that support with the front line that fredrin and that angela combination but is it the right answer because fredrin's weakness is cc and that tig is definitely going to be a problem if not checked in the draft yeah i definitely think the side of night uh, the side of devious they're going to look to ban out maybe the boxia or the akai which i know foe is a great akai so we're definitely going to be seeing that but this time around the exia gets taken out this is a kind of a questionable uh, marksman that gets taken out on the board i do think there's better options for the side of devious but night horde with the nana pick takes out pretty much the last mage that uh, North America likes to play. But maybe we're going to see a Gord coming out from uh, from Yato because I definitely like the Gord pickup here, especially with the, 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 the front line aggressiveness that Night Horde has. But there is definitely a lot of options available. You talked about the Valentina to take away the implosion and the final slash or even the Molina Blitz has a lot of great options in this draft. You know, the side of Night Horde, they definitely have to see how they can make the impact with this last band because this can be the last time they get to shelve a hero for good. Now, call me crazy, but they could still pick in the Clint. This is something that they've mm. been picking up against the carry for the side of Night Horde. And I think that's going to be their game plan. They could pick up something like the Harith, which we've seen time and time again be a good counter up against um, that carry. But for the side of Devious Activity, right, they have the late game damage. They're going to be relying on uh, the Marksman carry to be able to deal that massive damage out. But there goes the Ruby that we I talked like about this. in the beginning. I like this just like you do because it can counteract this Tigreal when he goes in to be a bully. Which means I, I'm pretty sure we can assume that this should be an Angela in the mid lane and a Ruby in the Rome. But do we see the Clint for the Nighthorn? I'm trying to call it out. I don't know if it'll be a Clint, but I have a feeling that's just something they're more comfortable with. It it is a very tricky situation, right? The the more front line that Devious brings, it's easier for the Nana to kind of morph multiple members onto the front side and paired up with the CC coming out from the Arlots and the Tigreal, it's going to be a bloodbath 
in the front side, there's gonna be a lot of heavy CC coming out from both teams. Now, Devious definitely has the better sustain, but in terms of the raw magic damage, especially the buff Nana recently, it provides so much Ooh. AoE. And this is what I like to see from Night Horde. Bring in the early game damage, the bully. Brody gets picked up, and I know, Weezy, you got a history with this hero here. <laughs> this matchup is quite good for the side of Night Horde. And Dyroth going up against the tanky frontline sustain of Devious pairs quite well for the Black Dragons. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a threat. It's going to be a problem for uh, Kush on the Fredrin. I mean, if, if Dyroth can find his way into the Fredrin, break that armor nice and early for these engagements, yeah, they couldn't pretty much burst him down with ease. Brody, I like the Brody pickup, especially against a team that has an Angela, because you can pretty much guarantee if Mikasa, or if they're running this Ruby in the Rome position, Angela is pretty mobile, right? I mean, she can just use that heart guard and teleport to anybody. So they're going to be diving into the gold lane and trying to shut down R. And we've seen them do that in the last game, Ooh. right? They were able to shut him down, get an early pick off. Valentina does get picked up for the last slot, which means Implosion is going to go over to Devious Activity, which is huge. We talked about this, right? The Valentina was left and slotted last in the draft. And I think that is very strong for Devious Activity. We're off to another great game between both of these teams. But when it comes to the early phase, I mean, it's a, it's a hard one. I, I like both drafts. I would have to say I'm still favoring Devious Activity, though. I do think the early game Night Horde has quite the advantage, especially with the Brody pick. Brody being picked up in the gold lane kind of changes the dynamics of uh, the game. And why? It's because Brody has such a good early game advantage that he doesn't need a lot of items to be able to deal tons of damage. And if he lives in a lot of the team fights, he pushes the towers quite well. And paired up with the Dyroth, which cleaves a lot of the armor and the front line that Devious does not have to be able to tank the implosion, tank the Molina Blitz and also the final slash. I think Devious actually is in trouble with the draft that Night Horde has come out. The well-rounded early game paired up with the aggressiveness that Dyroth and uh, the uh, Brody has. It's going to be a lot of trouble for the side of Devious. Yeah, it could definitely be a lot of trouble as we are now jumping into Land of Dawn for game number two. Devious activity up against the Night Horde, ready to fight it out in the Land of Dawn. Night Horde needs to find a way to take this game to even out the series as devious activity up with match point yeah you know we're kind of talking back to the casting votes where no one has believed in the night horde besides me so hopefully this time around night horde proves that they are worthy here but side though a little bit of cheese from t able to use like a 2v1 situation pushing uh sleepy back into the tower and you know the the opening that devious has always gives them a good advantage and you know t's just able to make those high plays and make sure that he can cause the impact and look at the rotation from the tig even nowadays he's trying to help out in the xp lane because of the pressure that t has provided early on Ooh, speaking of pressure we're just seeing a lot of flickers baited out early from the night horde devious activity ready to take that fight at any moment now you did say the early phase kind of favors the night horde especially with the early composition having that brody having that dyroth they need to lean in on that right we we mentioned the mm -hmm. night horde struggling in the early game for game number one but with this composition on paper they should not be bullied in the early game as long as they're able to execute with the draft that they have ahead of them for devious activity it's going to take them a little bit longer to get online right they're pretty much going to try and wait for Yato to get a good implosion. But other than that, it's really just gonna boil down to some good sets for Mikasa and uh, waiting for Toru to get those items to hit the power spike to be able to burst down the players of the Night Horde. So early game, Night Horde does have an advantage and you're already seeing both teams fight it out on the bot side. Pull in though from Mikasa, grabs on my foe. Oh. Taunt to Yori, will find one. Chris will find on my foe, a one for one trade as Mikasa does fall. And now you are looking at Kush in an awkward situation, trapped on the wall. Prince is wrapped with three men. Damage. Kush will find Sleepy. Gets the double. Park guard activated. Keeping him alive from Momoe. Back to the base. Devious activity. Takes control for the turtle. Yeah, it's a huge trade coming out from Devious. The sustain coming out from the hard guard. Paired up with the ultimate of the Fredrin Bonk. Able to secure that team fight for the side of Devious. And one of the things that I was worried about Devious is, is their front line going to be able to tank the damage coming out from Foe along with the implosion? But two-man set. Whoa, my foe will find T. 
Chris will fall as well. Oh, my foe off to a great start. Picking up a double and the play to Heptasies to make him hit even harder in this game. And that's the draft that Night Horde has set up in this game, right? They're able to have this early game advantage damage from the Nana and also the Die Rock to be able to kind of just peel off multiple members, especially the front line of Devious. So I think the question is, is Devious frontline able to sustain against the damage from <laughs> Night Horde? Or is Devious able to sustain it and kind of turn up on this team fight? Because quite honestly, Night Horde still has the early game advantage, and you could take out look at the gold lead and the kills on the board. It does belong to the side of the Black Dragons. They are running and gunning the Night Horde mm -hmm. off to a great start. You know, rotating as a team, getting early kills. But the only issue I have with this is they're playing a little too fast, right? And they may need to be careful as if they get too greedy, they're going to lose the lead that they've built up already. You know, the Dyroth, we don't normally see him in the jungle. And I mean, he he can fall off if he's not careful. He needs to be a little careful uh, as we get into these engagements. But still finding another Pajato. Oh, my foe was third kill of the game in the last four minutes. And Devious Activity has yet to catch on and find an answer to respond on the mid lane, though. The taunt, oh, my foe, 2v1 will not be able to sustain himself. And Kush will find the kill. Yeah, well, I just want to say for this Dyroth pick, a lot of players overseas has been able to pick up this hero right here, but are on the top side going up against Tori with the implosion going to be able to take out the gold laner from the side of Devious and hopefully get a siege on going while on the opposite side of the map. Ooh, before that. Ooh, good implosion. Catch him a Moe. The minion falls. Wait a second. He should be able to sustain himself. Or need to get away. T will take him down. Yato on the chase. Momoe able to make his way back to his side of the jungle. Turtle in play. And oh my foe will pull the aggro. Does have the Abyssum Strike. Does have the Retribution. We'll be able to claim it for the Night Horde. Another objective in their hands. Kush finds Momo with the Praises Wrath, though, as a response. Yeah, this is going to be a little bit of trouble for the side of Night Horde, right? A 4 1 front line from the side of DVS pretty much completes their whole entire company. Mikasa here. Whoa! Hit with the CC. Proc and Molina's gets. We'll be able to go back to safety. Oh, my foe is going to make up the distance, though. We'll clear out the mid lane alongside Sleepy. Final slash on Mikasa. Oh, my foe. 2v1. We'll be able to break that armor, but not going to go in for the kill. 6-5 to five on the scoreboard. Yeah, it is still a small lead for the side of Night Horde, but it seems like Devious is able to get a little bit more momentum in these team fights. And once again, I feel like if Kush is able to get a few kills just like this, the front line of Devious is going to be quite hard to hit through. And, you know, for the side of Night Horde, they're relying on picking off the front line. They have the R lot, they have the implosion coming through. So that's why they need to get the front lines to be able to kind of just peel them off early on. And the side of Devious is quite strong here. Yeah, the stun on the Kush, the Bism strike, and Sayori will find him. Going to be able to shut him down. That will be the jungler falling for Devious Activity. And now rotating to the top side, running and gunning it. But this is going to be Mikasa. He is running the Ruby, one of the heroes that's very hard to die because of the chain CC and sustainability that uh, Ruby provides. Do they get it, though? I mean, they may have a chance. T in the mid lane, though, alongside Yato. Does get the implosion on Oh My Foe. A little bit of wasted utility there, though. But the Siege for the top side on the way with the distance, with R in position. They should be able to claim this. I'm offended. Connecting onto the minion, but not able to stop them from taking this Tier 1 turret for the top side. First turret for the Night Horde in their advantage. Now even it out one-to-one -one turret for each side. Yeah, it's good news for the side of Night Horde. They have the early game uh, composition, right? The Brody, the Implosion, the Nana. That's a lot of CC that the side of Devious has to kind of go against. But the longer this game goes, I feel like the Angela might Whoa! be quite good. The Implosion with the Flicker, but only catches one member. R will find Kush. High value target as they don't have the Retribution. Oh, my foe will be able to claim the second turtle of the game for the Night Horde. Yeah, you know, Devious Activities, they're getting picked off left and right, and it's due to the implosion impact that the side of Night Horde has, right? They can pick off whoever is onto the front side, and it's quite hard to deal with so much CC coming through. Final Slash does hit Mikasa, but not able to shut him down. One minute to go through, able to claim it. Mikasa, Fo? not able to get away from the Torn Apart members. R will shut him down. Team will find oh my foe. One for one trade, but Yato finds another. Sleepy 
down for the count. Two members falling for the Night Horde, and it looks like Devious Activity able to hold on to the Tier 1 turret in the mid lane. Yeah, a little bit of a small misplay coming out from the side of uh, from the side of Night Horde there. I don't think that dive was warranted there, especially with no minions. And, you know, Devious Activity was able to defend that quite well, only losing one member trading for two. And when they're down in gold and you get these trades, even a one for one trade for the losing side is quite good. So Devious Activity is still on track to defend against this game. But Night Horde has such a strong early game paired up with the Brody that is currently four and one. He should be able to shred out majority of the front line that Devious puts out there especially if it's just a Fredrin or the Ruby I mean look at Brody already at 30,000 damage there's only 13,000 damage for Tora right now but again the carry is that ticking time bomb the later this game goes mm -hmm. the more in favor it will be for devious activity night Horde has an early game composition so they're doing what they're supposed to do with who they drafted but the issue is they need to close this out with a fast fashion or Devious Activity mm -hmm. will have a chance to turn this back in their favor. Yeah, but the one thing that Night Horde does have is the significance of the front line and the CC as the implosion. Yeah, speaking of CC, catching Kush again, or on a killing spree, we'll find him. Mikasa trying to sustain himself, hit the final slash, trying to give it her all. Torn apart memories, heart guard to negate the damage, and it looks like Night Horde will take control of the Lord Pit. Yeah, and the early game, significance of the brody just allows night horde to pick off any fights that they are looking for especially when the implosion is you know available for the side of night horde they could literally pick off any member that they're looking for even the four and one kush that now has died three times in a row in all these team fights they're able to kind of just grab up whoever they want the the the, the physical shred coming out from the malefic roar of foe and along with r is just shredding all the units on the front side and night horde with a lead the lord is marching down onto the top side they get this mid tower here and i think they're looking to push and grab up more real estate early on and hey me and you both agreed that the night horde needed to have an answer in the early game something they did not have in game number one but this is a different story mm -hmm. they're able to take control of the early neutral objectives dominating over devious activity forcing them back to their base with the lord on the top side which means they should be able to take this tier two turret in the mid lane leaving devious activity with their inhibitors now you know we kind of love to ask the question what does devious activity do from here if they want to have a chance to close out this series well it's going to start with toru getting those core items staying alive and hopefully hitting that 16 minute mark to work in his favor and then also his team building more defense to be able to sustain themselves against the early pressure and massive damage output from the Night Horde. But you did mention Oh My Foe. Good itemization. Did pick up that Malefic Roar. So not only does mm -hmm. he have that Armor Burster, but he also has the Malefic Roar uh, to go through the physical defense built from Devious Activity. So it will be a little bit of a challenge. I still think it's the same exact question of if Devious Activity is able to tank and soak up the CC that Night Horde has prepared right the final slash the molina blitz the implosion those are very very tough cc to deal against and toru and yato still has both the purifies but those two are not the people that are standing in the front side tanking those ultimates right is kush going to have enough sustain to be able to deal to be able to defend against the chain cc that night horde has is the angela able to be there but top side here an early implosion i'm not sure if that's right momoi Oh, an implosion response from Amoe, but his is a little bit stronger. Down goes T. The Night Horde still in control. Toru picking up that Demon Hunter sword, though, still working toward that late game build. But again, I mean, you, you kind of nailed it right on the coffin, right? You, you saw that implosion over there from Yatsu with the IMU. A little questionable, caught sleepy, but the team didn't execute on it. It was like, hey, let's just use this ultimate, but let's not go in for the kill. And then those are the decisions and you have to make as a unit, especially the later this game goes. But you are seeing Devious Activity starting to stack up. Uh-oh. I don't know if Sleepy is going to be the right target there. He, he already caught the implosion on the very first uh, fight on the top side. And this time around, Devious Activity opting to back out. And I think that is a good decision. But once again, Night Horde have the early game advantage. But Toru, even with the carry 12 minutes in, it doesn't seem like he has the ability to scale well. And I feel like it's just the team fight set up here. 
Ooh, implosion for the two-man set. Oh, my four will find Kush. So you will find Mikasa. Two members down for Divi's activity. Sleepy finds a third. Down goes Yato. Toru not going to be able to find his way in there, even with the heart guard from T. And another objective, the Lord going to the Night Horde. Yeah, the Black Dragon's able to perform quite well, and I think the Brody is the key element, right? To be able to have the impact, the kill pressure that Brody has early on, and look at the damage dealt. Brody is completely, you know, dominating in terms of the damage dealt, and paired up with the Dyroth, right? I felt like these two picks in the second phase was so strong from the side of Night Horde. They were missing so much early game potential that DA was able to set up, and, you know, quite honestly, Night Horde and Devious Activities, they went quite even in the first game especially early on so this time around night horde opting to go for a little bit more early game giving R a much better time and it's paying so much dividends the cc chain Ooh. is so hard to deal conceal play flicker implosion r finds yato good setup from amoy but he will fall toru with the speedy light will shuts him down so yori will claim the inhibitor on the bot side opening up the base for devious activity yeah, it's a one-for-one one trade, but it is a roam traded for the mage. So definitely advantage for the side of Night Hordes. They have the marksmen available. Yeah, final slash taunt. Connecting on to R. Kush will shut him down. Marksman falling. Make that a two-for-one trade. You are going to go ahead and look at Kush. Hit with that hard guard as well. Devious activity able to fend them off, but for how long? Night Horde still in a position to possibly close out this game. As you are going to see some late-game items picked up as well. Sayori with the Divine Glaive. Yeah, it's a 7k gold lead, but if you take a look at this replay coming through, they're able to pick up Kush quite early on, and it poses the question, does DA have the ability to tank and soak up this, the, the CC chain and the damage that the Brody, the Nana, the Arla is able to provide early on? Because right now, they're unable to kind of sustain the damage, and the Heart Guard, of course, is going to scale much better when we go into the late game, paired up with the carry. But DA, I don't know if they have enough frontline to be able to soak up the, the, the damage that's coming Whoa! through Momoi. A small whiff here. Momoi just used his implosion. <laughs> what? what was that about? Yeah, but we still got 60 seconds for the Lord, we do so got 60 that seconds. implosion. <laughs> <laughs> the, the implosion's coming back into play no matter what, but it definitely gives the side of Devious a small breathing room to close the gap of the 6k gold lead. This was kind of funny to see. <laughs> like, I don't know why he did that. I think it was a misclick, but like you said, there is still a lot of time. As long as they don't engage before it responds back, he should be fine. Now, I mean, he's been great on opening up these mm -hmm. engagements. He always finds that slight window of opportunity for the Night Horde to capitalize on in every single implosion, minus the one we just seen. I guess that one had an impact as well. It kind of pulled me on the caster's desk. Watch it, man. <laughs> He's just letting us know, hey, the next implosion is the one. Just watch out for it. Devious activity, though. They've had a hard time finding a way to stop Momoi from getting these setups onto the team, even with the Ruby, even with Yato on a Valentino, who has an implosion of her own. It's not having the impact they're looking for. Next Lord is on play, though, and Night Horde looking like they're going in for the opportunity to take it. Yeah, Devious, they're really trying to look for a winning team fight here. Kush is in position. There goes that implosion we were talking about. Two man set. Mikasa caught with it. Very low. Abysm strike. Retribution, but Kush is going to get the Lord for Devious activity. R will find Kush to respond back. It's a double. Finds Mikasa now on the chase. Toru may not be able to get away. R gets a triple, shuts him down. Yato, T, two members left of Devious Activity to fight the full team of the Night Horde. But they do have the Lord on their side. Does this buy them the time they need? What is the strategy that Night Horde is going to come through? Are they going to four-man mid and try to end the game with the Lord march down to the top side? That's a big risk from the side of Night Horde, but they have the members available. It's, fifth, it's 10 seconds on the death timer for Mikasa and Kush, and the side of Devious are looking to defend onto this mid, but it's quite tough. But they have Momoi. Implosion! Two-man set! A full strike! Or by Jato, a wipeout! Momoi takes down T! And the Night Horde takes us to a game number three against Devious Activity. Victory. Ooh, my god. 17 minute match. 20 to 10 is the scoreboard. Night Horde able to prevail in the second game of our series. So one to one tied and both of these teams have a point on the board. So now it's up to, you know, the side of Night Horde if they can draft another early game uh, 
you know, a wonder piece? Or is the side of Devious able to defend? Because Devious, they are the second team in the standings here. And Night Horde, they have three points already looking to boost their score up higher. And, you know, this has been a wonderful series so far, back to back between both teams. But definitely, it feels like the side of Night Horde have found a moment of greatness to deal with the aggression, especially the late game uh, strategy that the side of Devious has offered up. Yeah, off to an amazing turnaround for the side of Night Horde. I mean, we mentioned they have a Momoe over there with those TIG sets just on fire at the right place at the right time. Definitely somebody you can count on. If anybody got MVP in that one, he's definitely a contender with a lot of those setups. Just able to find a way into the back line and no responses back from Devious Activity. And we kind of talked about the keys to victory for game number two. Night Horde needing to find a way to shut down the early game. That's exactly what they did. They maintained that pressure, had complete control, and were able to close out game number two. 10 kills from R on the Brody. Highest kills of the game. Definitely showcasing yeah. his mastery in the gold lane. And now, hey, we said it, we manifested it into reality. Yue, we're going to a game number three. Yeah, and I definitely think that a lot of teams should, you know, try to divert from always picking up a lot of the late game heroes like the carry right and in this case especially when uh, the side of devious has picked up the carry and the angela it, they're, they're lacking in a lot of the frontline sets and night horde definitely took advantage with that the dyroth early game pretty much winning in every single small team fights along with the brody right the devious activities they just weren't able to find out any of these good team fights they lost and lost after every single fight and ended up kind of letting night horde snowball through right and r definitely had did super well early on same thing with foe high damage across the board night horde playing extremely well in the second game Speaking of uh, player Sayori, barely taking any damage, able to kind of stay in the back line. The combination with the Tig and uh, uh, Nana, very hard to deal with if you can't get back to the Nana. And guess what? Even if you do, Nana has a passive that you have to go through and able to take her down. So overall, a great game and a good start for the Night Horde to take us to a game number three, which means, whoo! My predictions on my UA. No oh, man. <laughs> well, what's gonna is, is gonna, this... are you gonna win or is it gonna be me? Time will tell, but a great turnaround from the night horde. Not too many players can pull that off. Yeah, not only if I do end up winning in this one, this is gonna be the second time that I <laughs> might win a vote against five other talents on NACD, so it's quite huge here. Guys, the underdogs are coming back this season, and it's time for the rise of the dark horses. Because all the top teams, quite honestly, they've done super well in all these drafts and all these games. But I really think this year, NACT, like it's, it's all about the Dark Knight rising up. And we got people like Fiends, we got oh, uh, Bloodhounds, we got, <laughs> uh, you know, Night Horde here taking games off uh, the contenders of the series. You know, it paints a beautiful story, especially when you're always voting for the underdogs. This man, UA, is the plague for casters. <laughs> <Adam's> <laughs> <laughs> Stop it! Stop doing this! <laughs> my, my prediction rate is going down the drain and I can't even make sense of it. But here's some things we can make sense of. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the jam-packed action for that amazing two games. Yeah, once again, Night Horde, they're using their advantage, right? There, there's not many of the side of Devious can soak up the CC, the implosion, the final slash, and the Molina Blitz. And Night Horde definitely took advantage of the early game that the side of Devious does not have. You can see Toru unable to get any of the free hits that he's always been constantly looking for. Kush did a great job denying the Lord, but puts the position out of the side of Devious. And look at the members of the retreat, right? Pretty much uh, T is just like, nah. I'm gonna flicker out. That's a loss there. And they're just unable to defend. And Nighthorn with a good strategy at the end, just ignoring the Lord. Five men push down Siege onto the mid side. It's a great play from the Black Dragons. Speaking of great plays, some great things in the land of Dawn is we do have a little bit of a change up, a roster swap in the Another? making. We've been seeing a <laughs> lot of teams changing it out. Sleepy will be replacing with Nikoko in the XP lane. Sleepy out, Nikoko in for the Night Horde. Now they won the last game. Is this the right decision? Switching your XP laner is a huge statement. 
Will it work in their favor or will it be their downfall for this series? You know, you know, Sleepy reminds me of like those like Korean StarCraft players back <laughs> in those days. Like they're just insane at like the mechanics coming through and taking out Sleepy after a win might be a little bit of a momentum shift for both teams. But I honestly think that if the side of Night Horde is willing to play the early game, they took the Brody, they took the Dyroth. And I mentioned it in the second phase of draft, they're gonna be dealing tons of damage early on. It's very hard to deal against that even when you build the armor because there is still the Nana, the, the magic damage that the side of Night Horde have. And you know, they're, they're just unable to defend against the CC, against the damage, the, the, the early game aggression that the Black Dragons have. And I feel like this time around, Devious is going to be much more careful. Maybe picking up a little bit more early game, maybe picking up a little bit more frontline to soak up the damage, pick up like a Chow or something, because, you know, Tricky traditionally is not a support player. That is one of the biggest things that we've seen so far. He's great on the fighters. You give him the Arla, you give him the Kaja, that's where he deals the most amount of impact as the role that he is. But Angela, it's a little bit questionable and Nightheart just kind of used that to their advantage and pushed through, shoved it into their faces, got the CC down, got the early kills, and just snowballed into a beautiful game that they closed out. Yeah, and speaking of closing things out, closing down Sleepy and replacing him, with Nikoko. Now we have to see how much of an impact Nikoko will have in the XP lane, especially after a major victory in the Knights Horde's favor. I'm not really sure if I agree with a, wa a roster sw uh, swap, swap right there, but we'll see. For the side of Devious Activity, though, they're going to keep things the same. More textbook. They lost game two. Let's kind of talk about where they went wrong there. First of all, no answer from Momoi. Even though they had an answer in drafting, the man was just a menace with the Tigro, able to get around with those implosions. And honestly, that's what really helped them out in that game. On top of that, their unorthodox drafting kind of caught Devious Activity by surprise. They pulled out a Dyroth and put, it in, put him in the jungle on top of that. Not something I would have expected, but it worked out really well. They were super early and aggressive on the objectives, and they were able to snowball and complete control of that game was in their favor. For the side of Devious Activity, I'm right there with you. I don't think they're going to give them the same chance. They're definitely going to have to have a little bit of a tighter shot group jumping into game number three if they want to close out the series. But UA, we've got an excellent series on our hands. Something that I didn't anticipate being this entertaining between these two teams. But this is Devious Activity and Night Horde. Devious Activity sitting in that number two position right under Gaming Gladiators and Night Horde tied for the fifth position with BTK. Yeah, but now they have the point on the board, so they're definitely going to be moving up in terms of that ladder, regardless if they do win this series or not. But Devious, they're still trying to maintain that second place. If they want to be gaming gladiators, they definitely have to come through. And this time around, they're able to take the dominating Novaria as a first pick. This smells a lot of trouble for the side of Night Horde and an early Nolan pickup. We haven't seen a lot of success on this assassin, especially when it gets picked so early on. If it's like a last pick and it sometimes slips through, we do see the aggressiveness. You know, Tarzan was able to take care of this victory there, but this time around Night Horde picks it up early. It makes me question, is the Natan gonna be paired up with the with the Nolan? Is the Harith to add a little bit of act, uh, magic spice onto the gold lane, but a great opening, right? The front line from Momoi along with the jungler, it's a great opening from uh, both of these teams, actually. Wait a second, though. Vexana is still on Let the go. table, should be picked up from the Night Horde. Brody will be picked up from like this activity. <laughs> it's off to a good start. They're gonna take I like away the this. TIG from Momoi. He went in for the Ruby instead. The Ruby is still technically a counter for the TIG row, but it didn't work on the favor for Devious Activity when they had the Ruby. But hey, can Night Horde use the Ruby to their advantage up against the TIG? Yeah, well, now I do want to see what the counter play is to deal with the Brody, right? Are they going to just play the counter matchup, take the carry, try to get some frontline sets that Night Horde has honestly always have? The Minnow is still available. I'm not sure if they're going to pick up too heavy uh, physical on the front side. I feel like 
maybe picking up the Faramis or the Vexana that you were kind of talking about might deal good against, uh, you know, the, the, the short range auto attacks of the Brody, right? But no, we do not get the Vexana. Sayori picks up the Faramish. She's done so extremely well in this series. I think not dying a single time in both of those games. And I feel like Sayori is definitely, you know, one of the powerhouses of the Night Horde. You know, she's able to use that cold ultra quite well in terms of the game one. And I think this time in game two, it's definitely going to be very impactful, especially when she has the Purify to deal with the implosion that T is going to have. Now, I will say, though, when you're looking at Devious Activity's draft, they have a lot of survivability. You're looking at uh, the Navaria, able to play from afar, right? She's not really that close, up close and personal as a mage. She plays from afar, uses the Astro Echo, provides a slow to the team, enhances the attacks for your team, and also has the sniping capability to take the neutral objectives or a last-minute hit to burst somebody out of the game. Brody! A good pickup in the gold lane, definitely a safe option, especially up against a Ruby who can dive if that does go in the wrong position with that I'm offended. You have the corrosive strike for the stun, pair it up with the flicker, and you're back to the tier two turret to live to tell another tale. The Tigro, speaking of safety, he could be a bully in the early phase, has to watch out for the Ruby, but still a safe option. I mean, today we have been seeing Tigro dominate in not just this series, but the series before. And I think it's going to be one of those new pickups that's going to be prioritized in the early half of the draft from the top eight teams in North America. Yeah, but the side of Night Horde, they do have the response to the Tigreal, right? They could go for something like a Grok or the Ruby being paired up against it could stop the implosion if necessary. Now, Nikoko picks up a very smart pick. This is something that we've kind of been worried about. Who is going to deal with the Navaria? And the Black Dragon on the Black Dragon team is definitely a great response coming through. And this is going to smell some trouble for the side of Devious, right? The Brody isn't as mobile as a lot of the marksman heroes so yuzong should have a quite a good time but ooh, something spicy here <laughs> the fanny gets picked up in play and this is something we haven't seen quite often we love the fanny pick in north america there's only a few teams in our nact that is able to use this hero and kush definitely is an expert at the fanny yeah i mean with the fanny ooh. provides a couple of things in the game the phobius We'll be slotted in. This is huge. I mean, there's a lot of dash from the side of the Night Horde to proc that demonic force to be able to sustain himself in those fights. Now, all the focus really needs is the elegant gym uh, to really deal some damage nice and early in the game. So that's going to be the game plan. We'll be in the XP lane. Now, this is an interesting composition because you also have the TIG. When he does the implosion, whoever he grabs, the demonic force will be able to proc off of that as well. Whoever he hits with CC, it'll be able to proc. And then you have Kush on the fanny who's going to pave the way in the early game, trying to get to those neutral objectives, trying to get to the gold lane. Probably not going to go in for these early turtles, but shutting down whatever marksman is slotted in for the side of the Night Horde, which we have yet to see. The Claude was taken out, one of those late game damage dealers. With the fanny on the table, I would have said a Brody would have been a great option, but now with the Brody not on their side, Clint. they're going to go in with another marksman that kind of can get a little bit of a stun in his disposal. It will be the Clint, not your traditional pickup but a possible answer to fend himself off against the assassin Menace Kush. Nah, the Clint is actually quite good against a lot of the assassin because his, his, his dash is built in with a stun, so it should be able to kind of push back a lot of the aggressions coming out from the assassins. And he doesn't have that much dashes. And with the high amount of base damage that he has in his skills early on, he should be able to deal quite a good amount, even if he decides to build up something like a Dreadnought or even um, uh, some some other armor items, right? But something that I do want to say is Mikasa on this Fovius. He's traditionally been a great Fovius player back in the past. With the amount of dashes that Nolan and Ruby gives, it might cause a little bit of trouble from the side of Night Horde, but it is an unconventional draft from the side of Devious. This is not the standard utility jungle frontline stun of the XP, but a wild card coming out from Devious. That's right, both teams raising the bars high as we are jumping into game number three. Devious activity up against the Night Ward. Both sides looking to try and close out this series. Yeah, but the Black Dragon has the momentum behind their heads. It is a one 
Uh, it is a one to one in the best of three series. Night Horde having the clear onto the mid side so far, and Devious just trying to get Kush a very fast rotation here. Now, when we take a look at some of these lanes, it's an early aggressive marksman against an early aggression marksman. So both are going to be dealing a lot of damage early on. So the impact onto the gold lane, it's kill pressure coming out from both sides. We take a look at the junglers, it's two assassins here, and that's quite different compared to the traditional utility versus utility that North American has almost always used. And if you look at the rotation from Kush, I mean, he went from his purple buff over to his orange buff. Instead of going from his purple buff to the enemy orange buff, especially having a tick to invade, and that's because Momoi is running on this ruby, and they know, hey, we can't be that bully in mm. the Night Horde's jungle with that ruby slotted in that wrong position, but Kush can still be a bully in the side lanes as first blood has been drawn into Coco. The last minute swap has fallen. Yeah, that is going to be a tough kill, but once again, it is going to be on the XP. Now, the Black Dragon may not be able to be used on that level 4 when the turtle does spawn, but Night Horde still has quite a bit amount of early game. They have the ability to deal with the Novaria if they need to, but Kush here, mid? Ooh. He almost got shut down right there. I mean, he almost got that kill, but it was a, a close call from both sides. Need to be careful. Nolan is one of those heroes who can burst you down on a moment's notice, even when caught off guard. And that just goes to show how much of a heavy hitter he will be for these neutral objectives. Turtle does spawn in, though. Kush able to get his first kill of the game, shutting down Nikoko, putting that pressure in the XP lane. Yeah, now I want to see how Night Horde deals with the blue buff that the side of Devious desperately needs, right? If they're able to take away the blue buff a few times in this game, it's going to put Kush a little bit far back. And we haven't seen the Fanny been, you know, extremely successful in our NACT. We saw Fiends able to get a victory once or twice with it. We also see Best Player take it out for a spin from time to time. But this time around, it is going to be on Kush, which is an absolutely fantastic Fanny player also. So definitely going to see a lot of style points. But from the side of Night Horde, they are going to be the ones starting up this objective. Yeah, Astro Echo going down on my foe with the Retribution. will be able to claim the turtle for the Night Horde. Kush not able to get there in time. Nether Realm activated. Demonic Force from the Casa. Trying to deal some damage, but not able to hit the mark. Sayori, very low. Flame shot Mikasa. We'll find him. The knockup on into Coco. Able to get out with the Furious Dive. Back to safety. Kush trying to close the distance, but out of energy. Yeah, that's a good team fight from the side of Devious. They're able to pick one off, but the objective does go in the favor of Night Horde. And a small miss. I'm offended from the side of Momoi. That's definitely no problem there. The gold lead is still quite close from both teams. Yeah, definitely quite close, but two kills for Devious Activity. Traded that for a turtle. Still pretty even on the board. Kush, not able to close that distance on that turtle like he wanted to and didn't find the trade on the bot side he's gonna have to focus on trying to open up the early game for devious activity since he slotted in this fanny one of the things though that does work in his favor is even if devious activity does not win in the early phase fanny is one of the most mobile heroes in mobile legends to be able to split push to the opposing sides when the things don't work in their favor if they don't have the advantage as long as he can get that purple buff he should be pretty solid oh. but speaking of solid Momoi did it on a tig now on a ruby gets a kill takes down yato now the one thing that you know the side of night horde has is the ruby to deal with the fanny we've seen kind of this matchup from time to time the fanny gets caught by the ruby quite easily especially since ruby has that stun that kind of just bodies the member of the fanny and you know this is might be some trouble here as t might get caught off here yeah gonna use a lot of utility implosion goes out though for the two-man set nether realm Keeping the team alive from Sayori. Good play as Toru on the side waiting to hit that torn apart memories. Eight seconds until the turtle spawns in. Yeah, Night Horde still has the lead in terms of the old, the early game. It's a small lead, but nonetheless, it still is a lead. Now, the side of Devious Activities, they do have this Fovius for the Goomba Stomp. I'm not sure if that's going to create the impact that they're looking for, but they have to make sure that Kush is high in HP and he gets stunned here. Oh, a lot of CC on a Kush and oh my foe! We'll shut him down. No jungler, no retribution for Devious Activity. A small Goomba. miscalculation. A big play for the Night Horde if they want to take the turtle petrify on a Mikasa. Of course, he uses the demonic force, but hit with the stun, and Sayori will get the kill.
Yeah, and you know, they have uh, the, the, the side of Night Horde has the ability to stun up the Fovius when he comes through, stun up the Fanny when he's looking to go for a kill on the boss side. They have the Black Dragon to deal with the Navarian, zoning him away, and also to cancel some of the implosion impact that he has. So, Night Horde actually has a great comp to deal with the aggressiveness that Night Horde uh, that the side of Devious is looking to put onto the board. But you see Ooh. the tick. Ooh. Gets a Sniper's snipe and out. takes the blue buff. Oh, my foe. No, he took it. No, he did take it. Implosion for the double set. Forcing out the nether realm. 1 HP on foe. Kush. Rushes in for the opportunity. Shuts it down. But Momoi will spawn back. Shuts down Kush. Mobilization on the T. Unable to get out of the CC. And R will get the kill. Yeah, that's a lot of trouble for the side of Devious, right? They had a good implosion set right there. They were able to grab up two of the members, but Foe is the only one that goes down. And Kush, coming out from the backside, actually had the advantage, but he did get stunned up by the Ruby that I'm offended. Paired with the second skill was just too much CC to handle an R. Even with just a Thunder Belt, he opted to go for a little bit more of a defensive, kind of like a casting build. He's still able to deal tons of damage, being up about 1k gold lead compared to Toru on the boss side. Yeah, and right now, even though Night Horde uh, are doing good, they need to find a way to claim some of these turrets, right? They took the first two turtles, even though it wasn't the easiest thing to pull off. An implosion going in, two-man set, knock up, torn apart memories from Toru. On the way, T finds another fine Sayori. Toru will find Momoi, two members... Uh, Falling on the board, five to five on the school bro now, now even for both sides. Yeah, it's a great fight coming out from Devious Activity. They're definitely looking to, you know, win in some of these small skirmishes because quite honestly, they haven't had the success that they have been looking for. But the top side, Kush. Yeah, Kush will rush in, up. finds Nakoko. Oh man, I mean, how do you feel about Kush on the Fanny UA so far? You know, like, the Fanny is quite a interesting pick here, right? If he's not able to get shut down and he has the ability to kind of run around the map without getting punished, then definitely it's it's good for the Fanny, right? And he's able to grab up the blue buff with no problem. But the side of Night Horde has the Ruby and they're looking to engage on the bot side. And this is what helps the Brody out, having that flicker to be able to get back to safety at that tier two turret. We kind of call that out during the draft, but he does lose his turret on the bot side, giving the Night Horde map advantage. That's the first turret falling of this game. Turtle will go to the side of Devious Activity as a trade. Yeah, a small trade though. Night Horde was able to grab up to the bot side, looking to get the Yato on the mid, and that's a huge kill. That's a huge Ooh. wave clear on the mid side that the side of Devious won't be available here. It's very hard to already cast Navaria and able to catch him twice already in this series smells a lot of trouble. It means that Night Horde has, you know, the heroes to be able to counter that long range caster mage. And 6 to 6 is the overall, but Night Horde seems to still have the lead in their hands. Yeah, 2,000 gold lead for the Night Horde. I'm offended on a Kush and R with grenade bombardment. We'll find him. A great assist from Momoi on this Ruby to open up that initiation. Mm, 3k gold lead, 8 minutes in. Night Horde still having the lead. And you can see Foe here dealing tons of damage to Mikasa. They do look to disengage, but Night Horde is able to grab that real estate on the top side. That's a lot of trouble for the side of Divas, especially since they're the second in line for the contending, you know, the NACT contending. And... You know, Night Horde is definitely showing up in this match. I think it's due to the comp that they decided to drop. Lots of CC here. Yeah, or we'll find Yato, another I'm offended, catching a member out of position. The mage for the side of Devious Activity. Sayori very low. Both sides find it out. Toru will find R though. Response back a counterplay in the making. Toru with the double. Finds the Coco Demonic Force. Mikasa takes down Momoi. Three members falling for the Night Horde to one. And now Devious Activity may have found what they needed to gain control of this game. But oh my foe in the bush clears the minion before Devious Activity can take the tier one turret. Yeah, huge misplay coming out from the side of Night Horde. They kind of over engaged. And when you take a look at R's position there, he second skilled forward and got caught underneath the tower and you have the Fovius kind of just Goomba stomping from the backside. They didn't even have Kush there in the team fight. And you know, when Kush is not there in the team fight, it almost feels like Devious Activity is able to get a pick off without it being traded. So definitely you're, you're gonna see a banana split coming out from the Devious Activities because I think that's the biggest advantage that they have in this draft. Yeah, both teams fight it out. Astro Echo going down, Black Dragon from Nikoko. 
Trying to find the back line to drop down on. Kush. More knockup. Oh, my foe. Very low. The constant amount of force will find him. Gets a double. Shuts down Momoe. Kush will get the Lord. Toru finds Sayori. Davius activity up to some treacheries. Nakoko will fall. Mikasa with the triple kill on the Fovius. A slam dunk. Major yeah. objectives on the board for Devious Activity now gaining control of the match. Yeah, and Krish came in on the backside kind of perfectly, right? I think he definitely learned his lesson not to engage early on, especially when Ruby has the stun. And he was able to take out the Nolan just like that, right? A cutthroat, a second skill, and boom, Nolan is off the map. Devious able to be victorious in the skirmishes onto the late game. Smells a lot of trouble for the side of Night Horde. We can take a look at the replay. Look at Kush's position on the boss. He's just waiting, looking for that pick, and boom, he comes through, grabs up foe, hits the retribution on the Lord, and a clean team fight for the side of Devious. Yeah, both sides playing tug of war, but Kush will find Momoi. The Ooh. roamer down for the side of Night Horde Nether Realm, keeping them alive. As you are looking at Devious activity, trying to push through and open up their base. R, very low, needs to get back for some Legion. You're gonna see the Furious Dive. You're gonna see Mikasa rushing with the demonic force as well. Will fall. So you're getting the kill. Mikasa will fall. Toru taking another turret for Devious Activity. R will find Yato though. <laughs> A lot of chaos in the land of dawn today between Devious Activity and the Night Horde. But Devious Activity now has control. Yeah, that's a good defense coming out from the side of Nighthorn. They did not lose any towers on the very first objective. Now, they have been losing a lot of team fights, especially the pickoffs, right? Fanny, they were able to kind of shut Kush down early on, but it seems like the later the game goes, the mobility that the Fanny has is just a little bit too much to deal with. The side of Nighthorn, they don't have that split pusher to deal with the aggression that Fanny has, and the banana split continues for the side of Devious. Yeah, they're going to have to watch out for that, right? We talked about the Fanny being one of the most mobile heroes. Speaking of Kush, he rushes in. He tries to find an opportunity, but the CC is way too much for him to handle. Every time he goes in, you're looking at him drop to about half HP. And he's going to have to be careful with that. The later this game goes, the longer the respawn timers will be. And if he's not in these games, Nighthorn will make the most out of that advantage to be able to turn this back around to regain their control. Are we seeing a no tig no win in our today's matches? Because it definitely feels like a no tig no win. The implosion impact on any <laughs> team has been quite eventful here. And, you know, T has done so well in this game already. 1 1 and 11, catching multiple members for from the side of Night Horde and Toru. A perfect score. Four. Zero and six, a lot better compared to the carry game that he had before. Definitely the early game can be, you know, disruptive in terms of the the rotations that Night Horde has to do. Now, 13 minutes in, 14 to 10 is the overall scoreboard. 3K lead for the side of Devious. And I do think the banana split strategy that they are implementing here is very hard for the side of Night Horde to deal with. Yeah, but you are going to have to see if Kush can kind of keep that up, right? As long as he doesn't get caught out of position. I mean, look, every time he rushes in, he's taking some serious damage, and he needs to be careful. Now, Next Lord is in position. It looks like Devious Activity and the Night Horde have a couple of members out there to be able to contest, but T, need to be careful. About 50% HP, using the implosion super early. Demonic Force goes down as well. Two major ultimates from Devious Activity. Nokoko, Black Dragon, Nether Realm to keep him alive. Back down with the Furious Dive and the Petrify combination. R will find Yato with Grenade Bombardment. Toru responds back, taking down Nikoko. Kush will take the turret on the top side, opens up the base for the Night Horde and able to get out alive. A beautiful four versus five coming out from the side of Devious. They knew that Kush was on the top side pushing, and T was able to get the implosion off before the Black Dragon was even used. The only member that fell was Yato, and I think it's due to the they they don't have enough front line, right? Devious, you know, and if they had the utility jungle, they should have the front line available. But this time around, Devious has an assassin, and Mikasa is not there to kind of peel off anyone that's on Yato. So Devious still struggling in terms of trying to get Yato in a good position. But now that they are winning these team fights, it's very hard for the side of Night Horde to come back. They don't have the split push to be able to deal with it. They also don't have the implosion that, you know, the TIG pick has been denied and picked up by the side of Devious. So a lot of things that aren't going in the favor of the side of Devious and our Night Horde, but they're going in again. 
Yeah, going in. Kush with the split push. Nether Realm being activated. Knock up Tor. We'll find Oh My Foe. Monster kill. Jungler falling for the Night Horror. The response back though. Black Dragon from the Coco. Drops down, but not able to connect. Back to safety. He goes. Devious activity. Able to find a window of opportunity to take this Lord. Yeah, it's going to be uncontested Lord for the side of Devious here. 16 to 11. Side of Devious is able to, you know, get the victory of every single of these small skirmishes. It smells a lot of trouble here. And now Night Horde has to look to defend. A 5k gold lead here. I honestly feel like they have the opportunity to defend, especially if they could get Kush to kind of go in before the I'm Offended is used. The Black Dragon can be used to zone out the Brody, but then Plosion set coming out from the Tig is very, very tough to handle, right? We've seen the Implosion create so much impact, and Tig Real hasn't died a lot in this game, so he's quite tanky. He has the Antique, the Athenas, along with the Dominance Ice. He's a very tanky unit, and for the side of Night Horde, to try to find the focus in maybe they have to get the ruby into the backside maybe the Faramis has to be able to deny some of the cc that the chigreel has or disrupt the ability of the implosion maybe nikoko has to use the black dragon form early on so t does not have the ability to go for those flicker sets here and now devious activity looking to try and close out this series Two inhibitors to go through, and the full team of the Night Horde are very low. T as well. We're gonna go ahead and recall back to the base, which means they will not have the set potential, and the Lord will be bursted out. The Night Horde able to defend Devious Activity on the push, but do they pull back or do they go in? Minions are falling at a fast rate, and it looks like they were not able to look for the opportunity they were hoping for. Yeah, no, it's a good defense coming out from the side of Night Horde. They were able to grab up the TIG early, so the frontline set is not going to be available. The Black Dragon Ooh. gets popped up. Might be a little bit early, but I do think the hard waves are over for the side of Night Horde. They should Whoa. be able to kind of just defend against the damage coming out from the side of Devious. <laughs> Kush almost took down R right there. But yeah, that early <laughs> Black Dragon, a little questionable. An implosion, though, not questionable at all. R with Raitoru, killing spree activated. May work the in the Night Horde's favor if they can keep it up. Demonic Force dropping down. Mikasa hit with the stun. Astro Echo connecting to the full team of the Night Horde. From Yato, Ooh. finds the snipe, takes down Nikoko. The suppression winner, Truncheon, trying to stop on my foe. Kush with the steel cables, the cutthroat on the foe. One more hit, able to take him down. Uses his retribution. <laughs> And back to safety he goes, a two-for-two two trade. It is a two-for-two two trade, but typically when it comes down to, you know, these even trades, the losing team is going to have a little bit of advantage, just getting some gold back into their favor. 18 to 13 is the overall. The Navaria is still dealing tons of damage. 82k, Fovia 71k. So a lot of magic damage being provided for the side of Devious Activities. And paired up with the Fanny, it's definitely a tough situation to defend there. And I got to kind of give credit to T over there on this TIG. We kind of mentioned he's been running a lot of like the frontline fighter the fighters, roamers, yep. right? He's had the Hilda. He's had the Ruby. But we got to see him showcase a, a, a Kaja. He did well on that. And now being even more versatile, pulling out the TIG reel, which is becoming that staple child for the uh, roam position. And like you said, it's really boiling it down to whoever has TIG on their side having the advantage. But right now, still anybody's game as the Lord spawns in and the Night Horde looking like they're preparing to contest yeah now it's kind of the side of night horde to see how they could defend against the split push coming out from fanny because kush has done a great job and look at him looking to go for that kill on to the nolan but he's not going to be able to get it but the four versus fur fight nether realm going down a knock up over there from t Mortality being proc double immortality or will fight toru though gets that double shuts down t yato finds the coco a triple kill from ours mikasa will fall yato kush by themselves against the four-man team of the night horde is this the game ender is this what the night horde needed to close out yato? this series a major objective i'm offended for the seven Oi. yato with the steal gets the lord for devious activity and back to safety he goes kush not even needed split pushes on the bottom side that's huge for the side of Devious. Yato able to save the game with a Novaria second skill. Unfortunately, Night Horde was unable to secure that objective. And now the Lord, it's a slow march. It hasn't even spawned. And the members of Devious is going to be up and available for this 
push here. Night Horde in a pretty bad situation. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to come back alive with this Lord marching down. I always say with the Navaria, it's like getting two retributions for one. And it goes to show right there with Push. Got out of position on my foe. Brought to Immortality. Gets the kill. Hit with the Astral Echo. Hit with the Snipe. T. Conceal play. Implosion Flicker. Gets the setup. And down he goes. Immortality Brock. But Netherrealm trying to keep him alive. So Yori not able oh, no. to get that Toru. Finds on my foe. So Yori now may find himself down as well. And able to escape 25 members. Toru will get the kill. A knockup. Demonic Force airborne. And Coco goes as Yato sends him to the moon. Two for one trade. Lord will be bursted down by the Night Horde. But Devious Activity on the push. They may be able to full send this. They do have the numbers. Only one lane of minions though. Do they go in for the Ender? Oh my god, the damage going on to R is just unbelievable. Yato's on the backside, just looking at R the whole entire time. Now to side now now, now the side of Night Horde, they have to look to defend Whoa. this implosion does come through. T with the implosion on a Sayori, but not gonna hit the impact. He's looking for Mamoi, shutting down Yato. A turnaround possibly for the Night Horde. Devious activity needs to be careful. Mikasa hit with a lot of CC. Stun, unable to get out of there. Force to use a demonic force. Sayori will find him. Devious Activity stripped down the Night Horde of all of their inhibitor turrets, but not able to close out the game. Yeah, it seems like Night Horde has found the rhythm in terms of these small skirmishes that are so important in the late game. They could win these 4v4 team fights without, uh, without foe. They could win these small skirmishes and defend, and now a five-man <laughs> siege onto the mid side. The death timers are so huge right now. 30 seconds for Mikasa, 20 for Yato. Oh, they're going for it. They're trying to close the game out of Conceal play and oh, oh T. One chance! When a trunch ship from Toru to keep the life R! Opens up the base of Yori, finds Kush! Looks like Nio are trying to close it out. Black Dragon! R will be able to get the kill. Shut down T Toru by himself. Only uh no minions though. They don't have minions. They have to wait for the minions to come through the mid lane to close yeah, this Yato. out. Mikasa back in three seconds. Toru and Yato to defend against the five-man team of the Night Horde. Oh. Is this the game ender? Yato finds one, finds on my foe, but the Night Horde takes down the base crystal to close out the series against Devious Activity. Victory! Yo! -ho -ho. Are we in this or what? Night Horde able to take the victory in this best of three series, two to one, in a fashionable statement against the second place teams in standing 21, 23, 42 of complete bloodbath coming out from both teams and they're able to turn around this no tig no win fashion here that we have in the week two day one no, no tig no win <laughs> able to kind of keep the world at their toes that was a crazy series you way again we did it able to win it. with his predictions how does he do it is you are going to see the night horde pushing through it was a very explosive game i mean both sides having over 20 kills <laughs> Man, a lot to break down inside of that match at that 22 minute, 35 second mark. Devious Activity was at a position where they could have closed it out. They took all the inhibitor turrets. But last second, Night Horde, a light switch turned on and they were able to push through Devious Activity to close out the series with the last minute conceal play and a full siege through the mid lane. Yeah, a great game coming out from the side of Night Horde. And you can take a look at some of the items that Art has built up. It's definitely a tower focusing build there. But honestly, the side of Night Horde, they have the ability to kind of shut down the the uh, the Fanny and also the Fovius pretty much the whole entire game. They had counters to deal with the Tig roll, especially coming out from the Ruby. So Tig is not like a like an all win card so far. It's just that the Tigreal has been quite strong in plenty of these engagements. But the side of Devious, once again, they picked up the Brody quite early on and kind of got outranged by the Clint when he comes into the late game, right? The team fight participation again, Sayori, beautifully, 95% KP and also 110k damage for R. The two damage dealers from the side of Night Horde just pairing so well, especially with the front line, the physical damage that the Nolan and the Yuzong provides. Yeah, just overall a very good game from both sides. Like I said, they're battling like tug of war, whoever could just pull that rope a little bit harder, but the Night Horde able to make it work in their favor. Last second, and this is a major statement. Looking at the rich guy R, 
856 gold per minute. Yato, the carry, the sandbag from Mikasa, and the forgotten one, T, racking up them assists at 18. Now, like we said, this is a major statement for the Night Horde. They took down Devious Activity, who was sitting in that number two position, forcing them down to that number three, putting Area 77 in the number two, and completely changing the entire uh, bracket for points for all of these teams so far. And this is what you love to see, right? You don't want to see one-sided stories in North America. These teams are scaling through the times. And Night Horde, not disappointing, off to a good start, able to shut down Devious Activity and climb higher on the bracket. Yeah, you can definitely hear the Night Horde roar from the back side, but got the host Liz coming back into place here. How'd you feel about that game? I mean, I don't know what to say. I just want to ask you way the question, how, what, what is it? Like, do you, are, are you doing some kind of betting behind the scene? Like, what is going on? You just keep on getting that Dark Horse pick, but it's always right. So, so tell <laughs> us about it. No, I mean, it's definitely not, um, you know, all like, it's, n it's definitely not like I just shot in the dark and it just ends up winning. It's a close game coming out from both teams and Devious definitely had the opportunity to win in that series. But, you know, the dark horses, the black dragons, the underdogs this time around able to take care of business, Liz. It's been a great uh, betting so far in terms of the votes. <laughs> So what Yue is saying, he's just better than all of us with <laughs> his predictions and his understanding of the teams. So congratulations, Yue, on mastering that prediction game Night again. Over. How do you feel, Weezy, lost in the bet to Yue oh, this game? <laughs> it's bittersweet. It's bittersweet. I mean, I'm torn between two things, right? Number one is uh, obviously I'm upset about losing my prediction <laughs> yet again. But uh, I'm happy to see uh, the Night Horde able to turn that around in, in a different Night Horde than we've seen last in ACT. They've been improving through the season and they're just getting started. And th that's what I love to see. I don't want to see one-sided stories, 2-0 sweep. So I'm glad it went to a game number three. I'm not happy about my predictions, but I'm happy about uh, seeing teams scale through the times because we want to see North America grow, especially for whoever wins the NACT spring season is going to represent us internationally. And hey, if that was just a showcase of the talent we have to provide today, and our matches are just getting started. This wasn't even the most anticipated series of the day. Yeah, it's already wasn't. going better than we expected. So now we have an interview with the team that won Night Horde. We have Oh My Fo joining us at the desk today. Hello. Hello, Fo. How are you doing? Doing good. Congratulations on that victory. Thank you. Well, I think the first off, um, you guys obviously did super well in all three games, but the elephant in the room is kind of what what is going on with the roster swaps? Because you guys swapped rosters multiple times this series. Um, what is the reason for swapping in Nikoko with for in game three again? Um, the it's because um, our XP laner has strict Asian parents, so like <laughs> he has dinner, he has dinner at seven and he can't really dodge it. You know, he can't tell his parents. Whoa! Like, hey. Is that is that actually what happened? That's the main reason. Yeah. We got Nikoko last wow, second. So, <laughs> so Sleepy's mom or dad told told him, "Oh, you have to have dinner right now," and then he just quit yeah. playing the game. He, wow, he was, that's, uh, uh, yeah, his parents, yeah, his parents were screaming at him the second game too. So we were just trying to like hurry wow. up. Wow. <laughs> well, it shows very talented young players for sure for the <laughs> NACT. Um, hopefully, next time Sleepy can make it with the with the series and the other question that a lot of um a lot of our fans actually have is there's a stereotype that girls are not as good at video games than boys but Sayuri, Sayuri is doing so well so mm. do you think from a team leader's perspective that Sayuri is as good as other mid laners like Hoon? I mean I wouldn't say she's better than Hoon but I could say she's up there but like since yeah, I'm technically like the drafter for the team. So what I usually do is like, she's strong with these and these type of heroes. And like, I kind of draft around her. So like, mm. that's why she plays well most of the time. Yeah, and she's doing super well with that Nana pick. Definitely very well drafted on your part. So that's, that's amazing. And the last thing is, um, we know that you participated in some previous tournaments as well. So why don't you give us a little introduction on your team, who you think is a very strong player, 
your own history. Just give us a little briefing on Night Horde. So, I mean, we had a couple of roster changes, but Tonax, like, the, the main one that I didn't swap around with is, like, we're the, we're the main duo since uh, Beat the Odds. But, um, realistically, our strong, our strong, I mean, obviously R is one of our strong goal leaders, too. And, like, I feel like we're strong all around. It depends on our draft, realistically. Like some some days they uh, some days they play pretty bad, and some days I play pretty <laughs> bad too. But we we work around it. Yeah, sometimes the moms is is, is calling a little harder. Some days they have <laughs> more chill time. So <laughs> definitely keep that out. And um, you guys did really well today, making a strong appearance. And the NACT beating the top two team right now. DA is top two, <laughs> and then you guys just beat them. So, so much potential, and uh, we look forward to your future drafts, and we look forward to seeing you back at the desk again. All right, thank you. Whoa, guys, did you hear that interview, guys? <laughs> it's <a> pieces, <laughs> but I, we kind of have a hard time hearing it since we're on the actual show. <laughs> Uh, but I did hear that he said Sleepy had to go uh, eat, and that's why he wasn't able no, Sleepy to. Sleepy had okay, so Sleepy has Asian mom, Asian parents. So Sleepy's parents does not let him play video games. So he has dinner at seven, and it's a very strict dinner time. So Sleepy has to go have dinner with his parents instead of uh, dropping out of the, the the competition. So that's definitely something um, that's very interesting and very unique to our NA players. <laughs> Yeah, definitely unique to showcase that we have players from all different perspective uh, areas showcasing their talent of different ages as well, you know, so it's definitely some credit to them. You mentioned them taking down the number two team at Devious Activity. Not the easiest thing to do, and that just showcases that Night Horde is one of those contenders that we're going to have to watch for as we progress through the regular season. Yeah, definitely, you know, one of the underdog teams that are able to perform quite well. And especially with, you know, multiple members that haven't been in the NACT circuit for quite some time. It's very exciting to see all these teams dominate uh, some of the contenders, some of the veterans that are on the stage, right? And, you know, the next game that we have is, again, another Dark Horse, two Dark Horse team. It's going to be between Legacy and Fiends. It's quite an exciting match to see all these, you know, underdog teams perform at such a high level, keeping the contenders in check well you may keep getting a little too excited out there we still haven't found the mvp yet the mvp <laughs> i believe is ready so wheezy why don't you take us through it that's right as we are looking at the mvp it will be momoi we've seen is showcasing on the tig grill in game number one the ruby on game number two three four and thirteen an amazing performance getting the sets that his team needed opening up the initiation for the counter plays as well when you saw Devious Activity try and take the fight to them. A good roamer, and honestly, I'm looking forward to seeing what he brings to the table as they progress against some of the other contenders in the NA scene. But taking down Devious Activity, the number two team, off to a great start. Yeah, definitely. Good performance coming out from Momoi here. He's able to kind of just deny uh, Kush every single opportunity that he had with the Fanny there. The Tig Reel was great, plays through, and, you know, he's constantly challenging the meta with a lot of these great picks, right? The Ruby that got picked up twice, the Tig Reel that also got picked up again. Dominating performance from Memori, definitely well-deserved as a roamer for the MVP. I mean, are we going to see a Tigreal ban from now on? Because Tigreal has been making <laughs> such a strong presence today in all the two series. Um, and we'll see how the next two series goes, right? Legacy versus Fiends. Legacy, as you has mentioned, as also is also in that spot where they haven't won a single game. But to be fair, they did face two very strong teams, D uh, DA as well as... Um, Second day, also very strong team. So today is kind of their chance to show if they if they got it. If Assassin Rouse still got it. So we'll find out after the break to see how Legacy does. Oh, we have a giveaway for all our lovely fans. Before you guys go, we have some skins at your pool. We have 
on the screen, you see a code there. So type that code or scan that QR code. I love the upgrade. I love how you can just scan a QR code to get these. So I expect them to go away very fast. We only have 31. So make sure you come first and redeem that code. I know Weezy is probably typing in that right now to on his extra <laughs> phone to get that skin in. So guys, make sure you come fast and then get your skins. We have a lot of these giveaways coming your way. So every time just be prepared and watch our stream and get your phones ready. Yeah, I definitely had my phone ready to go. <laughs> I just, I just, I just throw that out there, guys. I'm not really taking those skins. I just, it's just a funny joke. I seen a couple of people like, man, yeah. Weezy just took away my chance. No, honestly, <laughs> there's 31 available. There should still be 31, but you want to make sure you scan that QR code to, to claim it as soon as possible. Yeah, most definitely, Weezy. Mm -hmm. Save some skin for the rest of us. Come on, man. Like, don't, don't do this. <laughs> yeah, come on, man. So, uh, let's come back after a short break you guys got your skins and go grab a drink grab some snacks and we'll see you in a bit okay, you notice tarzan good positioning for area 77 for this first turtle cole will trying to stop uh, i want to say doing the best he can to kind of harass this turtle now at about half health nicola at the Whoa. Looking for some damage. Here comes the last and Sandy. Mystic Gush is out, but oh. Nicola with a great positioning. Tarzan still gets the turtle, and this might be bad for BTK. Cold World and Mobazane get taken. And a great turtle and two kills for Area 77. Came back online. He was struggling early on, but he should be able to find a kill here now. Ooh, red side. Lots of people. EA once again. Bringing in four members, five coming soon. Goharu with the place to do have more to get away. Toru bursts him down. Sends Goharu back to base. Oh. Oliviato! Force the pot proc the passive just to get away. That eternal garden is starting to hurt. Uneven, a little bit of trouble here though. Getting shred down. T able to pick up the kill. DA with the advantage, taking out two members from Fiends. Lord marching down. It's gonna be an extremely hard clear for the side of Fiends. Fury something. Kohari is able to shut down the war, but he's pulled in with the Unoffended. No one's Fury does lock on. Ooh. Blazing Duet just to get away. Go to Soy back to the base as well. But Uneven locks on to Kush here. Mikasa also pretty low. Chirobani looking for some sort of pickoff. Kush finally goes down, but still has the immortality. Go to Soy looking for an angle as well. Gonna come in, but locked up. And down they go. But Mikasa saving the day time and time again in these team fights. A lot of damage onto Yato. Comes in, able to pop back onto Kohari. But DA not done just yet. Kohari back onto the base. And DA has locked down. They're going to take us to a game number three. That bot is just splitting the whole entire strategy of Legacy of Hearts, getting this neutral objective without any problem. Holy Baptism locks on. Terrified. Boom. Knocked out. Koyaken hit by the Hayaken. But Yanas might just be next. Riles gonna take a lot of damage. Bloodthirsty Kings on the prowl. Oh. Here it comes in, gets a knock up on three members, but no one there to follow up. And oh, the members are all onto the top side. Is BTK gonna clash with the oh. advantage that they have? Tono's oh. welcome. Not able to land on it. Buddy. But it doesn't matter because the rest of the team is here oh. to help out Ken. Taking a lot of damage. Swansong comes in though. Able to unload on several members. Nicolette goes down. Koya Nash with a shutdown. And double. Will it be enough though? Because BTK is still riding forward. As Nash falls, it's three for two. Just when Legacy had a shot, they lose it. A lot of these objectives and small fights. I mean, it's definitely a tough game for Bloodhounds. Already a 4,000k. This is the exact, oh wait a second, nice suppression, nice grab, they're able to get the kill on a Sayori, no black shoes for her. Oh my foe takes a turtle, gets to the tone as welcome, lands it down, ooga boo. Damage, tries to dash away, but Nakoko is on the trail, the last of Sandy gets the kill. Oh my. And now a clash in the midside, Violent Requiem locks on, oh my foe, but he still stands tall, finally falls, but takes Ramsey with him. It's a bloodbath right now, Tempest falls next, sleeps as well, nothing but Boko Rosco left. And also, Fo was able to peel off the quad on the Blazing Duet, and that's going to be quite tough for any of them to come back. Explosion does land. It Members back balled in. But wait a second, no one's oh, no. to counter back. Members are knocked up, and Chaos has unveiled the crystal. 
Two members down for Bloodhounds, one down for Night Horde. They find another. Boca Roscoe's next, and Templis is alone. The Night Horde should take this game two to zero. I mean, that's definitely been the winning ingredients for GG in these fights so far. Tarzan was the first turtle. He gets knocked up, found out. Now, best player, even though he's had a slightly rough game. Still been huge. Resi takes an eternal guardian to the face, locked up by Chicken, knocked up by a best player, and Hoon gets the kill. Looking a little bit rough. Mark Judy's gonna be the next to fall. Tarzan not able to get away. The Ammo Fender locks on. His mod's force dropped by Iso. He's moving in on a several. He's not able to get the kill. He might just go down to Tarzan. Finds best player. It's one for two. Getting how they want to fight out in these fights, and the best player getting caught again, but decides to jump away. It's a good it's a drop from ISO. He's gonna use it to zone. Oh, yeah. They try to collapse up. The enclosure connects only on one member though. The pushback on a several. The big guardian slams down. Shark taken out from ISO though. Best player might just be next. A double kill for ISO. The final slash. Fly chicken trying to fight it out. It's a bloodbath. The monster force drops and who drops. We are back, guys, for another bear. We have Legacy versus Fiends. What do you guys think? Well, it's definitely going to be an exciting match. I mean, I feel like these matches are getting better and better the longer we go in today's uh, matches and series. I mean, the last one went all the way to Game 3. I didn't think we expected it to be as jam-packed as it was. And, hey, now we got to expect the unexpected between these two amazing teams. Yeah, and you know, the dark horses are definitely coming into power. Lots of upsets already in the first week. And now, <laughs> starting off the second week, another upset coming through between Night Hordes and Devious. But the focus is going to be between the Fiends and the Legacy. Legacy trying to get out of their last place position with zero points. And Fiends trying to maintain their third place, right? This is a team that has done so extremely well against a lot of the top teams. And this time around, they're facing up against Legacy, which is also a dark horse, a new team in NACT. So I'm excited, Liz. Well, for sure, we're, we're, we're all very excited, especially having Assassin Riles back in the scene. People have expected them to perform better than they, than they are doing now. But this game obviously is very critical for them to get some momentum back and to kind of prove that they're still in the scene. But Fiends, as we mentioned last week, they are a dark, dark horse this season. They've, they've um, taken out a, a game from the Devious Activity last week and it all shows that after this week's game that a lot of these teams are pretty similar in where they stand. Like yeah. Nighthorde just took out Divas Activity and now we have the draft for Fiend. So we have Churubami, Approach Joy, Uneven, and Magic, and Kohari. Yeah, a lot of heavy hitters over there for the side of Fiends. Gonna have to watch out for them. Like we said, they are the new up and coming players, new faces on the scene. First time ever making it into the top eight for NACT on top of that. And they've already taken down some uh, veteran teams such as uh, Bloodhounds on their debut in the regular season, a 2-0 sweep, and took a game from Devious Activity, which is again stacked with players from BTK, players from Ackerman. Uh, and so it definitely showcases their talent and what they're capable of pulling off inside of these matches. Now, they are going to be going up against Legacy. So this is going to be a, a battle of the new faces, I guess, if you kind of think about it, because both of these teams have some new players that we haven't seen in the top eight position. I mean, here's Legacy right there. You've got Jolie, Kuya Ken, Kuya Nash, Riles himself, and PDR. They haven't had the easiest start, though. I mean, they lost every single game so far in the regular season, kind of similar to uh, Bloodhound's run. And they need this victory to climb up that ladder. Yeah. And, you know, for me, Legacy is a team of veterans, right? These are the names that we've heard before time after time, PDR, you know, a huge veteran there, also Assassin Riles. Jolie has been in NACT before, but on the other hand, the kind of like the young players of, you know, Mobile Legends were able to have Team Fiends compete in 
NACT and they have shown such a strong performance. Now, Legacy, definitely, if they're going to try and, you know, push for victory, I do think this is going to be their game. They're definitely going to come out with a bang here. And I'm expecting Fiends to try and defend against the aggression that comes out from the side of Legacy. Yeah, because without Fiends, who else is next up? I mean, Bloodhounds. Maybe Bloodhounds and Legacy is going to be a game that we look out for in the following weeks. But for now, they need to prove themselves against Fiends. And I just noticed with their um, roster photos, it's pretty it's pretty interesting. Legacy is all very serious. Everybody's standing <laughs> in one piece. And then we have Fiends, someone doing this uneven. It's pretty... <laughs> <laughs> it shows that um, they are definitely very cool. So let's see what our predictions are for our, our casters. What did you, what did you guys <laughs> pick? Well, I'll tell you what. I think that uh, Fiends should be able to take this over Legacy. Just because Legacy, they barely slid by getting into the top eight. Like It was like uh, the luck of the draw on a team losing in order for them to Ooh. claim that position. And as you are going to go ahead and see a full cast of prediction for the side of Team Fiends, full panel, even UA. You sure you don't want to switch? You still got a little bit of time. You want to take, you want to take hey, the game? Man. The Fiends, you know, has been part of, you know, a little bit of my legacy that I've left for the professional scene in North America. I know I have retired as a former pro, but Fiends have definitely been a group of players that um, I've been able to kind of watch over from time to time. So Fiends all the way for me. Yeah, for me too, um, Fiends in week one just stunned everyone, has stunned the whole crowd. They've made an entrance for themselves in week one as a black horse. I've read in some comments that some of the players have been on protein four but they might have just changed their names but we don't know exactly who's who so after if they really do well in this whole series we might know more about these individual players but a lot of potential we can tell that they're all very young players so let's go straight into the draft to see how this game goes that's right and into the draft we go no more delaying legacy up against fiends everybody voting for the new faces fiends on the pro mm -hmm. scene but have some familiar names uh, alongside the side of legacy as well just from their gameplay in the regular season fiends they're off to a good start the 2-0 sweeped up against uh, bloodhounds in their debut for day one they didn't get the same story though on day two as devious activity was able to close it out two to one but they still gained a point there and that's the importance of this earning a point will set you apart against other teams even if you don't win the series but today the draft is in store and we are looking at legacy taking out the mathilda on the opposite side of the table though fiends with the ruby yeah and you know kind of bouncing back of what liz was saying fiends is a team that has a few professional players from the last nact for those of you guys that don't know there was a team called uh Ag aggravated once uneven was recruited onto that magic was also a player onto that that you know has played a kind of a multi-role position so definitely there is some experience in terms of the leadership from the side of fiends but kohari and pro destroyer are definitely two players on the side of fiends that you know haven't had the exposure and this time around they have been dominating this scene right pro destroy has picked up the fanny and this is something that's traditionally not really consistent and he was able to dominate in the performance there now he did lose to a77 um or he did lose to devious activity with the fanny last week but he was also able to get victories with the fanny with plenty of different themes and kohari the brave right the one the ones that me and trex were calling here you know this man has come from the dark like no one knew who he was and then suddenly now he's one of the you know the top contenders for the gold lane and he's making these miraculous plays pushing fiends onto the next board but on the other hand though legacy once again lots of experience on the board lots of familiar faces we've always wondered if riles is ever going to come back into the nact and this time he has been here he's trying to prove his worth and definitely this is going to be a great game yeah kahari the brave you mentioned him he's been great in the gold lane we've seen him run the carry we've seen him run the claude and being able to perform on both of them we actually haven't seen him run any other marksman besides those two the entire regular season which may be something that uh the side of legacy needs to look out for looking at the band so far arlot being taken off the table alongside the ruby vexana 
is an option to be picked up over there from the side of Legacy if they want it. I think it would be a strong pickup. You know what else is out there? Hey, I'm just throwing it out. The TIG reel. It all day. The TIG <laughs> is still available. Yeah, but you know, this draft, I feel like is very dominated in the Rome position, you know, compared to the drafts that we had before, right? Angela, Matilda, and you have the Ruby and the Arlot being banned out from both sides. So four Romers that have already been taken off the board, the Minotaur, which has been left open in this draft, banned out pretty much in every single previous game, should be prioritized here. And once again, the Tigreal that has been proven to almost go undefeated today, only has one loss here, is also available for both teams. Now, the Navaria does get banned out here. We've seen the Navaria do quite well. Vexana, right? Is that That's kind of the question that we always ask as the casters, like, are they gonna be able to first pick it here? Is there counters to it? Is that a safe pick? I do think Legacy potentially might look to pick that up or they could go for the carry that Kohari has been so good on. Yeah, I think the Vexana would be a strong option and it will be prioed over there from the side of Legacy, opening up some picks for Fiends. You mentioned Kohari being a menace inside the gold lane, could pick up something that he's comfortable on. And we talked about the carry, we talked about the Claude, and this is his chance to lock in either one of those early in the draft. But speaking about locking things in, I like what they did here, right? They picked up the CC, a high value target that I feel like a lot of teams overlook. Very hard to keep up with inside of the XP lane, great on mobility, provides the damage and hard to keep her at bay. And we'll give them a little bit of a challenge in the XP lane if they're not careful. I think their other pickup should be something that uh, makes Kohari comfortable. There it is, the carry that we mentioned. Uh, they're going to slot that into his hands nice and early, not to allow Legacy uh, to make him uncomfortable on his pickups. Again, I feel like a well-rounded draft, especially early on in the first two picks, is quite important. And I'm always against two heavy front lines when you pick the XP roam or you pick the XP and utility jungles, you're showing too much of your cards. But this time around, Fiends goes with a range and a front line, which I think is a well-balanced, right? Another option they could have picked up would be a mage, but Kohari gets the first pick on the uh, on the carry. The response of Legacy goes for Exborg and Claude. This is a very familiar matchup coming in from both sides here. Chiro Bambi, though, picks up the Valentina and with the last insanity that is available along with the Vexana all he really has a lot of options to choose from yeah the Valentina definitely could be a good option not to mention there's still two picks on the table for Legacy which is going to have them questioning who they want to slot in there now when we're looking at Legacy we've seen them kind of do a lot of things right we've seen Riles pull out something like the Hayabusa and the qualifiers he hasn't pulled it out in the regular season uh, but he went in more of those uh, utility frontline uh, junglers instead. Something like a Boxia, something like an Akai. has been something that's been more of his uh, style, but they haven't been able to execute on it. They haven't claimed a single win yet. Uh, and, I mean, they did go up against BTK. They lost 2-0 to them uh, on Sunday of last week. And also, their debut was up against Devious Activity, which ended in a 2-0 sweep as well. So, this is their chance to rise up that ladder and let the world know they have what it takes to go up against the top eight teams in North America. But Fiends still off to a great start. I like the way both teams are drafting, though, the export. It's good because it can be flexed into the jungle, but also ran as the XP laner if necessary, which gives some versatility to the drafting for Legacy. You know what I kind of want to see? I want to see the Hayabusa being picked by Riles here. <laughs> they, you know, Legacy hasn't had the... The momentum that they've been looking for in NACT so far, especially in the round robin stage. And I think, you know, pulling up one of your best picks, you might change and define the meta. You might force the opponents to, you know, make adjustments to deal with the high burst and the high mobility of the Hayabusa. Now, Fiends, also a very assassin dominated uh, jungler, Pro Destroy, has the Joy available, which has not been taken off the board. That is an option. Also, the Fanny, right, that we seen devious almost got victorious in the last game although the early game was quite tough to deal with especially going up against the ruby but a lot of the cc has been banned out tig kufra ruby arlot everything has been taken off the board in terms of that frontline stun it sets up for a great assassin pick for both of these teams to go on 
Now, I mean, they could still pick up the box here for Fiends if they want to. It's very mobile, great on the front line as well. Um, they'll, they will be lacking a little bit on group CC, so I'm not really sure. I'd maybe pick up something like a, a, Fre a Fredrin, maybe an option. The Barats has been taken off the table, so that will be one jungler that they won't, won't be able to use at their disposal. I am with you, though. I mean, it would be fun to see Riles <laughs> for Legacy pull out that Hayabusa. I mean, he did get a little bit of a buff, but it just hasn't seen any team kind of use him, as he hasn't really been favored in a meta currently. But with this composition, I mean, he may be able to work. I mean, you can rush into the carry, not as mobile. Can catch her off guard in the side lane for some early pickoffs, especially with the marksman's being a little bit more squishier uh, this time around with the recent patches. I am liking what I'm seeing though from both sides. Late game damage guaranteed. You have the carry up against the Clod. Staple marksman's that we've seen time and time again slotted in the land of Dawn against each other. The Vexon and Valentina. Staple mages that we've seen slotted against each other. There goes the Fredrin that we talked about. It does get picked up from the side of Fiends to provide not only some strong front line for these neutral objectives, but also some additional CC at his disposal. Now, with the Fredrin being picked up, I do think Riles holding on to this export could potentially be a good matchup, right? They could pair it up with kind of like a Raphael with some sustain or the Estus. They could go for some frontline sets, maybe with the Grok to immune some of the crowd control that the Fredrin has. But there's still a lot of options for Legacy to kind of play around with since now they have two picks available on the board. Lots of roams has been banned out. So and, and especially the frontline sets, right? If they're looking for a suppression, the Franco is still available, but I do think there is a lot more options when you come down to maybe some of the fighter roams or potentially even the sustain roams. <laughs> Flipping the script, gonna go ahead and pick up that Khalid alongside <laughs> that Grok that you mentioned. Good call out on that. We'll be able to negate a lot of the CC as long as he can hug that wall. He should be good to go. The Khalid though, has some anti-CC at his disposal has the quicksand to be able to regenerate himself when it comes to these fights. Does have to watch out for the knockup though. The only knockup is gonna be over there for that Fredrin um, that he is gonna have to watch out for. CC, it'll be interesting seeing these two kind of fight it out since this is gonna be a clean next yes! lane, but hold on. I thought we were done with the wild card picks. Last pickup for the side of Fiends. Estes in the building. Let's go. I, you know, I'm a fan of the Estes, right? I, I gotta give it to you. Blacklist, you know, has been one of the teams that I've been watching out for for a very long time. And I love the Estes pick, especially when there's so many roams being banned out. Now, when we talk about the roam matchup, right? Estes, traditionally, it's very hard to deal with, especially in, you know, the lower ranks at like Epic and Legend. But Estes now in the high tier, it's quite tough. It's not guaranteed win. And it's not always that the Estes prevails. But against a comp like Legacy, they don't have hard CC. Right? They have the knockup coming out from Grok. They have the Sandstorm coming from the Khalid. But those are spells that are quite high cooldowns and not guaranteed to land. So with the Purify, right, the side of Fiends, they might have enough sustain to kind of mow through. But again, right, this time around, they don't have the stun to set up for the carry. And that has been a problem throughout the whole entire day. Who is going to set for the carry to be able him to deal tons of damage? And if Fiends don't have the sets available, they might struggle in this matchup. And speaking of matchups, as we are now jumping in to the first match between both these amazing teams, our third series of the day, Fiends up against Legacy Fiends. New faces on the scene, but ready to take the fight and take down top eight contenders. Legacy barely sliding by into the top eight, but ready to earn their name. Yeah, the fiends are the little bats in this game trying to feast onto the opponents this time around. And Legacy, the golden triangles are trying to come through and prevail in this match, trying to get their very first points on the board. And you can tell, hey, that is the new Estus All-Star skin. Quite beautiful. I know they have like a band going on, so definitely appreciate that skin there. Yeah, gotta love the skin showcasing out here in the land of Dawn today. Not disappointing, but the Estus is an interesting pick. You credited Blacklist. We'll see if they can kind of pull off that uh, Ube strat to work in their favor. Now, when you're looking at the compositions, in terms of crowd control for Legacy, there really isn't that much. I mean, I guess you have the Vexana and you have uh, Kuyakin with the Wild Charge. Maybe a little bit of that utility provided by Riles with the Ice Queen one, if he picks that up over there for the X board. But outside of that, there's just not really too many heavy sets outside of Kuya Kin who they're gonna have to rely on. But when you're looking at Fiends, 
You have the Fedrin with the energy eruption. You also have, uh, well, I guess it's kind of the same because Churubambi, I mean, he could take the wild charge. So I, I feel like it's kind of a stillmate. You're not really going to see the biggest sets from either side, but you're going to see a lot of jam-packed action. I do think the IMU from the Valentina to pick up the Grok ult might be very impactful, or even the last insanity, the top side. Ooh, Riles taking some damage. Pro Destroy making the most out of the CC. Hit with the Energy Eruption and using the Appraiser's Wrath onto Riles, forcing him back over there to his side of the jungle to get that Faraga armor and continue his farm. With that separation, though, Fiends takes control of the Turtle Pit. Yeah, and, you know, Fiends, without the Raga armor, of course, the Exporg is going to have a much harder time to deal with a lot of these objectives, especially when they're going up against such a utility-focused jungle like the Fredra. Now, the Retribution has been used. Fiends should look to disengage going back into their farm. Now, kind of want to take a look at some of the spells that are on the board. Quantum Charge on Estes is quite unique. I've ran it a few times. Definitely something interesting that Fiends have decided to pick up. There's also a common emblem and a Festival Blood on Kohari, which I don't know if traditionally carries do use that common emblem, but definitely a lot more utility on the side of Fiends here to have some mobility and also some sustains in their lane. We've been seeing a couple of carries pick that up to be a little bit more sustainable and get that region as they uh, mm. use their skills, especially with carry not being as mobile. The survivability is what they're playing for. Kohari, though, getting a survivability. Knocked Airborne with the wild charge with some assistance from Fiends. The counterplay, the four-man rotation. Riles need to get out of there. Hit with the energy eruption and pro-destroy. Drawing first blood to shut him down. Yeah, this is going to be smell like a lot of trouble because honestly, for the side of Estus, typically the power scale of that hero is going to be towards that mid game. So the eight minute mark, if they do decide to go 0-0 for the side of Fiends, they should have some advantage. The boss side looking to clear. I don't think they're going to get Kohari, but no punish and a flicker being popped out from the side of Legacy. Yeah, needed to get that separation. Definitely didn't want to allow them another kill for the side of Fiends because we know how quickly these small victories can lead into a major one if you're not careful in the early game. 600 gold lead for the side of Fiends and a massive damage. A wild charge. Power of nature winding up. Magic. Very low, but Pro Destroy and Churubambi to help protect him to terrify on the Kuyakin. Pro Destroy picking up his second kill in the last four minutes. I'm surprised Kuyakin did not swing there Ooh. because, you know, there was potential for him to be able to do so. Now on the top side here, Ooh, uneven. We'll find PDR. Uses that Vengeance last second, though. The Quicksand not able to keep him alive on this Khalid pickup up against the CC for the XP lane. Yeah, 3-0 to zero is going to be the overall scoreboard. Fiends already up 1k gold lead. They have the they have the gold lead they have the kills on the board looking for the next objective here but the ultimates are available the raga armor also has not been down for the side of riles yeah and right now fiends in a position to take another turtle in their favor riles trying to get in there for raga armor knocked down very low uneven with the fire missiles able to sustain himself on the cc to terrify magic takes down kukin a wild charge knock a pro destroy will claim the turtle for fiends and some additional bodies. So you're going to see an even takedown PDR. Riles, Kuya, Nash. In a bad oh. situation. And they close the distance. Churro Bami with the double kill to shut him down. Kuya will spawn back getting a kill of his own though. Finds magic. And on the bot side, Jolie versus Kohari on the 1v1 trade. Kohari may be able to claim this turret. Yeah, Fiends are winning pretty much across the board at this point. They're, they got the last two turtles. They have a 3k gold lead, kills 7 to 1, and they even got the bot side advantage on a 1 versus 1 lane. It smells a lot of trouble for the side of Legacy. And when you take a look at some of the team fights and the sustain, the Estus has been key to all of this. 1, 1, and 5 is his overall scoreboard. And he's able to sustain and pretty much heal up all the members of Fiends, even when they're in bad positions, right? Magic was able to heal up. Just like this fight right here, he took some tower damage. He did get bursted, but that's a double kill for the carries to the side of Fiends. I'm pretty sure he used the wild charge knock up from Kuyakin to get that with that IMU. A great play over there from Churubami on this Valentino, who we both agreed was a, a strong pickup to use against Legacy. They even picked the Grok after the Valentino was picked up. And it's definitely showcasing that it may have been a mistake. Fiends. Off to a good position, but a counterplay from Legacy. PDR, Sandstorm is going to find Magic. Down goes Estes, last Sandy going out from Riles. Kurobami, very low, needs to get out of there. Praise Raph and Protostar will find Kuya Ken. 
Gilly's reactivated. Kuya Nash very low. The Terrify connecting uneven. It's MPDR. Kuya will take down Pro Destroy. A two for two trade in the mid lane. Two for two. Lots of utility used being both sides, but the side of Legacy finally been able to get some kills on the board. And look at the boss side. Kohari the Brave pushing Jolie <laughs> by himself and taking a lot of the tower out of the place. 4K gold lead, six minutes in fiends on a good one in this series. He just picked up that Demon Hunter sword too. You can definitely tell Kohari is comfortable, but he uh -oh. needs to be careful as you are looking at Ryles trying to punish, doing some damage, taking him down to half HP. I gotta see what he has built. I mean, he's able to sustain himself pretty well, even with the side of Legacy trying to take him down. Okay, so he does have a little bit of armor. He has a Corrosion side too, and he has the Tough Boots to negate the slow over there from Riles if he decides to go in for a nice clean one. Yeah, but the carry is just kind of fed at this point, right? He's nine. He's level nine already. He has 1k above the enemy Claude. But Fiend's looking to deny the blue buff. Yeah, uneven. Need to get out of there. Does not have the numbers, but living up to the name doesn't really care. PDR trying to burst him down. Being a little bit of that menace, that threat. Forcing uh, Legacy back in their jungle. As you are going to see Kohari the Brave again. No problem. Able to take the tier two turn on the bot side. And it's quite interesting from the side of Fiends that they're allowing Kohari to get this free lane, right? And might not even be Fiends, it might just be Legacy. The rotations are just not there. And Pro able to pick up the Khalid near the mid side bush. This is going to be bad because it's a four versus five, and the Lord is going to be available for the side of Fiends to take. And this is where the export starts to have trouble, right? When you don't take advantage of the early game, he has a hard time catching back up in the jungle. Honestly, sometimes mm. I prefer him being slotted in the XP lane over the jungle just because of that factor. When you're looking at Fiends, they have the uh, Fredrin, which means he can be a bully. He can rush into Fredrin's buff alongside Chirobami on this uh, Valentino with that Terrify. You know what else we got to kind of put into play? Oi. They have the Estus for the hills, Magical Hari. Hit over there by the Blazing Duet from Joe Lee, but not going to phase him. Able to keep him alive through all of that damage. Riles with the last of Sanity, though, trying to deal some massive damage. Big explosion. PDR will find Magic. Finds one member for Fiends. Maybe able to get another. Sandstorm going in, but Kohari the Brave will find PDR in the aggressive play. Uneven. Finds Kuya Nash dealing a little bit of chip damage. And you are looking at Fiends. Looking on taking more of the jungle from Legacy. Yeah, but a small hope coming in from Legacy. Able to pick off a few members from the side of Fiend. So I think that's actually quite good, right? They're looking to engage and they're still looking to go aggressive. They have not lost their confidence and they're still trying to get a few of these good team fights here and there. But unfortunately, the Fiend's response was just a little bit too good. The S is heal. And now even on the top side, Kohari able to take care of business by himself without any help, right? This is why we call him the Brave because he pretty much can just do everything by himself. Yeah, right now looking like a little bit of a one-sided story, similar to uh, majority of the games for Legacy. As you are looking at Fiends, not taking any damage to any of the turrets on the map so far, up by eight kills, and now leading by 8,000 gold. Yeah, it's a lot of trouble if you're side of Legacy, right? This is a team that you really want to be able to compete and stand against. But the side of Legacy just have not found the rhythm in this NACT. 12 to 4 is the overall scoreboard. 10 minutes in, and the gold lead is quite immense for the side of Fiends here. And, you know, for the side of Legacy, they have a few problems right the purify from the estus is just a little bit too much you can see if they're able to burst out the estus ultimate or force him to use that ultimate before the team fight happens they have a chance to kind of deal with the sustain that fiends have but if the estus is able to hold on to that ultimate hold on to that purify the khalid or the grok is unable to get that gap closed or shut down the estus it's gonna smell a lot of trouble because we're going to this mid game and with estus not you know, being shut down here, Fiends are just gonna walk through and Ube strat and mow down the members of Legacy. That's right, the Blessing of the Moon God is only getting stronger the longer this match goes over there for Magic, pulling a lot of tricks out of his hat in the early game. Now, for the side of Legacy, if they wanna kinda have a chance to turn this around, I mean, it's really gonna boil down to Jolie getting the late game items necessary, but when you're looking at Kohara, he's already ahead of them by 3,000 gold. He has the Demon Hunter Sword, he has the Golden Staff, he has the Corrosion Scythe. When you're looking at Jolie, he's, he's slowly getting there. I think he only has like a, a Golden Staff or maybe a Corrosion Scythe on his side compared to him. 
you're looking at uh, Riles having a very hard time finding his proper footing on this Exborg in the jungle. Like you said, Exborg, once he's down, it's very hard to catch back up. And just look at Kohari the Brave. The massive damage is Pity Light Rolls finds one, takes out PDR. Kuya Kin! Next on the top of our Churro oh, will no. find one. Kohari takes out Kuya Kin. Riles by himself as Churro gets a double, finds Jolie. Last Sandy, a last resort. But Brock down and burst it out. Churro gets the triple kill, a full wipeout against Legacy. Yeah, and Fiend's definitely having a strong performance there. Definitely the reason why they were able to take a game off of Devious and able to upset multiple opponents already in this tournament. A very, very strong performance by the side of Fiends as they take the Lord, looking to go for even more real estate onto the mid side. And I think they're definitely going to be able to get so before the Lord even marches it down on the opposite lane where, you know, the side of Legacy, that's their only tower left. So definitely a good uh, team fight coming out. Yeah, Fiend's looking to close this out on even Fakuya Kim, PDR find Kohari, Chirobami taking down PDR to respond, a two for one trade. Numbers in Fiend's favor, last insanity from Riles. Trying to get to the back line, finds Magic, Chirobami oh. take down Jolie, gets a double, a triple, takes down Fiend Kid, Riles by himself, another wipeout of Maniac from Churro to close out the game as Fiend's shuts down Legacy and pushes through their base crystal. A dominating performance by the little bat kids out there. 22 to 5 is the overall scoreboard. 13 minute match. The Fiends able to get the victory in this very first game. And Fiends has been such a strong team, especially when it comes down to the openings of matches to pick these unconventional picks. And this time around, they're able to take the game with, you know, the carry that Kohari just dominated in his lane. And also Pro Destroy able to pick up the Fredrin blocks the Oraga armor I, you know it's very convincing in this series so far that Fiends is definitely the better team but Legacy they still have a sliver of hope they're able to get a few team fights here and there it's not you know the performance that they are looking for but they still have a lot of time to try and get back in this series yeah they need to figure out some answers fast though as fiends they're not playing around and they're not trying to give them any breathing room i mean they were able to take majority of the neutral objectives didn't really have any penalty with anything in that entire game i mean even kohari there's multiple times when he's running on this uh carry he has a flicker but he's not as mobile as other marksmen's and he's able to just pretty much push through a tier two turret with little to no contest this is the fastest game that Fiends has had the entire regular season. The last one was like a 14 minute game up against uh, Bloodhounds, 14 minutes, three seconds. But now cutting that time down to 12 minutes and 49 seconds up against Legacy, it just shows that they're improving. You gotta see Legacy find some answers for game number two. Yeah, and typically when you come down to the match, if it's a 13 minute match, the first Lord marching down and the game closes, I would definitely say the draft has a little bit of problem. And if you take a look at some of the statistics, right? The Grok, the impact just was not there. The Claude just did not get, you know, the lane that he really wanted to do. Maybe pick up the Harith or the Brody to give a little bit of an early game edge for the side of Legacy and also the Exborg, right? The impact just was not there. You could take a look at some of the uh, status. Rich Guy goes into Kohari's hands. Churro Bambi picking up the carry. Kuya Ken picks up the sandbag and the forgotten one, the Estes player. Magic picks up 17 assists there. Yeah, definitely not the same pace we've been seeing today in the, the series, at least for the first two series. Legacy, a little behind the power scale up against Fiends. I mean, they barely made it into the top eight. And, they, you know, you're definitely seeing a little bit of a gap when it comes to these objectives and these early rotations. I hope they can step up to that mantle for game number two. There was a lot of interesting things that did happen in this match, though. We got to see the Estus slotted in. We didn't even get to see the Estus get to the late game heals because how fast that match ended. It was just a ticking time bomb. We talked about Kohari the Brave. He's known to run that Claude or that carry. Those are the two marksmen that he runs. Maybe taking him off one of those two in game number two could be a start for them to turn that around. But it's definitely going to be the early game that they have to focus in on. They cannot allow these lore, these turtles to go and their turrets to fall with no contest. Yeah, and, and, I, and I honestly feel like it's due to some of their drafts 
right? The early game rotations coming down, the Estus was able to kind of pick off members even early game. And traditionally, Estus isn't that type of an aggressiveness to have a dominating, you know, pre eight, pre level eight performance. But once you hit that level eight, once you go into that mid game, 10 minutes in, that's when Estus really shines. That's when teams start to group up. But the strategy that the side of Fiends kind of implemented was so aggressive, so brute force that like they were able to just get the victory from any of these team fights and you know the slow pickoffs from one on one you know the top side engagements while letting the kohari just deal with the cloud by himself which he did an excellent job every single time he had to face anyone it could be the khalid that comes up it could be the cloud and he was just winning in those performance so definitely fiends had the ability to just dominate in this game and honestly i think it's due to the draft yeah, I mean, the new kids on the block. Let's take a look at a couple of their uh, highlights from the last match as they were able to kind of dominate with a one-sided fashion. Kahari the Brave here, he was able to take down PDR. He got another two. Did you all saw who you can't try to burst him down. He's ended up with a full wipeout up against the side of a legacy. But Riles, the last insanity, his last resort trying to escape, but led to a full wipeout. And then a couple seconds later, not even a full minute later, another wipeout happened to be able to close out that game as you've seen them push through open up the base with the lord on the bot side not even really needed with how much of an advantage they had in the early phase to close out the series yeah and when you take a look at the Estus heal, it's just a little bit too overwhelming for the side of Legacy to kind of deal with that, right? They were able to take out Kohari, but unfortunately, the team fight still went into the favor for the side of Fiends. The Estus heal was just too much to deal with. And once again, you go a Grok, something that doesn't have too much CC. You go a Khalid, right? You can't hold members down there. And you end up just getting out healed. And again, when you're playing the Estus, it's more about reactive. It's more about the enemy team kind of throwing themselves at you and they miscalculate the damage and this time around definitely feels like legacy miscalculated their damage they don't have enough frontline set they cannot pin down the estus where it forces the purify early it forces the the the, the blessing of the moon goddess early enough where legacy can prevail in any of these team fights and it's honestly just due to the tankiness of fiends the early game rotations they're able to get a few pickoffs here and there and also the ability of kohari just baiting out so many spells and not dying so quickly like fiends just played a great game <laughs> he's just gonna keep earning titles kohari the brave kohari the strong what, what, what else is he gonna be by the end of this series but the way he's performing the unkillable the immortal as we are now jumping into the second game of the day for our third series fiends up against legacy match point for fiends if they can shut down legacy it will be a sweep legacy yet to find a single victory this entire regular season they need answers and they need them fast now you mentioned the estus able to kind of pick up the heels later that game goes definitely would have been a threat i think that what fiends has is a strong trio core synergy right their roamer their mage and their jungler they play pretty tight together whereas when we look at legacy riles he's playing on the export he's trying to get his purple buff he's getting invaded uh and there's not really any answer to stop them when they have a bully like the Fredrin over there so maybe starting on tightening up their trio core synergy can help them out for game number two well, definitely drafting a little bit better, I think, could have been an option, right? They didn't have to ban out every single one of those tanks, especially in the second phase, because honestly, they had the first pick available. They could have picked up one of those strong tanks, like the Minotaur or the Tigreal for themselves, or even picking up the Kaja that they opted to ban out. It could have been, you know, a day and night difference to have a suppression, to deal with the Blessing of the Moon Goddess, to force that ultimate out early. But they chose for a Grok, and the knockup just is not enough to, you know, stun the whole entire team to force the, it can force a Purify, but the second that the Purify gets forced, uh, the, the, the Blessing of the Moon Goddess comes through, the whole team is back up to full HP. The Raga armor is out, there's no Grok ultimate, and they're just getting run down. So this time around, I do think if Legacy is able to draft up a little bit better of a response, get the counterplay coming through, it might be much better. And, you know, the bands are on the table. Not really too much focus on the roam. So maybe we're going to see a Tigreal come through by the side of <laughs> Legacy because I do think that might be the option here. You know what else is out there? Barats hasn't been banned mm. on the table so far could be a viable pickup stack that up with something like an angela uh and i mean we've even seen the barats be pulled out with the tig and then slot the barats in the xp lane <laughs> i mean <laughs> it works and it, it worked out really well 
And I wonder if that's something that Fiends will implement after seeing uh, the beginning series of today. Now, nonetheless, there's some viable options for the side of Fiends. Uh, the Vexana did get taken off the table alongside that Navaria, though. So your staple mages are not going to be available for pickup. Ruby, Claude comes into mind. The Barats that you kind of talked about is also good. The side of Fiends, they have a very great Fredra. Now, in North America, everyone loves Barats. I do not think Barats is that great where every team needs to be first picking it right i do think there's is quite a few options ruby which can be flexed into the xp or in the room can be a good option right the x borg also can be a flex pick kohari decides to pick up this ruby now what's interesting that i have to say is ruby gold lane has been used in mpl so this can be a trio flexed but more than likely, Kohari, once like Wheezy was talking about, the carry, the claw that he's been so good at gets denied <laughs> this time around. And I think that's a safe option for the side of Legacy to pick up. I don't even think he's worried about it, though, because he's still going to pick up that Claude since it's on the table, right? If it's not carry, it's Claude. And that should be a strong pickup from them. But for Legacy, they're in a position now where they could pick up a strong jungler. You can get something outside of that x -Borg, maybe a Fredrin maybe a barat honestly i think the barats would be okay here because you can kind of no oh, but they're gonna go in for the fredrin instead they're gonna allow the barats to walk i don't know if i really necessarily agree with it but i think fredrin is a safe option he does have to worry about cc though you already have the ruby for fiends and that's just the beginning of their draft they can stack a heavy cc composition they can even go for a valentina here if they go for well, the valentina for the terrify it would be even more of a threat to the fredrin as he tries to be that bully in the neutral objectives and inside of his jungle it, the the, the Fredrin definitely provides a little bit of a lockdown CC for the carry to be able to handle, right? And it also does provide a little bit of sustain with the ultimate coming Ooh. through. But the response coming through is quite tough. The Barats paired up with an, uh, a Raphael. The movement speed is quite immense, but there's also the stun factor that does come through with the Raphael. And that could be something that Legacy has to worry about. The x work pickup, I think, is quite great here, though. It does deny a little bit of the frontline presence that Barats has. It forces the Raphael to kind of go into more of a defensive mechanism, but Raphael's heal does negate and purify a lot of the slowness coming out from x -Borg, so it may not work out as well as Legacy is thinking for. I like the x -Borg alongside with you. I mean, it has the true damage. It's good against the Barats, and I, I tend to favor it a little bit more inside of the XP lane than I do in the jungler position. Now, with that x -Borg, he's going to be able to provide utility in terms of CC. You throw that Ice Queen wand on him, he has the Faraga army, he's able to stay alive in majority of these engagements, but the thing he's going to lack is hardcore CC, right? You have the Fredrin, he has the energy eruption, but he's the jungler, so he's going to be initiating a lot of these fights. Maybe the Exborg will with the Last Insanity, maybe with the Fire Missiles, but I feel like they need something a little bit more to solidify their crowd control, because I just don't feel like mm. the Exborg and the Fredrin alone is enough to keep Fiends at bay, especially with a Ruby with that chain CC and then keeping them alive with the Raphael is going to be a problem. There's a little bit more CC at their disposal, though. Some good damage as well. We've seen the Nana showcase earlier in some of the series today. Making another appearance now. We'll have uh, that passive to be able to use that Molina's Gift when things get a little tricky to work in her favor. But I, I feel like uh, with the Nana on the table, I mean, there, I guess some of the staple mages are gone, so it's not the worst option. Well, the best case scenario for you has been presented for the side of Legacy, right? The Claude gets banned out, the carry gets denied. So the Fiends have to look for another option onto the gold lane if they want to kind of continue this momentum. Some of the things that can be viable, right? They go for the Brody to deal with the early game that the carry has could be a very great option since the Fredrin and the x -Borg both need a lot of time to scale. Right? And Ooh. another option could be the Herod, which has done well, but no, it is going to be the Soccer <laughs> Man and the Surfer coming through. The Gord gets picked up. I do believe it's the first time in our NACT round robin where we have seen the Gord being picked up by multiple teams in the Asia server. So I'm super excited to see him come through and join us in the Land of Dawn. We've seen another team pull out the gourd within it i want to say and day one or day two it? who was the oh do you know who it was i'm trying to know I... i'm gonna I'm circle back around to it. we did see one other gourd but nonetheless 
Oh, actually, there it is. Area 77 pulled out the Gord up against BTK for their debut match. Uh, and they were actually able to beat, that, beat BTK with it. So we'll have to see how it kind of plays out. Franco, though. You've been mentioning Franco, I, I want to say, like, the entire day. And now it's been <laughs> slotted over there for Legacy. Is this what they needed, right? They have suppression on the table. I mean, it can get a good hook out there. Possibly catch somebody out of position, such as uh, Chirobami or Kohari. But you are going to be worried about a Ruby who has a lot of chain CC to kind of deal with. So we'll have to see how it kind of plays out. But how do you kind of feel about the, the synergized composition coming from Legacy? Having that Franco in the Rome position oh. and then also having the Fredrin for uh, the jungler. I'm glad you asked that question, Weezy, because there's so much to talk about in this matchup. Right, there's a lot of CC coming out from Legacy. A lot of CC actually. All the members have the ability to kind of slow members down besides the carry. But the side of fiends have also the ability to deal with a lot of the CC. But before I go continue, BZ, take us in here. That's right, jumping into the land of dawn. Fiends up against Legacy. Game number two. Game number one ended with a one-sided story, forcing Legacy in an awkward position as Fiends has a position to take them down with match point. Can Legacies push through the momentum that Fiends has built up and take us to a game number three? All right, the strategy coming out from Legacy is quite simple for me, okay? They have the Fredrin to be able to get the frontline guarantee set along with the Petrify and a knockup and to be paired up with kind of the range set of the Nana or the Iron Hook from the Franco, they should be able to guarantee oh. get a hook and get a you know, a pick off here and there. And that kind of secures along with the carry to be able to kind of just burst a single member down from the side of Fiends. But what Fiends has is quite interesting. The, the Raphael actually traditionally is a great, but before that... Ooh, Kuya Nash will draw first blood, finds magic on the Raffaella. PDR though, very low. Gord having a heavy impact over there from Chiro Bami with the CC he is providing to the team. First blood though, goes to Legacy. Now, ooh, on the top side, Riles gets a head move in this fight. Legacy playing much better in this first two minutes of the game. But going back to kind of the draft that I was talking about, Raphael can deal with a lot of the slows that come out from the side of Legacy. For example, the heal can let allow members of Fiends to kind of dodge the impact that the x has or the Iron Hook to be able to kind of just run through it. Oh! But <laughs> the Iron Hook, but it didn't work out the way Kuya planned as he pulled him <laughs> into PDR so that he could take him down. I, I wonder if you can get negative assists over there for Legacy. <laughs> But, you know, what's interesting is that the Franco is good against the Bratz, right? Bratz has a much bigger hitbox, especially when he's maxed out. But, you know, the Raphael's movement speed should be able to counter and allow the Fiends to have a little bit more dodge, but, ooh. Ooh, Mr. Gush goes out. Magic will find Riles with that assistant damage from Chiro Bami. He's been having some good placement over there on this board. Yeah, here. And the turtle does go into the favors of fiends here. They're able to take out the jungler, so they should be able to get this no problem here. But again, it's quite interesting comp coming out from both teams. I think both teams have the ability to win in this series and lots of CC. Yeah, on the table, PDR will find uneven. The siege for the purple buff pro destroy trying to get it. Retribution goes down last minute from Riles. But again, this is kind of similar to game number one, right? Fiends, they like to take the fight to the enemy jungle. They like to harass Riles on his orange and purple buff. And that's what you're seeing right there, forcing out his retributions and possibly trying to get some kills. Speaking of kills, Bloody Hunt going down with the suppression. Jolie will find Kohari. Yeah, the Franco is actually quite perfect here to deal with the aggressiveness that Kohari kind of has. I'm not saying he doesn't look at the map, but he definitely, you know, if a Roamer is onto the top side, they could kind of you know, trade some of the responses on to the aggressiveness that Kohari has, right? He dominates the lane in a one versus one performance against almost anyone. But if you decide to put a roam onto the top side, force a 2v2 matchup, I don't think Kohari is going to stand out as much as he does when he gets these one versus ones. <laughs> gets the hook last second to take that Oi. gold crap. Pro Destroy joining the party on the top side to give Fiends the numbers. But you mentioned having 
Kuyakin up there to kind of protect Jolie. Puts Kohari in a little bit of a hard situation, but you're seeing Fiends respond really well as they're rotating to the top side to give him a slight advantage. I mean, the, you did see Jolie pick up a kill right there, which means he is going to be ahead a little bit in gold against Kohari. Now, Kuya Ken, 0, zero 3 He's got the hands right now. He's got the hooks in his favor. He's able to kind of just land a lot of those hard CCs that Legacy is desperately needing. So very good news from the side of Legacy, but Fiends looking to go aggressive onto the top side. The gold tower is gonna be taken away from the Bruno. This smells so much trouble because the Bruno is just so good and Whoa. the Mystic Gush forces the flicker, right? So Fiends actually still dominating in a lot of these early games, but I would have to say that Legacy has a much better opening this time around compared to the game one. Yeah, definitely playing a little bit smoother, but Fiend's still able to find an advantage. Pro Destroy will go ahead and claim this turtle. PDR rushing in with the last insanity. The taunt with energy eruption, but a knockup. Nom nom! Get in my belly! Riles will fall to a bomb. He gets the kill. Uneven. Able to sidestep that hook from Kuya Ken. Definitely could have been deadly if he was able to connect. And 3-3 three three on the scoreboard, but Fiend's with the slightest advantage. And once again, right, Fiends, they want the team fights to go long. They have the Raphael for the sustain. They have the Brats for the front side. So they want the team fight to go for a very long time. But on the other hand, Legacy here. Ooh, Mr. Gush going down again. Churro Bobby with the ultimate Dylan. Massive damage pro to try to clean up. The last member finds Jolie, a two for none trade on the top side and down goes to tier one turret. It is a good trade for the side of Fiends, but on the other side of the map, they're able to get some damage onto the mid side. They are potentially going to be able to close in on the bottom and Fiends here, trying to see if they could get the engage on the side of Legacy. Yeah, trying to distract them, trying to allow that bot turret to fall. Melina's gift procked out from Kuya, used a flicker to get away to safety. PDR with the fire missiles, providing some great utility, but May find himself down over there from the Mystic Gush. Immortality has been procked and even trying to deal some CC, trying to burst down the remaining Faraga armor, but PDR may be able to get out of there. Side steps into the bush. Now over to the purple buff. Kuya Ken needs to help him out and even will find him. Oh, down goes PDR. No. Nom nom. That is welcome connecting for the stun onto Kuya Ken. A two for none trade again in favor for the Fiends. A negative assist once again for Kuya Ken. <laughs> Picks up the Barats with the iron hook, but gets shut down right away. Fiends again getting away with a lot of the early game aggression that they're completely known for. 3k Goldie and the Mystic Gush looking to deny Riles here at mid. That Mystic Gush hitting hard over there to Legacy as Riles will fall yet again. The fourth assist over there from Churubami, and now a siege for the tier one turret in the mid lane. Yeah, Fiends are looking quite good in this series. Once again, a 4K goal lead six minutes in. I didn't think it was going to be extremely one-sided here, but definitely Fiends are having a strong showing once again. Ooh, another Iron Hook not connected, but the I'm offended. The response back from I'm are uneven. On par right now with the setups that Fiends is looking for. Turtle is in play, and Fiends should be able to take this objective if they want to, but they're going to go ahead and go in for this orange buff, forcing Legacy back Toward their base. Yeah, and you know, I I kind of expect Kuya Ken to be able to get a couple more hooks here, but unfortunately, he's not able to get the grab that he is looking for desperately here. And if Kuya Ken is unable to get any lands onto the side of Fiends, then they're going to struggle a lot in these team fights, right? They want the Iron Hook to get onto any member of the side of Fiends, get that bloody hunt, and have the carry free hit and completely deny one pick. But for the side of Fiends, they've grouped up quite well. Even the Kohari, the Grey, pushing onto the boss side by himself, but the members of Fiends are closing in. Yeah, I mean, Fiends is not going to go in for these turtles. They're going in for the kills and for the turrets. Jolie, though, will find uneven. Able to make it work in their favor. May not have been the smartest decision for Fiends, but now the Lord will spawn in. No more turtles in effect. But so far, Fiends able to take all the objectives with little to no contest. Yeah, eight to four is the overall scoreboard. Eight minute in, about a four to five K goal lead for the side of the bats. And, you know, Legacy right now are struggling a little bit. I do think the Franco has the potential to get a few more iron hooks to try and, you know, close it out. And right there, he gets one. Yeah, Protostar will be able to take the Lord Kuya. We'll go ahead and take down Shuro. That is going to be a one for Lord Trade. Fiends still putting on some pressure on the Legacy. <laughs> Hold on. 
Let's go back over there to the top side. Broner Strong will find PDR, though. Unstoppable Melina's gift procked out from Kuya Nash. Jolie will find uneven, forcing out the flicker. Legacy on the retreat. Speedy Light Rose from Jolie trying to stop Fiends from closing that distance. But it looks like they will be able to take down a possible tier 2 turret for the top side. Yeah, 9 to 6 is the overall scoreboard. They're able to get a shutdown onto uneven. But is that the target they're looking for? This one it is for sure. Yeah, able to connect with the iron hook. Down goes Magic. A great setup over there from Kui Kin. This is what we were looking for for majority of the early game so far. Did he get online right there, though? Can he continue to connect with these iron hooks? Kohari, oh, no. though, the, the brave. brave, the strong, the immortal, 1v4. What can he not do? He can't take them down. That's what he can't do. A little bit more than he can handle. And down goes the marksman for Fiends. It's always kind of interesting to watch Kohari play because, you know, traditionally marksmen don't have the balls to be able to do so, but Kohari definitely is showing a complete <laughs> different style onto the gold lane. He's just like, you know, one versus three, no problem. Let me force all the members onto whatever lane that he's at because it doesn't feel like he's getting the attention he deserves here, right? Zero, two, and three. He shouldn't even be onto the front side, but he's just so aggressive with the style that he is. And there's no punish on the side of Legacy to kind of deny that oh! away. But the Iron Hook is going to connect. Bloody off with the suppressor. Kuya Nash with a follow through finds uneven. Missed a goose from Turo Bombi. As a response, but not able to take him down. PDR, though, very low. Able to get away at a moment's notice with one HP. You know what's funny about Kohari? He's got another <laughs> nickname now. Tony Montana. You know how he has his final stand over there at the mansion? <laughs> That's what it looks like when Kohari tries to 1v4 the entire <laughs> team of Legacy. And I mean, Kohari has done such a great job in a lot of these fights. But, ooh, lots of hooks coming through. Yeah, Kuyanas will find magic for the shutdown. Kuyanas will follow as well. One for one trade. Kohari looking for some damage. Immortality being proc to PDR. Joey picks up Demon Sword. Kohari will find Ryles though. PDR need to get out of there. Flickers away, but Kohari! Say hello <laughs> to my little friend as he rushes in with the soccer ball to burst him down. Yeah, again, look at him right here. He's pushing the bot side two versus one, and he's not even scared of the iron hooks and coming through and the bloody hunt oh, but I might be too to far down oh, he lives it it's doesn't like a, even affect him you way it's like it's like a mental game for kohari he's just like please throw more people at me right like he's not even scared he continues to push onto this mid side and he's just he's definitely showing a strong standing for you know being called the brave here 5k gold lead for the side of fiends the gold i mean the, the kills are close for both teams but fiends are so aggressive here oh able to crack open the base for legacy and looking like they're trying to get some more true bobby finds pdr they may be able to get another early finish with the iron hook connecting on the uneven able to get out of there able to sustain himself in the base putting on the pressure fiends ready to take the fight to legacy's home turf yeah and right here fiends really have to kind of play a little bit more discipline in my opinion right you know against a lot of the great teams if you go this aggressive you're just going to get punished over and over and over and you know going up against legacy with this type of style it's it's great right we, we see the aggressiveness coming through right there we did see magic getting pulled by the franco and the team fight kind of looking in favor of the side of legacy but again kohari able to bait out so many spells gets the soccer kick and then follows up with that flicker to deny the export getting away it's a perfect play for the side of fiends yeah now fiends is trying to claim some more real estate trying to end this game with another early finish to close out this series they may be able to do it here legacy on the back end trying to hold them off one inhibitor to go through in the mid lane and minions and a lord on the top side bloody hunt going down for the suppression not going to be able to stall them for long though they need to burst down this lord and these minions, but look at your Obambi! Missed the gush! Massive damage, Kuya Ken back to the base, able to sustain himself, and the lord will be bursted down. Do we see the side of legacies be able to hold off fiends, or is this the end of the series? Down goes the inhibitor for the mid lane, Kahari gets a kill, finds Ryos! Kuya Ken next on the chopping block, it's a double kill from Kahari. Last insanity out there, trying to get the kill, trying to get the pick off. Kohari with the triple though, fins him off, finds PDR, a base crystal to go through, and Kuya Nash, unstoppable, immortal, Fiends, able to claim the series, shuts down Legacy, 2-0 sweep.
Well, we're definitely good on the casting votes. Fiends able to grab a 2-0 in this best of three series, giving them three points to stand up tall against some of the crowns of NACT, right? And we've seen Fiends pretty much be the dark horse and that has gotten uh, pr pretty much all the wins that they have been looking for. This time, another strong performance. 2 to 0, 18, 11, and 45 is the overall KDA for the side of Fiends and a wonderful performance once again from the Young Kings here. Yeah, and hey, Kahari was able to get another name, Tony Montana. <laughs> he was performing <laughs> in that game, just very confident in his capability in the gold lane. The one-man army Fiends able to continuously showcase their mastery as a new team on the competitive scene it shuts down legacy legacy not the same story though not able to find a single victory this entire regular season you know hopefully we can find some resolve for them as they progress through but we're getting close to that halfway point they need to find some answers as we climb up that ladder yeah now the the real story for you know the bottom of the bracket is where legacy and bloodhounds stand but you know, Fiends able to get this victory, pushing them up in terms of the standings. 18 to 11 is the overall scoreboard at a 13 minute dominating performance for the side of Fiends once again. And honestly, their draft has been so well rounded. It's one of the teams that actually decides to use this utility heavy style uh, performance paired up with a utility jungle. So it definitely fits the, the, the side of Fiends to use some of these strategies that Blacklist has, you know, always kind of leaned on and they've performed extremely well like they understand how to use the sustains they're using like their advantages prolonging the team fights allowing the sustains to come up giving kohari enough time and you know quite honestly fiends they have like this aggressiveness where the roam and the mage can take the enemy roman mage wherever they want in the map allowing kohari to get this one versus one onto the bot side onto the gold lane wherever he's at and you know he's always thrived in these one versus one performance so definitely kudos to the side of the fiends here able to get this victory quite well yeah and you're looking at the rich guy kohari himself 858 gold per minute. The carry as well. The sandbag going over the PDR. And the forgotten one is going to be uh, Chirobami on that crazy gore that we've only seen showcased one other time with Area 77 up against BTK. But funny enough, I, I believe that means Gord has a 100% win rate this NACT regular season. Yeah, no, definitely a strong performance from the Gord here. 83% kill participation, 74k damage, Kohari, 90k damage. This man is a complete menace on the gold lane. He said, take the carry, take the Claude. I'm going to go for early game advantage. And, you know, it's quite brutal when the, the, the side of Fiends, they don't even care about the carry on the Claude. It wasn't even prioritized in the draft. They, they just allow Kohari to pick whichever they want to. And the Bruno worked out so well. It fit his style. He was going aggressive onto the tower, getting the gold plate quite early on. And take a look at some of the damage taken, right? Traditionally, the Rome should be able to take care of a lot of the damage onto the front side. But this time around, Uneven has shown that he can be that frontline support. He can tank up and soak up all that damage and still survive pro destroyer along with it it's extremely hard front line that the side of fiends have set up you know it's hard to kind of think about it but we went through three series already today i feel like time is flying with all of these matches but fiends able to kind of climb up that ladder now able to get a 2-0 sweep which is huge because this is a point system right every win matters that's going to kind of help them climb up there even higher getting closer to that number one position yeah, most definitely. And Liz, welcome back to the show. It's been a very eventful night. What do you think about the last match coming through? Very, uh, very eventful indeed. I think this whole season is very interesting. We have a lot of interesting heroes, like you mentioned, at Gord having a 100% win rate, as well as Vixana back in this scene. So that's definitely interesting. And I think the more in the more epic thing coming for this season is it seems like everyone besides gg and bloodhound and let's see every, everyone else seems to be on a similar stance whether it's fiends btk area 77 and da they're all in a very similar position so the competition is fierce this season and the teams are pretty on an even battlefield so that's definitely inside exciting to see 
Yeah, super exciting to see, you know, just the level of where these teams are standing. I mean, when we first started the NACTs, there's just such a major gap between like the top two teams and the remaining six. But now I feel like it's starting to even out a little bit better to where like we're voting and not even knowing which way it's going to go. I mean, especially after today, we got to see a game go all the way to game number three. UA over there with his uh, master predictions, but nonetheless, <laughs> hey, we'll see because we got another banger on the way. It's one of the most anticipated matches that everybody's been waiting to see. The Gaming Gladiators up against the Bloodthirsty Kings. Our final series of the days, fellas. How do y'all kind of feel about that? UA, how are you feeling about it? What's your prediction, Matt Scientist? Yo, before we go into that, Liz, do we got like a, like a player interview coming up? <laughs> yep, as expected, we have a player interview with Kohari the Brave, or Tony Montana, according to Steph Weezy. So uh, welcome, Kohari, for joining us. How do you feel about these nicknames? I know Trex called you Kohari the Brave. What do you think about that title? Do you think brave is the word you want to describe yourself? Hmm. Well, amazing answer from Kohari. I don't think I can actually hear Kohari, so um, I'm not sure if it's your mic, but if the audience, if you guys... Okay, okay. So you might be muted there, Kohari. You want to maybe unmute your mic? Oh no, technical difficulties. <laughs> you want to try it again? Well, it seems like Ohari is definitely the brave. He is his mic is not is is not really cooperating, but his Bruno definitely made the scene just now. And what I love about this season is we get to see all these players. We get to see the players coming out with in their in their um, natural habitat. We saw Shark last season, which I la Shark last week play on his bed. And then we see all the other players showing their face cam. So that's a nice upgrade that we're seeing, even though there's technical technical difficulties coming with Kahari's mic, but it's understandable, right? Well, they're not professional streamers, so we have a lot of these minor mi minor ticks and tacks, but I like the progress. I like the fact that we get to see how these players are playing. You know, he also gained another nickname. Kahari the silent, what? you know, <laughs> the silence. I think, I think it was on purpose. I think he's just one of those people, you know, his actions speak louder than words. He just leaves it in the land of dawn. Oh, that's a great way to put it. <laughs> yeah, I think he, um, honestly, his gameplay speaks for itself. He was able to pretty much do what a lot of marksmen are not willing to do is overextend and, and all by himself, a one man army. We've seen him do it on the carry. We've seen him do it on the clod. We also got to see him do it on the Bruno. He, I think he ended that game with a triple kill. Everybody was giving him the raw. We even seen him get hit with the bloody hunt and <laughs> still not taken down. <laughs> it's like, what do you have to do to shut this man down? Overall, though, a well-deserved uh, MVP, a great player. And uh, hey, they're just getting started. A super strong team in the making. Yeah, definitely a strong team in the making. You know, the side of Fiends, they have what it takes to kind of upset a lot of these great teams. They've done it at least one of the games against Devious Activities, which is ranked number two. And, you know, they've had tough games and they're following up quite well in the standings here, even grabbing up, clearing, you know, a two to zero and two to zero is actually quite important for a lot of these teams. They're able to get three points to push them up even higher in the standing so fiend's definitely going to come out of this like this standings as a seeded team so far in like quite the first half beginning of nact you're absolutely right i mean after today's games they're probably standing at the top two spot ahead of divas activities so that's that's crazy and the mvp of that series from fiends will be um churro bami so crazy showdown, break it down for us, Weezy. Yeah, you know, I mean, I guess when I actually think about it, he did have a major impact, especially over there when he was running that Gord. This was uh, another gameplay when he was running the Valentina as well, though. He's been very aggressive, racking up them kills. I believe this is where he took the wild charge away from them a majority of this game to deal that massive damage and very hard to deal with 
Not only that, but running on the Valentino, he was able to pressure uh, Riles inside of the jungle when he was running on that X-Borg to allow uh, his team to be able to take his buffs, get Pro Destroy online nice and early. Yeah, and you know, with the Gord pick and the Valentina, it kind of shows off this hero pool that he's able to use quite well in this series and definitely well-deserved in terms of the MVP. The impact that he had was quite immense there. He's able to get the stun, the Mystic Gush onto a lot of different members, shredding pretty much all the opponents from the side of Legacy. So Churro Bambi is definitely a force to be reckoned with. I know we talk about a lot about Kohari, but all the members of Fiends do quite well. We see uneven, you know, on the Ruby, on the x work on the cc you know he's done quite well in all the performance so everyone from the side of fiends even magic man shout outs to you you guys create such a beautiful team and it's been a masterpiece to watch here you're right everybody deserves the name of young king they've proven that with as gamers get younger and younger the comp competition gets fierce so a lot of of new players coming in the scene bright futures ahead and that gourd gameplay i just love seeing a good gourd in the scene uh, uh, very satisfying with that ultimate so um congratulations for for kohari and for fiends for making another epic series now the last series of the day what everybody is waiting for btk versus gg the first showdown between these two teams will btk make a comeback from that first series of the regular season we'll find out yeah we'll definitely find out it's going to be exciting nonetheless to watch it and this may be the only time we get to see them face off because if not you have to hope to see them face off in the playoffs but there's a chance that they might not so it just kind of depends on how the ball gets rolling but nonetheless we are in for the most anticipated match of the night and it, there was a lot of good series before it so i could only imagine how good this one is going to be with gg and gaming gladiators i always say it's like the mobile legends gods flip a coin when these two teams fight it out for who can play victorious <laughs> And it's quite a treat coming out to be able to get this last series of the night. I know everyone in the crowd has been waiting for it, so thank you guys for all being patient and watching this NACT. But you know, this is going to be our last match, and it's quite honestly one of the most eventful matches, the Gaming Gladiators versus BTK is. And to thank you guys for being so patient with us, we have another giveaway for our lovely fans. On the screen, you have a code and you have a QR code to scan for tournament chess for the hero skin hunting and plus for purple and poopa. So make sure you type that code in or scan that code to redeem the prize. The quantity is, as always, limited, only 31. So first come, first serve, make sure you type that code in. Now, as the viewers are looking to get their skins, what do you guys feel about the next match? I know we're going to talk more about it coming back, but this might be the only time we're going to see GG face. Well, this is the only time we're going to see GG face BTK up until the playoffs, at least. You know, honestly, it's a pleasure not only being able to cast the two, these two teams fighting it out, but also being able to see it, right? I mean, this these players have a long history back and forth <laughs> since the beginning of our NACTs. They've been on the same team. They've been on enemy teams. They've competed in the majority of the grand finals. One side wins one, then switch around to the other season. The, the, another team wins the other. So we're going to have to see how this plays out. There was only one time that we've seen them face this entire NACT spring season, which was the... Uh, open no the top 16 uh which is where we got to see them kind of face it out and gaming gladiators was able to push through btk with ease and i think it was just boiled down to them trying to limit moba zane's junglers they forced him into running that fredrin and they pulled a lot of chain cc on him to where he couldn't really route rotate so i'm excited i know ua's excited i know you guys are excited so let's not waste any more time guys we'll be right back after a short break to jump into the final series of the day Five. Yeah, he's dead. Next Lord, next Lord. I don't think they can fight Lord, to be honest. Gina doesn't get caught. Nice, Kush. I see you, Kush. I see you, Kush. Kush. We win this, we win this. It's over, it's over, it's over. Guys, magic, magic. It's hey, over. kill him, kill him, kill him. There's no flicker, no flicker. No, 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 we're fine, we're fine, we're fine. He's dead, he's dead. Push me, push me, push me right now. Push, 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 push. Yeah, they don't have XP, they don't have XP. 
Nah, they're gonna, I think they're gonna try and fight it. They're gonna try. Okay. Nice. Kiss. Nice. Good flicker. Should be free red buffs too. No, no purify, no purify. Yeah, yeah, it is. And blue. Okay. Just one. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm breaking one them. Minion, one minion. Yeah, we can fight, we can fight. Nice. Yo, hard, hard. Nice. No, 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 no. You got it, you got it, you got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, we can just load, we can just load. Oh, yeah, we can, we can, we can. We can, we can, we can. Look, all of, look, all of. Holy sh**. Thank you, Lotus Tarzan. Good positioning for Area 77 for this first turtle. Cole will trying to stop, uh, I want to say, doing the best he can to kind of harass this turtle now at about half health. Nicola and... Shin. Oh. Looking for some damage. Here comes the last and sadly Mystic Gush is out, but oh. Nicola with great positioning. Tarzan still gets the turtle, and this might be bad for BTK. Cole World and Mobazane get Great turtle and two kills for Area 77. Back online, he was struggling early on, but he should be able to find a kill here now. Ooh, red side, lots of people. PA once again, bringing in four members, five coming soon. Koharu with the place to do it, more to get away. Toru bursts him down, sends Koharu back to base. Oh, the auto! Force the pot drop the passive just to get away. That eternal guardian is starting to hurt. Uneven, a little bit of trouble here though. Getting shredded down. T able to pick up the kill. DA with the advantage, taking out two members from Fiends. Lord marching down. It's gonna be an extremely hard clear for the side of Fiends. Fury something. Kohari is able to start down the wall, but he's pulled in with the Alpha Fendon. No one's Fury does lock on. Oh. Blazing Duet just to get away. Go to Soy back to the base as well. But Uneven locks on to Kush here. Mikasa also pretty low. Trilbani looking for some sort of pickoff. Kush finally goes down, but still has the immortality. Go to Soy looking for an angle as well. Gonna come in, but locked up, and down they go. But Mikasa saving the day time and time again in these team fights. A lot of damage on to Yato. Oy. Comes in, able to pop back onto Kohari. But DA not done just yet. Kohari back onto the base. And DA has locked down. They're going to take us to a game number three. That walk is just splitting the whole entire strategy of Legacy of Hearts. Getting this neutral objective without any problems. Holy Baptism locks on. Terrified. Boom. Knocked out. Koyaken hit by the Hayaken. But Yamash might just be next. Riles gonna take a lot of damage. Bloodthirsty Kings on the prowl. Oh. Here comes in, gets an off up on three members, but no one there. Follow up. And oh, the members are all onto the top side. Is BTK gonna clash with the oh. advantage that they have? Donald's oh. welcome. Not able to land on it. Buddy. But it doesn't matter because the rest of the team is here oh. to help out Ken. Taking a lot of damage. Swansong comes in though. Able to unload on several members. Nicolette goes down. Koya Nash with a shutdown. And Double. Will it be enough though? Because BTK is still riding forward. As Nash falls, it's three for two. Just when Legacy had a shot, they lose it. A lot of these objectives and small fights. I mean, it's definitely a tough game for Bloodhounds. Already a 4,000k. This is the exact. Oh, wait a second. Nice suppression. Nice grab. They're able to get the kill on the Sayori. No black shoes for her. Oh, my foe takes a turtle. Gets to the tone as welcome. Lands it down. Ooh, ooh. Damage tries to dash away, but Nakoko is on the trail. The last insanity gets the kill. Oh and now a clash in the midside. Violent Requiem locks on. Oh, my foe. But he still stands tall. Finally falls, but takes Ramsey with him. back guys i love it this season we're so on time every single game we're here with the final match of the day btk versus gg how are you feeling gentlemen oh man i can't wait honestly i just want to jump to the draft to see both these teams fight it out <laughs> i think everybody does uh but nonetheless there's been an amazing journey for them throughout their entire career playing professionally for north america and hey 
we definitely have another great series in store. And, you know, the story of today is there has been quite a lot of close games, right? A lot of close counters, especially, you know, between like the Devious and also Night Horde. And then, you know, we had the Bloodhounds versus um, we had the Bloodhounds versus the A77 in our very first match. Now, this time around, we have BTK versus Gaming Gladiators. I'm wondering if BTK has come up with a strategy because, you know, recently BTK hasn't done well in a lot of the strategies, but against Gaming Gladiators, I think this is where they're all going to tighten up and put their best shoe in front. Yeah, definitely. We're going to have to see if day one was just a bad day for BTK or it's looking like a week series for the team so first let's see their draft which for today btk's rosters we have nicolette moba zane cold world basic and Milo. very standard five-man team yeah looking very strong i mean btk we've seen them have a couple of new faces on the scene this nact spring especially compared to fall and spring last year moba zane always finding a way to kind of reconstruct btk and try and make them even stronger than the time before but hey they're not the only ones improving, so are the other teams in North America, and definitely going to be having one of their hardest challenges yet, going up against Gaming Gladiators. Yeah, and Gaming Gladiators, like, this is a team that has done so well in pretty much all their performance in North America. We have Zia, Shark, Hoon, Best Player, and Fried Chicken. It's an all-star team versus an all-star team, so this is definitely one for the books, but Gaming Gladiator definitely have the more dominating performance, especially in this season, but... Moba Zane, I definitely feel like he has some strategies up his sleeve to be able to lead his team to victory. That's true. I mean, BTK always makes a comeback in the previous seasons. They've never been out of that top spot. So we'll see how they do on the way later on this season. Now for the predictions, let's take a look at what our casters feel with this game. I, game. I know I did pick GG and it looks like everyone else is picking at GG. You wait, this season, are you not in for the underdogs? What, what, what is going on? You want you know, to get that prize for the best predictions? It, GG has been a team with such a strong standing that it's hard to vote against them. And, you know, quite honestly, if I did vote against them, people are going to think I'm trolling. I do think GG has much better standing. Now, BTK could prove me wrong, but we will have to see in this series, stuff. Uh, I mean, I'm right there with you. I'm a man of statistics. I'm a man of uh, hard work and dedication and also victory <laughs> series that they've had. And GG, they never disappoint. I mean, every time you doubt against them, they usually pull through. I can't say the same for BTK this season. I mean, they took a loss to Area 77 on their debut game for the regular season. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's, that's not something you normally see. So it's kind of hard to, to expect them to beat Gaming Gladiators when Gaming Gladiators took down Area 77, the same team that took down BTK. So... Just the man of statistics alongside you. I think that's the same for everybody across the board. If BTK was able to claim their series against Area 77, then maybe I would have gave them the benefit of the doubt. But it's just hard to do that when there's not really any results to kind of back it up. Okay, so speaking as a man of statistics, pull out some statistics or just tell us, like, what do you think is the statistics of BTK winning against GG? Uh, like winning <laughs> against GG? Okay, so... Normally, gaming gladiators, they kind of try and focus on making Zayn uncomfortable, making him run something strong front line in the jungle that they can overwhelm with crowd control. One of his weaknesses is going up against Shark. Shark is able to kind of rotate, harass him in the jungle, deny him getting his orange and purple buffs. I think that's the way that they typically beat him. Now, they do have some additional uh, members on the team that can definitely help out. I mean, they have Cold World there. He has the experience. He's played in uh, Grand Finals before. He used to be on The Simpsons. That's something that they are going to have to watch out for. They have Nicolette, the ra uh, rising prospect mid lane for BTK. Um, and they also have a new addition, Milo himself over there on BTK. I actually got the, the pleasure of talking to him about where he thought he stood compared to Fried Chicken, who's over there on Game <laughs> Gladiators. And he himself put, him, put himself higher, so I admire his confidence. And I guess we're going to figure out today as both of them kind of fight through it. But I do know... Gaming Gladiators also has some secret weapons. They have some top prospects, and they also have a little bit more relevant experience on an international level compared to BTK, who has not really been able to make it out of the North American scene. With Fried Chicken on their team alongside that, he provides some valuable insight. He's a top XP laner, but not only that, his IQ and in-game performance speaks for itself. It's going to have to be something that BTK watches out for.
Now, the interesting thing that I have about this matchup is that Gaming Gladiators has been kind of the dominating king in this matchup. Um, they have probably gotten the most victories against pretty much every single team, especially this year. But for the side of BTK, what's interesting to me is that all their players are all star players. Not one of those players is like, hey, I'm brand new. Like these guys have been in the scene for quite some time. Now, this combination is new. So BTK, I feel like if they were to be able to get their synergy on point, all their players have the ability to win against Gaming Gladiators. How all their players have the ability to win against every single one of these teams, as long as they can get the synergy that they are looking for. And I really believe that all it takes is one game for the momentum to shift. So I actually think BTK, they stand a strong chance, especially if they could get game one. If they could just get one game off of like the top four teams, I think the momentum is gonna be extremely hard to stop. Wait, wait. Oh, Land of Dawn? Oh, Draft is ready. Oh, okay, okay, let's get into Draft then. That's right, into the Land of Dawn we go. The match everybody has been waiting for. Gaming Gladiators up against the Bloodthirsty Kings. Not wasting any more time. That's right, the Land of Dawn was calling. That was Assassin Dave on the operator line. Calling Liz right there to jump us into the most anticipated series of the day. You, Uwe, we're finally here. Mm -hmm. Where do we go from here? Do we see BTK live up to their name? One of the most famous teams in North America go up against the top contender of the NACT spring season sitting in that number one position. Again, like BTK is a team that is full of all stars. These players have put in so much time and work to perfect their craft. And I honestly think they just need one game, two games to build that team chemistry, to build that momentum, and they can dominate pretty much the whole entire season. But they are faced against one of the strongest team. And I would even say, you know, it is a team that does well against BTK, right? Shark, Hoon, Best Player, Fight Trick, and Zia, all of them have been associated with BTK. So, you know, they definitely understand how Zayn operates here. So it's gonna be a tough mind battle, tough mental battle, but I do think if Zayn is able to break through that, if Basic and Myla is able to, you know, push through with that lane, and of course the new synergy onto the mid side, it, it proves to be an extremely strong team to defend against. But again, Gaming Gladiators have the experience. They've done this before. They have been victorious and they've been so consistent pretty much throughout the whole entire regular season. So it's a very hard matchup for the blood of the Kings. Yeah, the Bloodthirsty Kings definitely up for a challenge, but hey, BTK, they've known to go that extra mile. They're the only team that's gone the highest in the M series. We got to see them in M3, place third place. Uh, we didn't get to see them in 2023, had the hottest performance, like Gaming Gladiators, who's able to push through. But in the spring season, BTK did beat some of these members on Gaming Gladiators when they were formerly known as Outplay. Uh, so, I mean, they took us to a best of seven, the best grand finals that we've ever had on the North American scene for the NACT. So I, I gotta give them the benefit of the doubt. They're not a team that I would just say, Gaming Gladiators is gonna breeze through. I mean, there is that opportunity for BTK to be able to shut them down. Now, looking at what we're seeing so far, this is kind of what we were talking about, limiting Moba Zane's picks, right? They take out that Barats, they pick up that Fredrin. They're trying to have him run something else. I mean, he did run the Alpha against them uh, when they did have a chance to go up against each other. And it didn't really work out. That He ran the Fredrin as well. Didn't really work in his favor. So looking at uh, the match so far, with the Fredrin on the best player's hands, that's not even something you typically see somebody pick up first pick, UA. I mean, we all know it's a direct counter over there trying to limit uh, Moba Zane inside of the jungle. Well, here's an interesting thing about BTK's draft that I feel like is quite a bit of weakness, right? The Joy and the Nolan gets banned out, and it's honestly a defensive mechanism for the side of BTK because Moba Zane, uh, quite honestly, he's not, you know, the assassin player that best player is. So being able to take out those two heroes means that their draft is quite limited. Right? It gives gaming gladiators the ability to ban out whoever they want, open whoever they want, and they can just force those two bans out just because Moba Zane does not have those heroes in place. Now, the response to Vexana gets picked up by Nicolette, a great choice, right? High win rate, high picked in North America. The CC, which we've seen Yurishi and also Uneven do so well on the XP lane. Milo is going to be the one that picks that up. Should be able to deal with a lot of the zone coming out from best player, but the response right the the ruby gets picked up pretty much multiple games back to back something that we have not seen that's on the band table is going to be the tig and the minotaur 
And I was going to say, I mean, that leaves Zane with a couple of options still left out of comfortability. And that is going to be that box you slotted in. Um, so he is going to have to dive into a lot of front line, though, especially with that Fredrin, especially with that Ruby. That's a lot of CC, but he is very mobile. And honestly, he's one of the best uh, junglers when it comes to rotating on this box here. So we are going to be looking at Milo running the CC, very mobile in the XP lane, does a lot of damage, very hard to kill, and nobody really stop him in his tracks. There is a lot of flexibility, though, with the draft from the side of Gaming Gladiators. I mean, the Ruby. We don't even know if this is going to be a Rome Ruby, if it's going to be an XP laner, and that's just that three-dimensional drafting uh, at its finest. You are looking at that carry providing that late-game damage. Mobile Zane will have to watch out for that, but he can close the distance on the carry, which does work for him if he wants to go into the back line, but he also has to watch out because the carry... Once you get that Demon Hunter sword, once you have a couple of those core items at your disposal, he's going to be able to soak into the beefier composition and burst down a frontline hero such as the Boxia. Mm, now the Minotaur gets taken out from the side of gaming gladiators. I do think maybe a Brody could be a good ban against basic, but for the side of BTK, they still have a lot of options that they can choose for. If they were to pick the Harith, that means that Milo's physical damage is going to be quite huge. But for the side of BTK, they already have two magic damage dealers. I'm not sure if the Harith is going to be the one that gets picked up today. Another good option, the Brody or even the Bruno that got picked up during the Fiends match could be good against the carry so definitely still having a lot of options on the board btk with the next ban both of them decide to take out the minotaur and the chig reel yeah i mean they could even go for something like the natan if they really wanted to i do like the brody though i think it's the strongest option here especially against gaming gladiators i mean look at their draft they are uh heavy frontline oriented especially with that uh ruby and that frederick if they decide to run that ruby in the in the roam position they're going to try and stop Moba Zane from getting his buffs. I mean, that's their game plan. Usually you see Shark rotate around and, and harass Zane majority of the game. Now, they still can flex that Ruby into the XP lane. It will be up against that CC. Can possibly stop CC from rotating around as often because of the sustainability that the Ruby provides. Very hard to kill and able to kind of maintain herself in that lane. But they're fully equipped to dive into the orange buff the purple buff possibly get into the side lane and take down the gold laner which is why i do agree i think the brody would be a great option for the bloodthirsty kings brody the bruno those are good options for the kings but basic decides to pick up this Harith. it makes me question a little bit if the side of ptk has too much magic damage right you know you want to have a balance between both and if you're just relying on cc with the war axe to deal the physical damage that you are looking for it's going to be hard to penetrate you know the armors that best player that shark is going to be building up in this case so i feel like gaming gliders has pushed btk onto kind of a corner here now better options once again I, we, we we do think the brody the bruno might be better options here but again the Harith has been picked up now the response right i think they're looking for a mage and a possible roam or an exp position yu zong comes to mind for me grok could also be an option to kind of knock and deny the grok pick from btk because i think you know cold world might have a pretty good game on grok if he chooses to go with it i just realized the navario walked through the draft all the way to the second phase it's honestly a little bit surprising but game of gladiators will lock that in provide them some additional cc and whom should be able to sustain himself in the back line like i said moba zane is running this box here though so he may be able to close that distance alongside milo that uh cc is a great hero to go over there and try and find that mage try and find uh the marksman now when i'm looking at the side of btk crowd control is what i'm a little bit worried about right i mean you have the vexana so it could do a little bit of damage you have the zaman force over there from the harith but harith's gonna be pretty much in the gold lane for majority of this game yes the harith will do a little bit better than the carry when it comes to the 1v1 engagement but the survivability of the harith is what i'm a little worried about when it comes to gaming gladiators diving in on him since you don't have that brody since you don't have a stun at your kit and that flicker to escape he's gonna have to play a little bit safer if Game of Gladiators decides to take some early rotations in today's matchup. But last pick on the board for the Bloodthirsty Kings is going to go ahead and be that Grok. Not the worst option. I actually am a fan of the Grok. He can hug that wall. He can stop a lot of that CC that Game of Gladiators has to offer. And also good on diving in, stopping heroes from getting into the neutral objectives by dropping that Guardian's Barrier. And with the drafts being finalized, I think we have a really good match on our hands. I think both sides have some answers and also have some vulnerabilities. Yeah, I think the Grok, 
is pretty much the final pick coming out from BTK. Brings a little bit of physical, brings a little bit of clear onto the mid side to help Nicolette rotate around. But also, I feel like the Grok is kind of the last and the only option that BTK had, right? I've never seen Cold World play the Arlot, and the Arlot has been let through. So it's quite interesting here in our last game of the night. That's right, final series of the day. The most anticipated match of the NACT spring season is finally here. The Bloodthirsty Kings up against Game and Gladiators. Who will be able to take game number one? Yeah, it's the gaming fighters, the gaming gladiators here versus the kings of the kings. The exciting matchup for tonight. And once again, you know, th th these two teams have been dominating in the North America circuit for such a long time. This is a complete classic, guys. So I hope you guys all enjoy this match coming through. Let's take a look at some of the emblems. The Festival of Blood has quite been normalized for the carry on the gold lane and even the xp lane so lots of sustain coming out from both teams even the Harith decides to pick up the festival of blood so lots of sustains coming out from both teams already an aggressive opening from the side of btk now cold world off to a good start right he's harassing best player in the jungle a little bit opposite from what we see usually we see gaming gladiators pulling that trick out of their cards for the bloodthirsty kings but btk looking like they're ready to take this fight nice and early not going to give them the advantage that they normally have inside of the early phase which is good for them cold world a new addition to the bloodthirsty kings we've seen him on the simpsons we've seen him compete on the competitive scene before and off to a good start to deny shark from kind of harassing and giving vision on moba zane yeah, and you know, Cold World is actually known to be a player leading a team with a really high early aggression early on, right? So, you know, to see Cold World kind of dominating, especially in this level one, it's not surprising to me, but it's definitely what BTK needs to be able to kind of get through in this victory. And once again, I think BTK has a very solid chance of getting a victory off of the gaming gladiators. Now, we talk about the statistics, it's not so much, but boss side, CC here. Yeah, a lot of damage right, as we are going to see this turtle spawn in. Both sides trying to bait out some utility before going in for this objective. Milo, very low, taking some massive damage, forced to kind of recall back to the base. Astro Echo to connect to deny his recall right there. Mobazane is going to rotate around, though, trying to find an opportunity. Best player in position for the Retribution. Yeah, and the side of PTK is struggling to even get close to the objective here. The wild charge does come through, but the damage is not followed up. Nicolette is on the backside. PTK able to take the very first kill here. Yeah, Nicolette is going to get the kill, takes down Shark, but they will lose the first turtles. Gaming Gladiators is able to secure that best player with the Retribution. And this is kind of what we've seen uh, normally when these two teams face off. Some heavy crowd control up against a frontline oriented jungler. Uh, Moba Zane, which kind of hurts him when it comes to taking these neutral objectives. But we know they're a team that knows how to look for the opportunity where necessary. With that first neutral objective going to GG, though, they will have the XP boost, but not the massive advantage since BTK was able to take a kill away from them. Yeah, that's a that's pretty good for the side of BTK, right? They're able to kind of keep up with the gaming gladiators. You know, unfortunately, they did not get the performance, the results that they were looking for in the early on in the day one and day two of the regular season. But definitely a strong opening for the side of BTK. They're just keeping up with the side of gaming gladiators, and I think that's a very good uh, result. Ooh, big knock up though, Nicolette with massive damage. Zane will take down Shark, best player. Appraiser's wrath. We'll be able to dash out of there last second. Two kills on the board for the side of the Bloodthirsty Kings. Huge opening from the side of BTK. Able to pick up another member, Shark, already down 0 and 2. Now, Shark dying is not that big of a deal, especially since he is on that roam position, but definitely is still an advantage for the side of BTK. Yeah, BTK rotating around, able to take these objectives. Even though they were not able to take the first turtle, stripping off some of the gold plating for that turtle on the top side could put uh basic in a good position to deal the damage necessary he's already a counter for the uh carry but also having the gold advantage is going to make him even stronger in no. the gold lane we are going to see the uh, turtle spawning in 15 seconds though gaming gladiators can they take this next objective or will btk find a way in I do want to point out that the Grok has decided to take the Quantum Charge, and it's quite interesting that we're seeing a lot of Roams take the Quantum Charge, right? Matilda, Kaja, and we even got to see an Estus bringing up that spell. So definitely something new in terms of the spells of our Roamers, but BTK having the numbers advantage in the Turtle Pit. 
Yeah, look at the turtle. 50% HP. Oh. Big, I'm offended from Shark. Best player. Finds Nicolette. Cold World. Need to find a, an answer. Moba Zane very low. Shark and Chicken not trying to allow him to get away. Chaining him with CC. Zane still wants this turtle in position for a possible retribution. But best player will be able to claim the second turtle of the game over the Bloodthirsty Kings. Yeah, and the goal lead is still really close, right? The side of Gaming Gladiators, they're able to get one pick off along with the objective, but the goal lead is still not completely in their favor. So BTK holding on in this series. This is exciting, right? This is pretty much the matchup that we want to see before. And of course, BTK knows Gaming Gladiators just as much as Gaming Gladiators know Moba Zane. So it's definitely a matchup that they have been looking for. Now, Gaming Gladiators, in terms of their scaling onto the late game, right? They have the carry zia versus basic here the carry should have a much substantial late game especially when he's up in gold but if carry is a oh top side yeah zia caught with the gank from cold world basic able to get the kill with the numbers but on the bot side a possible trade moba zane will fall hoon will be the one to take him down milo left by himself to fend off against three members of gaming gladiators and hitting uh pretty hard right there very low shark to be able to take the kill with the chain CC. And that is going to be two to three, three to three on the board, even in kills for both sides. And both of those members decide to take the armor boots, right? The Zane and also the CC picking up the armor boots. It is good to deal with a lot of the physical damage coming out from the side of gaming gladiators, but the CC chain knock up provided by the Ruby and the Fredrin was just too much to handle for the side of BTK. Now, we do see a small gold lead in place. Retribution comes through. So best player looking to get onto a small engagement. Yeah, looking to engage in the mid lane. Cold World very low. Appraiser's Wrath for some additional chip damage. Moba Zane frontlining a lot of the damage, but now caught with the crowd control over pressuring him. Gaming Gladiators looking to take him down. Hoon will draw the kill. Now a 4 to 3 lead in terms of kills and also a turret advantage for Gaming Gladiators as they were able. No, actually, no, it's, it's even on turrets as both sides were able to find a tier 1 turret on opposing lanes. It is still an advantage for the side of Gaming Gladiators. This is, you know, hard for the side of BTK if you guys are rooting for them. You know, the side of Gaming Gladiators, if they have the advantage, they typically, you know, run away with the game. And this time around, they have the advantage. So BTK is going to be caught up and kind of backed up into a spot that they are going to be quite uncomfortable with. But mm, mid side here, there's three man waiting in the bush. But Cole already knows what's going on. Yeah, Cold World forced to use the wild charge. Knocks up Shark. Astro Echo response back from Hoon. Connecting to Cold World and Nicolette. Basic joining the battle in the mid lane if they do want to take this fight. Now, when you're looking at the kills, right? You're looking at uh, Hoon already leading the way. Highest kills in the game on this Novario, who we typically see banned out of the matches. He is going to be able to provide a lot of utility when it comes to slowing down the team with the Astro Echo and opening up these engagements. But so speaking of opening things up, best player. Frontlining, knocking up Moba Zane, Chicken, ready to use the Bravest Fighter in the Raging Slash. Milo, now gonna go ahead and sustain himself, trying to frontline the damage, bait out some utility, but hit with a lot of crowd control, and Zia with the Speedy Light Wheels will shut him down. That is gonna be a one for none trade inside of the mid lane. Gaming Gladiator has always been kind of that team that they're able to solo pick off in a majority of these fights, right? They can get the disengage that they're looking for, and then they get the pick off. And now Hoon, 2, 0, and 3, already having the book into the Lightning Treachery. Like, this guy has scaled so fast in this series, and he, he, you know, he's going to go pretty much undenied every single one of these team fights. BDK, they don't have that backline assassin to look to close the gap onto Hoon, so they're definitely going to have a lot of trouble trying to clear up for him. Ooh, wild charge from Cold World. Tier 1 turret on the top side. Just fall! Praise his wrath! Cold World will use the flicker to get out with a smidgen of HP back to safety, but Game and Gladiators claims their second turret of this game. Already up by three turtles as well, which means they now have controlled the early phase and may be able to claim the Tier 1 turret in the mid lane. Milo, Nicolette, Moba Zane in position for the contest will be able to clear out the minions. Yeah, now Carrie already has the gold lead up against the Herith. This is kind of a bad situation for the side of BTK, right? Herith is traditionally supposed to be that lane bully to be able to dominate the early game that Zia should not have. But the side of BTK, they're not kind of just falling left and right. The Lord going down the retribution onto the hands of Gaming Gladiators. Yeah, I mean, look at Moba Zane. He's not able to find a window of opportunity to get into the Lord Pit with Shark 
zoning him out over there on this ruby which is allows gaming gladiators to take another objective under their table without little to no contest i mean btk they have to find a way to claim this with this lord it looks like gaming gladiators is going to push in try and claim some more of these turrets possibly go in for a tier one turret siege in the mid lane yeah, and you know, Gaming Gladiators, they didn't have the opening that they were looking for. Shark got pretty much taken off the board twice, but now Gaming Gladiators is really ramping up the production here. Ooh, massive Astro Echo and a siege for the tier one turret. Gaming Gladiators opening up the mid lane in their favor. Cold World hit with a lot of crowd control. Stunned, Shark trying to keep him at bay. Forced to use the wild charge back to safety. Lord on the bot side, marching toward the tier two turret. And Gaming Gladiators, once again, they have the lead advance. It's about a 4k gold lead, 10 minutes in. It's not a significant, you know, a complete one-sided domination, but the gold lead definitely still paints the picture for the side of Gaming Gladiators to have the success that they have been pretty much throughout any game of these series, right? Zia completely farmed up here. He ha he probably has or going towards that Demon Hunter sword is just going to scale infinite towards that late game. And also Hoon completely, you know, untouched touched in this series and oh, oh i'm offended four men set shark on fire with the ruby i'm offended catching basic catching chicken catching zane maybe if we get some more core world is going to take down chicken that's going to be a two for three trade nicolette find shark my goodness you wave both teams giving it their all but gaming gladiators slightly ahead as they have forced btk down to their inhibitor turrets yeah, it's a bloodbath there coming out from both teams. BDK, the 5k gold lead is just a little bit too much for the side of BDK to handle. I think they have to pick the fights a little bit more carefully, right? They have to see if they can catch on to Hoon or catch on to Zia before they can even initiate onto the front side tanks because quite honestly, Shark dying, Chicken dying, that's fine. They're willing to trade two to three members for those two kills, but BTK, they have to try to find a way to on the backside. If Hoon completely just is untouched every single one of these team fights, if Zia is getting out alive with full HP, it's gonna be too hard for them to handle yeah three man set up there i thought it was four but basic didn't get caught with it you're gonna see zia take down moba zane off that play chicken find cold world but then a couple of members from btk fell themselves as nicolette is gonna go ahead and shut down shark as well in that engagement game and gladiators on the aggressive stance still trying to get an early finish up against the bloodthirsty kings yeah, dominating performance once again. 6.5k gold lead, 12 minutes in. Gaming Gladiators pretty much got everything that they need from all these teams' fights. And the Lord, now it is going to be an enhanced Lord marching down. I don't think BTK has the ability to contest in this objective. And even if they can, Shark, you know, with the pools coming through, he was able to get a three man set onto the backside of BTK. Like, this man is making so much impact all around the map even with two deaths he has the confidence and that just smells a lot of trouble for the side of btk yet another objective will go in their hands with little to no contest milo you've been trying to find a way in for opportunity but it is just not there almost an 8,000 gold difference between gg and btk so far at the 13 minute mark and for the side of btk i mean they're not necessarily out yet but there's a lot of insurance for gaming gladiators if they do make a mistake i mean they've only lost one turret so far have a major gold deficit and if btk even tries to take this fight with the luminous lord it can smell disasters gaming gladiators is one of those teams you give them a step they take a mile yeah and now gaming gladiators with the ability to sink the waves great right they got the lord marching down on one of the side lanes which is so it's perfect for them to kind of siege in and try to get a pick off here but for btk right they still have the lane clears available the boxia can provide a little bit of lane clear harith also does quite well grok also has the first skill to be able to kind of just smack the wave. So definitely on the defensive end, BTK still has it in them. But in terms of the team fight, Shark has been just so good with the I'm Offended. And the base has been cracked open for the Bloodthirsty Kings. Gaming Gladiators knocking for a possible victory. BTK with the response. So Milo, very low. Zia, Speedy Light Wheels will find him. One member down for the Bloodthirsty Kings and the inhibitor will fall in the mid lane. BTK on the back and trying to hold him off. Another member falls. Zia with the double kill finds Mopa Zane. Triple knockoff from the wild shots from Cold World. Fight Tickle. Fight Nicolette. Basic. Very low. Zia. Rushing in, but Hoon will be able to get the kill. Last second. Cold World by himself. A quick finish for the side of Gaming Gladiators. Is Cold World by himself not enough to contest? And Gaming Gladiators, they're going to go for the kill.
full brutality right now for the first match of the day as GG will shut down BTK in game number one. 13 to 5 is the overall scoreboard. 14 minute dominating performance coming out for the side of gaming gladiators, and multiple members have pretty much gone undeath, unchecked in this series. Best player 2, 0, and 10 is his overall scoreboard, playing a complete perfect game on that Fredrin. The first pick, right? Denying that. Fredrin away from Mobazane and did honestly quite well. This guy is an assassin main, but he can he's able to pull out the utility jungles just as well. The overall KDA of the team 13, 5, and 38, Wheezy. Yeah, just a great performance from Gaming Gladiators. Able to kind of push through micro macro is where they kind of excelled at for that game, right? They were able to keep Mobazane at bay with the crowd control, with Shark on the Ruby, denying him entry into a lot of these neutral objectives, a lot of these lords, a lot of these uh, turtles on top of that. And eventually when you allow them to take these, those things add up. And that's how mm -hmm. the uh, Game of Gladiators was kind of able to push through with the fast finish up against BTK for game number one. This is similar to where we've seen them kind of fight it out in the battle of the top 16. It's the crowd control that gets a little overwhelming uh, for Moba Zane. It's like, honestly, like they form a strategy just to stop the frontline junglers uh, that are on the table, such as the Boxia, such as the Fredrin. Uh, you know, that's really what they kind of go for, and it's been proven to work. I will say, though, BTK was looking a little promising in the beginning. Cold World actually mm -hmm. had some great positioning with that grok but shark able to get that massive triple set last second grabbing three members of btk and then able to kind of make the most out of the situation right after that to close it out take that lord and finish that game btk they need to go find a way to turn this around and it's going to start with uh finding a way to get to those neutral objectives yeah, and you know, if you take a look at the team five participation across the board, it's 92% for Shark, Hoon, and best player, the trio mid dominating, right? You know, the these three guys, and look at Hoon. He literally barely took any damage. He lows left unchecked the whole entire game. A 8k damage taken. It doesn't even show a bar at that point. Like Hoon has done so well in his positioning onto Navaria. There's a good reason why you know that hero gets taken out almost every single game. But for the side of BTK, unfortunately, in terms of their draft, I you know they have to let go of the Nolan. They have to let go of the Joy. Those are the two main heroes that they have to ban out, and that leaves them with really just one option. I actually think BTK maybe they should just open those two heroes fight the assassin versus the utility because it seems like gaming gladiators they don't even care about the assassins in the jungle the first pick fred was just like you know they they don't want this fred they're not banning it out i'm gonna take it away from zane because that is the most played hero that zane has had you know in this season so gaming gladiators they definitely have an advantage in the draft i want to see btk change it up let them have the assassins provide a little bit more bands a little more more safeguard and maybe some of your other lanes take hoon off the board don't give them the navaria because quite honestly you don't got the assassins you don't got the yuzong that can get onto the backside to shut him down yeah so we definitely have to keep an eye on hoon when he runs that navaria right even though he probably didn't get mvp there he had a big impact on a lot of the crowd control the cc provided over there for gaming gladiators since we are looking at gaming gladiators a couple of their highlights from game number one there goes hoon opening it up to astro echo and then the three-man set from shark for the engagement and then gaming gladiators make the most out of the situation zia picks up a kill chicken gets another cold world takes down chicken to respond though you are seeing some micro and macro plays from both sides but still leaning in favor over there for gaming gladiators this is where they cracked open their base and led to their early finish to be able to close out game number one the bloodthirsty kings they're putting up a good fight but the crowd control just a little too much to handle moba zane not finding an entry point on a lot of these turtles and also these lords which ultimately stacked up against them and led to a snowball in gaming gladiators favor yeah and i also want to point out that from the side of btk they had kind of like a neutral 
like a, a, a neutral game, especially early on, right? They were able to take maybe two kills off of gaming gladiators and kind of hold it against themselves. But once again, Shark on that Ruby was able to get like a two, three man I'm offended onto that turtle pit and that completely changed the course in this game. So I still think BTK, they have the ability and they have the players to make the impact to create this upset, this uprising that, you know, NACT is desperately needing, but gaming gladiators just playing beyond perfection, right? Ruby gets that set. Kuhn literally not taking a damage at all into, in, in, in this whole entire game. And even best player, right? He's an assassin main looking to play that utility jungle first, picking the Fredrin with absolutely no problem, no deaths on the board. Gaming gladiators played a great game in this very first series. Well, the Bloodthirsty Kings up for another battle may be able to turn this around and draw us to a game number three. I like to see matches go to uh, game number three. We got to see one series today go that extra mile, and I'm hoping to see a second one. But it's going to start with a couple of things working in BTK's favor if they want to have a chance. Number one, finding a way to get to those neutral objectives. If Mobazane is going to be running these frontline composition junglers such as a Boxia, such as a Fredrin, such as a Barats, that's fine. But they need to find a roamer that can kind of create that window or an XP laner that can create that opening for him to get to those turtles or to those neutral objectives, especially since he's not running something like an assassin that's gonna go and gank the side lane instead. I mean, he can run a frontline composition and instead of going for the neutral objective, he could go in and just try and shut down the gold laner or the XP laner. I mean, that's definitely a possibility. You don't have to be an assassin to do that. And honestly, the way the meta is shifted, it does work in Moba Zane's favor for who he can kind of pick up. But again, a lot of the heroes that he's selecting, there's not really too much of a variation on what they offer. And some of the same counters counter majority of them. The Ruby counters the Fredrin. The Ruby can give the Boxia a hard time. You know what I mean? Like the Barats, I mean, I guess he could possibly rush in, but again, the CC is what's a problem. They just try and stop him from getting into retribution range to allow best player to take these objectives, which is fine, but then they need to find a way to rotate to the opposing side and get a trade. You can't continuously let these things stack up or that's where gaming gladiators will kind of win it out. When it comes to the 5v5 fights though, that's where I think it's a little bit more even. I wouldn't say that Gaming Gladiators is just really dominating them on 5v5 fights. Yes, Shark has some amazing sets, but also you got to look at the XP boost that they have when they take all of these turtles, right? I mean, their, their side laners are going to eventually scale over the enemy side laner because they have more gold, because they have more experience from these turtles adding up. Now, kind of a interesting opening once again in the first phase of bands multiple junglers are being taken off onto the shelves barats fredrin joy and nolan right these are the heroes that we kind of expect both teams to take out but not in this fashion right we, we you know there's still a lot available right the ruby the novaria the, the, the carry, the Vexan, there's so many things available here. But the side of gaming gladiators, they decide, hey, Moba Zane, we're not just gonna let you have these hero basic, you two, we're gonna take out the best of your, you know, lineup there. But the side of BTK, they opting to go for the same exact bands. I understand the joy gets taken out because the CC immune is quite too much to deal with. But the Nolan, I feel like there is counterplays to it. But the only difference in this draft is that the Angela is now available to be picked up. And we've seen the Angela do quite well in numerous series, but this time around, Matilda is gonna be the first pick for the side of the Kings. The Matilda is good too. I think it's gonna provide a lot of sustainability for their team. Now, I do expect Moba Zane to probably pull out an uh, Akai here, believe it or not. I think that's what he's gonna pull out <laughs> here, especially because the Akai has the heavy spin. Uh, when no, when his team can't help him zone out the enemy team from the neutral objective, you can just proc that heavy spin and go in there with no problem for that retribution. Now, I wonder if Gaming Gladiators is onto the strategy, though. I wonder if they're going to take it away from him with this draft. Because if not, I think it would be a good option, especially with the play style for the Bloodthirsty Kings. I don't see Mobile Zane pulling out an alpha here. He's I... tried that before. He went against Area 77. It didn't really work in his favor. Uh, so, I mean, I, there's not really too many other heroes on the table, unless he goes in for a Martis. Uh, but no, they're going to take the box. Yeah, actually, I didn't even think about the box here there. But yeah, I, 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 what do you think? Do you think it'll be in the Kai pickup? Well, I think the carry is 100% warranted for the side of Gaming Gladiators. Like, that's an obvious pick, 
right? With the Claude being banned out, the carry pretty much provides that late game insurance that the side of gaming gliders do so well in the late game. I do want to see the response, a little bit of a stronger response. The Harith has done quite well as long as the side of BTK does not have too much magic damage. And I think it worked decently. Another pick, you know, that we've seen quite often is going to be the Brody pick. I do want to see, you know, BTK potentially picking up, uh, you know, the uh, Ruby that could kind of deny uh, Gaming Gladiator's ability to flex that once again. But just like you're saying, Weezy, the Kai gets picked up for MOBA Zane. And especially <laughs> after the Boxia, I do think that is going to be the single best option there. Yeah, I mean, hey, I, I can kind of seen that coming from a mile away. I mean, it just works with his play style and the way that BTK kind of rotates around. He needs a hero that he can rush in with without having to rely on too many things being checked off for these neutral objectives. And Akai is the perfect hero to do that. Now, they picked up that carry. It's a great answer to be able to uh, soak down his beefiness over there. But he does have a Thilda to keep him alive and also has the guiding win on top of that stacked up with the Navaria. And this is looking a lot better than game number one for the draft for the Bloodthirsty Kings. For the side of Gaming Gladiators, I like the box. It's highly mobile. I like the carry. There is still a lot of options on the table that can give the carry a hard problem, though. And I think uh, Harith, we did see that time and time again, has been... Is that Harith banned out? Yeah, Harith is actually banned out on this no, game. No, not, so, not yet. Oh, no, that's Joy. Okay, so Harith <laughs> is not banned off the table. So it could be picked up. The Brody as well. You mentioned Brody being a strong option. They already have double magic over there. So I would think the Brody would be their best option here just for survivability but time will tell yeah but this is an interesting thing a very early lapu lapu comes into play the ruby does not get picked up this time around and maybe gaming gladiators is just saving that roam pick this time right they could pair the roam with the carry like the kaja the franco with the suppression coming through maybe even you know denying the cc coming out from btk they could go for something like a diggy and i think the lapu lapu is a perfect setup it provides a lot of the frontline utility it gives them that significant physical damage so they have honestly quite a good amount of options to choose from now the side of BTK, they are missing that XP position. I do think, you know, Yuzong could be a good potential. The x -Borg also is available to kind of shred down the front line. But for the side of Gaming Gladiators, I do think they need to worry about the Novaria quite a bit. In the last game, Hoon was pretty much left unchecked on the Novaria. So this time around, Nicolette might even be able to turn that situation around and, you know, deal tons of damage. But there is other options in the Mage mi at mid, right? The Faramis, that is quite good. The Nana, even the Vaxana. They could even opt to go for the Gorg, which is quite good in the mid lane. Yeah, I was going to say the Vexana is still on the table. Uh, maybe picked up over there from Gaming Gladiators. Uh, yeah, the Valentina was banned out. Looks like they're trying to kind of focus on some of Hoon's signature picks. Now, I mean, when we're looking at BTK, they have sustainability provided. They have frontline presence, and they also have some damage over there from the Navaria. A lot of crowd control on the table. They need a little bit more damage, in my opinion, though, on the physical side of things. And that's where I don't know if they're going to run something like the Harith up against the uh, carry. Now... And they end up being that Brody that we talked about. It could end up being something like a Bruno, possibly on the table as well. Not something we don't we see as often. I don't think it'll be in a ton, just because I feel like they need a little bit more physical damage. But uh, hey, anything's possible between these two teams. But something interesting that did get slotted in was uh, the Lapu Lapu. Looks like they went in for that XP laner before even knowing what he's going against. Just shows the comfortability over there from Fried Chicken. I mean, we did see uh, Milo run the uh, CC in the last game. CC is banned off the table, and BTK was the one to take it off the board. They need something to get to the back line, though. I mean, they have a Kai who can kind of rush into uh, Zia on the carry. Not really sure if that's going to be his goal, though. Maybe picking up something, like you mentioned, uh, the Yuzong, but that has been banned out as well. Uh, so they are trying to limit what heroes can actually get back there to shut down Zia on these engagements. Xborg Trizla comes into mind a little bit of CC to kind of shut down the short range coming out from the carry. But the Gaming Gladiator is going to be the first one here to get that first pick. Shark is still available. I do think, you know, Shark is going to hide the last pick, but no, Ooh. the Ruby gets taken up again. And, you know, I don't know if BTK is very happy with this because the impact that Shark had in the game one was just a little bit too much for the Kings to handle. I was going to say Bakito could have been a pickup for the XP lane, but I don't it could, know it about could still Bikito be. now. 
It, it could be just because of how heavy of a hitter he is and with the recent patches, he did get a decent buff and he's been performing really well. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how he's going to walk into a lot of this CC though. I mean, you're running into a boxer, you're running into a Ruby uh, and then also the Lapu Lapu. I feel like he could take the fight with the Lapu Lapu possibly, uh, but even Lapu has the crowd control, which could be a little bit of a threat. So. Terizla does have the anti-CC, but I don't really think they need more group CC at their disposal. There goes the Brody that we mentioned, though. It was the best answer over there for the gold lane, and you did mention the export. Credits over there to you. We'll be slotted for the Bloodthirsty Kings inside the XP lane, which I do favor over running him in the jungle. I really like the Brody pick. Why? Because I feel like a lot of the teams, they do struggle in the early phase. They're picking up a lot of the late game heroes like Carrie and Claude, but they just can't really get a kill early on, especially when, you know, the Rome or the Mage is coming into their lane and they just don't have the kill pressure early on. But the Brody fixes all of the issues along with heroes like Clint and the Bruno, which has been used a little bit in North America, but not as much as I would like it. Now, the Vexana gets picked up by Hoon here. It is a dangerous pick with a significantly high win rate and Hoon has always been the one to pick it up early. This time around, it is a last pick. Vexana might smell a lot of trouble, especially since Brody is such a short range hero. And it's gonna be a battle of push and pull. When you're looking at BTK, they're the push, right? They have the Akai to be able to force gaming gladiators out of the neutral objectives. They have the Navara for the slow. They have the knockup from the circling eagle provided over there from this Mathilda and a little bit of a stun from the Brody, but the pool comes in from Gaming Gladiators. They have the Ruby, the I'm Offended Shark. We saw the triple set in game number one, maybe in effect for game number two, as we are now jumping into the land of Dawn. The Bloodthirsty Kings trying to find a way to even out the series. Gaming Gladiators sitting at match point. Yeah, and of course, Gaming Gladiators, the one that has been dominating in the very first performance once again. They are the ones that are leading in our standings. So they're definitely going to be the crown favorites here in this matchup. But once again, BTK, a team full of complete all-stars. Mobazane on a comfortable hero that he chooses. And they also have the GOAT Milo on the XP. So definitely, we cannot count the Bloodthirsty Kings out of this match. Just yet. And look at... The red buff denied from Cold World, a very strong opening once again in the series. Yeah, the denial is there, Cold World. You need to watch out, Shark, very low. Cold World, not afraid to kind of overextend and, and give some great vision, similar to what we've seen in game number one. Didn't work out in their favor though. On the top side, we are gonna be looking at the Brody going up against the uh, carry. Brody definitely having the survivability. Will be able to sustain himself if the side of Gaming Gladiators does go in to try and dive on him. I mean, Gaming Gladiators does have a, a little bit better of a set composition, right? They have a lot of crowd control to keep BTK at bay. When it comes to BTK though, I mean, they have the slow, but it's really just Moba Zane trying to get a pin onto the wall for an initiation setup. Outside of that, I mean, they are going to have to be a little careful as if they get caught in the chain CC for majority of the heroes on Gaming Gladiators, it will give them a slight advantage on the 5v5 engagements. Yeah, but this time around, BTK does have the kill pressure onto the top side. You can even see Milo having quite a good lane on the bot side. So, you know, BTK, I feel like their draft, they like what they have picked. Nicolette is on a great mage like Novaria, where the mobility and the outplay is, you know, available for her to use. So I actually think BTK is quite happy in this draft. And I think there's a great potential that they can turn this game just because they have the kill pressure on the top side. Nicolette is on a great hero, but the objective is coming through here yeah it looks like Moba Zane maybe able to get the retribution best player in position though there goes the heavy spin Zane able to hold off gaming gladiators and claim the turtle for the bloodthirsty kings but now needs to get back to safety the chase is on the way circling eagle from core world makes his way into the tier 2 turret and nobody will fall a good start for the bloodthirsty kings but gaming gladiators will go ahead and try and take up this orange buff with no contest yeah, I mean, it's a 1k gold lead for the side of the Bloodthirsty Kings. They're able to get the retribution on the objective. No kills are on the board. But once again, BTK have the early game advantage. And this might be what they need to kind of snowball into the game. They don't have to get a lot of the kills, but definitely a small gold lead can boost them into a winning advantage, especially when it comes down to that mid and that late game where, you know, all the kills are important. The kills, or the, the scoreboard is, you know, available and they have a lot more gold to kind of deal the damage that they need to win in a lot of these team fights. Yeah, and I think the Akai, I mentioned that, like I said, I had a hunch that, that was gonna be the jungler selected. 
for the Bloodthirsty Kings because he just works really well with the play style that BTK kind of goes for. And honestly, it's a good counter for how Gaming Gladiators tries to shut down that play style. They can't really mm. stop him with the CC. As soon as he procs that uh, heavy spin, when you see that uh, turtle getting very low, it's pretty much a 50-50 retro between him and uh, best player at that point. Honestly, working more in Zane's favor. It's Chicken. We'll get first blood, though. It's going to find Milo in the 1v1 trade on the bot side. Cold World. Very low, needs to get back to safety. Looks like he will be able to get there as Zane will be able to kite off the team of GG. Yeah, and I kind of wanted to say that Bloodthirsty Kings, they have a gold lead onto the gold side. They have a gold lead in the wrong position, but now the XP gets taken out in a one versus one situation. And this is a Lapu Lapu first pick before the export comes through and losing that one versus one is huge right so btk now on the back end of things again the xp is losing the gold is Ooh. winning but it's completely neutralized by the kill that chicken has on milo you see that sniper damage over there from nicolette great astro echo placement as well chicken though over there on the turtle pit looks like they're going to try and claim a turtle for their own lost the last one of moba zane with that heavy spin pin on the wall there goes the heavy spin again chicken no We'll get the turtle for Game of Gladiators. No retribution needed. Able to outdo Moba Zane right there. And best player. And GG. Able to even out the turtles. I feel like this game for BTK is a very, you know, a, a mental game to go against GG, right? Both of the teams have all-star players that have done so well in a lot of these tournaments. So both of these teams have the ability to win against each other. But it seems like they're just able to get beat, they're able to get Zane kind of off of his game and you know with the turtle steal right there it's very uncharacteristic for zane to miss a retry just like that and you know the side of gaming glider is able to capitalize and get another kill onto the bot side yeah if you look best player rotated around helped out fried chicken to shut down milo overwhelming him and claiming that turret top side though btk they decided to trade in by going in for that orange buff but also they took the turret on the top side as well so both teams having the map advantage right now an 800 gold lead for the side of gaming gladiators but pretty much an even scoreboard this is just going to boil down to this next turtle spawning in and also uh the mid lane turret who can kind of claim victorious to open up the map in their favor yeah and i kind of want to give credit to the brody there he's able to take out that top side tower and he has the early game advantage you can take a look at the farm it's already almost like a 600 700 gold lead for basic there so definitely a very strong opening by the side of btk but they are lacking in other places right milo has been denied twice already look at his gold it's almost 1.5 2k down from the opposite side where chicken is in the lead of gold of the whole entire gaming gladiators team but you are going to see basic ahead by 500 gold up against zia to make up for it on the bot side though the siege four the tier one turret on the way from the side of btk but now a little bit of resistance is gaming gladiators is going to push through with the numbers heavy spin from moba zane trying to push them back boom we'll find basic moba zane not able to get back oh wait a second the guiding win last second from cold world to keep <laughs> Moba Zane alive. You had the saving grace coming out from Cold World, able to get Moba Zane out of a situation. I thought Basic was gonna get alive, but no, Chicken says no. <laughs> Zane, get back into the base. He's able to use the bravest fighter stance along with the flicker to shut down Moba Zane once again. Chicken, just out <laughs> for blood right there. Out for a bloodthirsty king as he finds Moba Zane. Turtle will go to the Gaming Gladiators in their favor to give them a slight advantage. Now up by 2,500 gold. We kind of talked about it, right? Those small steps lead to a mile for GG if you're not careful. And they were once up by 500, now up by 2,500. I feel like all I did was blink and that <laughs> happened, which will put BTK at a slight deficit. They need to be careful. I mean, they do have Moba Zane running on the Sakai. They definitely can take the next neutral objectives that do spawn in. But the gold and the jungle and turrets are now in GG's favor. Yeah, but I still think BTK is holding on quite well in terms of their tower. And they still have the early game advantage for the Brody. So maybe look for a team fight. But at the same time, Gaming Gladiators has done so well in a lot of these engagement. And take a look at this here. Yeah, Corwell should be able to get out of there. He does have the circling eagle. He's being like whales. Oh, close call. Moba Zane, he's pushing him back into Corwell. Though, needs to be careful. Best player. May try and close the distance. Stun inside of the tier 2 turret. Corwell will be able to get back to safety. Gaming Gladiators still maintaining a presence inside of the jungle so far, trying to possibly open up another opportunity for a turret in the Taken. They're now up by 3,000 gold.
Yeah, and gaming gladiators, they've just been playing this series quite well. Like, they get the disengage that they're looking for. They don't overextend on any of these fights. And they make sure that they're playing to their comp's greatest strength, which is going to be that carry. And also that trio mid that got that MVP early on in this series. And this time around, Hoon has done a great job. Shark, you know, has gone zero death. And also Zia has been able to farm onto that late game without dying against a, you know, a Brody, which has quite honestly the counter and a significant advantage early on but this time around carry look at his gold he's now back in favor now up against the brody on the other side yeah and i mean you're looking at chicken off to a great start highest kills in the game three zero and one doing a little bit better than below on this exporg in the xp lane i mean it could be credit to that additional turret that or turtle they have but i mean still off to a good start, leading the way. I mean, he did find a kill on the Mobile Zane after that uh, saving grace that we saw, that guiding wind from Cold World. A little bit of that wasted opportunity to go back to safety. Now you are looking at Gaming Gladiators trying to pull the aggro of the store, but a contest from the Bloodthirsty Kings. Yeah, and the Lord is coming down half HP. The Concealed Plague being popped by the side of Gaming Gladiators and the initiation from Cold World Ooh. here. Mobile Zane trying to wrap around, trying to get a pin, connects on the Shark, but he's able to get out of there last minute. Basic? Before BTK can shut him down. Basic, though, torn apart. Memories is going to find best player. Mission accomplished. No retribution for GG. But look at Chicken wrapping around. He was able to take that turtle earlier in the game. No way. They don't know he's there. Justice blades out. No, he's not going to go in. He knows that may be a little bit more than he can handle. And Moba Zane with the retribution claims the objective for the Bloodthirsty Kings as they get the Lord. And this is what BTK really needs, right? He really needs basic to be able to deal damage early on because the timing that GG has is that late game carry. And if Milo, if basic is able to do something, it might good, but Milo here looking to push out the members of GG. They have the Lord marching down on the top side. The whole entire bot is completely cleared. BTK having a strong performance in this game too. Yeah, definitely having a stronger performance as they are trying to turn this back in their favor, trying to claim game number two to even out the series. Basic will take a major objective, claims the tier one turret in the mid lane. But they are very low, need to kind of disengage. Astro Echo out from Nicolette, connecting to the full team of gaming gladiators as we are going to see the Lord marching toward that tier two turret. And last insanity from Milo, able to claim it, got what they came for, but do they go in for a little more? No, I think the disengage is quite good for the side of BTK. They definitely bit off quite a bit, not more than they can chew since all of them has chose to disengage. Now the mid side does have a little bit of minions. The side of BTK could look to siege, but the side of Gaming Gladiators should be able to protect that, no problem. Ooh, Zane taking a lot of damage, but the Mathilda play from Cold World and the Guiding win gets him out of the tier two turret and a kill on the way is basic. Torn apart memory on to Chicken. We'll go ahead and burst him down. And they are going to continue to maintain their pressure in Gaming Gladiator's jungle. Is this the upset that we're looking at? Because it's a 1k gold lead, right? The side of Gaming Gladiators, they had a 2k gold lead up. But now this time around, BTK is able to turn things in their favor. Brody already up 300 gold. And, you know, this has been a hero that traditionally does not do well in terms of the late game, especially when you deal up against the true damage that the carry has. But the Brody, especially if he has an early game advantage, even if he has a little bit to lead, he's able to deal tons more damage, especially when the carry is not on full item. So this is the time that PTK shines and they're definitely shining at this moment. Yeah, looking brighter than ever. Can they keep up this momentum as they are seeing a little bit of pushback from the side of Gaming Gladiators. Circling Eagle connecting. Last Sanity from Milo on the best player. Basic will be able to get the kill yet again. Wow. Now 3, 1, and 0 leading the way up against Zia who has yet to pick up a kill this entire game. Do you see how many times the Circling Eagle has saved the members from BTK? Like, he's able to give, you know, displaced members of BTK and pull them out of bad position. And this is kind of due to the lack of CC that GG has currently. They have the Shark, they have the Ruby, but it's not like the Fredron set that they had before. They have a Boxia this time around, which provides a lot of utility, a lot of ability to get these objectives, especially in winning matchups. But when it comes down to getting some advantage in terms of the losing, the heavy spin impact that provides a little bit of CC has been quite overwhelming. I mean, Ooh. honestly, and even with the Novaria coming unchecked this game, it's quite hard for GG's to even make a good move in the series. 
Yeah, it's putting them in an awkward binding right there. I mean, mm -hmm. you did mention it right there. Moba Zane running with that heavy spin has been a problem. And then he's very comfortable. He's not afraid to overextend with the Akai because he knows Cold World has his back with the guiding wind when things get a little tricky. I mean, time and time again, you mentioned these Mathilda plays saving the members of the Bloodthirsty Kings when things look mm -hmm. a little tricky. And that goes to show why she's usually banned out. I mean, this is what BTK needs to be able to even out the series. And they're performing way better the game number one it was a 2500 gold lead from game gladiators but now btk is leading by 600 gold mobazane in position for retribution gaming gladiators looking to contest yeah this is a huge play coming off of btk i'm not sure how they're gonna be looking to play this out but definitely they want to they want chicken to be able to use his ultimates beforehand but it looks like they're looking to go in the lord is marching down this so low here no i don't think they'll be able to close the distance mobazane will be able to get the retribution in time the Lord has gone into the hands of the Bloodthirsty King's Chicken. May fall, pinned on the wall, and Basic finds his fourth kill of the game to shut him down. BTK looking to take us to a game three. Yeah, 2K gold lead, 14 minutes, and the Lord is going to be marching down on the top or the bottom side. It's going to be good news for the side of BTK looking to siege in their inner tower. Now, basic on this Brody, this is kind of the question of the day. Is he going to have enough damage to be able to push the members of Gaming Gladiators out? Because quite honestly, Brody, his skill is going to stop quite soon, especially since he's almost onto that full build. He's got the Demon Hunter sword for a little bit more late game Ooh. damage, looking to build up for that wind and has the anti-heal so definitely he has the ability to deal tons of damage but once again carry has the malefic roar he's looking to skill onto that late game but the cc provided by moba zane might just be too much to handle for the side of gaming gladiator to be able to defend under these inner towers that's right in the battle push versus pull will be on the way btk pushing through trying to open up the base for gaming gladiators who's left on the defense and stripped down to their inhibitor turrets now all the hard work Chicken did on this Lapu Lapu was kind of undone by the hard work of yep. Basic with the 4-1-0 and zero on the Brody. Zia needing to find a way to step up to the plate and deal the damage necessary to burst down the Bloodthirsty Kings. Best player, very low. Hit very hard. Astro Echo from Nicolette doing a great job. Slowing down the team of Gaming Gladiators and enhancing the damage output to them for the Bloodthirsty Kings. Having such a strong impact on this Navaria. And this is exactly what we've all kind of been waiting for as kind of the viewers or the casters here is the rise of the BTK, right? And, you know, quite honestly, they haven't had the best performance, especially during week one. But now it definitely seems like they've put the pedal on the gas and they're kind of pushing up for a momentum. They're quite, you know, honestly on par with gaming gladiators in this game. And quite honestly, they've banned out like three, four of Moba Zane's heroes. So this time around, you know, BTK is able to kind of get the up in these team fights. Even with Milo dying left and right, it seems like basic on this Brody just provides so much early game damage that BTK is just able to get a few of these winning pickoffs and able to kind of convert that into some real estate. You know, it's amazing that it's only four to four on the scoreboard 16 minutes in <laughs> we're under double digits right now ua both sides playing full objective focused and doing a great job on top of that but btk able to maintain the pressure on the map and doing it a little bit better than gaming gladiators so far for game number two i mean they have a lot more on the line with this match right this is match point if they lose this it's a clean sweep from gg they want to be able to get higher on that ladder and if they can shut down gg they may be able to make the deficit of losing to area 77 in day one as you are going to see this lord spawn in mobile zane in position for another retribution the last lord we saw best player having a hard time closing that distance and zane able to get it with little to no contest yeah but we're sl we're slowing to see kind of the scale of gg right the lapu lapu isn't as effective as it should be especially when you go into that mid game the export is going to scale quite Ooh. well novaria also scaling quite well but the, the initiation coming through from gaming gladiators some ultimates has been used and i think btk has a little bit more utility especially pairing this matilda and also the range coming out from novaria the longer these team fights go i think btk is going to have a much better standing to get the pick off that they've been looking for yeah, Milo able to get that Faraga armor to harass the side oh, again. Milo. Gladiators, Astro Echo is going to connect from Nicolette. Luminous Lord now in play. Best player! Very low torn apart memories! Basic! Eyes on the prize! High value target is going to find best player, which means BTK 
we'll be able to claim this Lord uncontested. Yeah, see, so people should be picking up this Brody quite often. It's not only a lane bully, but when you when you have all the items, when you're able to get onto that mid and late game, especially with a hero like Brody, you still have the opportunity to deal a lot of damage late game, and especially getting those last hit pickoffs. And you know, this time around, BTK looking for another engagement. Zia way far outside of the protection from his team, getting bursted down, even though he has the damage. Not able to find a kill, and now an opportunity for BTK to even out the series. Takes the inhibitor for the top side. They have a Luminous Lord marching on the bottom as well, and it looks like they're going to sink these lanes. Yeah, no basic, but no Zia on the opponent's side. It is 25 seconds until Zia comes up. The Lord is going to be marching down. So the side of BDK, they have to look to see if they can get initiation onto the mid side. And look at Milo going in on Hoon. Yeah, they have 15 seconds before Zia spawns in and looks like BTK is going to go in to try and close it out. They did lose basic though, which is going to limit their push potential. Best player trying to get out of there, back to the base, able to get the region just in time. Luminous Lord hitting the base, Crystal Chicken fighting, trying to take down Mobazay and Cold World and also Milo by himself. Nicolette will be able to claim the last standing inhibitor for the mid lane and the base has been completely open for gaming gladiators. Now, this is a huge push coming out from BTK. They're able to take out their mid turret, which is pretty much the last inner inhibitor that the side of GG has. Now, BTK, they have lots of late game insurance. All the, their, their whole entire mid tower is still up top and bottom outer towers are still available. So for the side of BTK, even if they were to lose maybe a few of their members, they should be able to defend quite well. Now, for the side of gaming gladiators, unfortunately, they do not have any more insurance available. And take a look at kind of the the team fight that is being available, BTK has picked off multiple members of Gaming Gladiators, you know, time after time. And it just seems like the Akai with the heavy spin along with the Brody early game damage, the Matilda, the saving grace and, you know, the win and also the Navaria. It's extremely hard to deal against the, the standings that BTK has for uh, Gaming Gladiators, quite honestly. Hoon just picked up that Winter Truncheon too, so he has... A little bit of a trick up his sleeve over there up against BTK when they do fight this out. Looks like they're prepping for a final engagement. Both sides playing it safe, knowing not to overextend by themselves. But look at the bot side. I mean, look how far Zia is. I don't oh, really know scary. if that's the move right there because Shark by himself, if BTK can sniff them out, I don't think they can get out of this UA. Here it goes. Oh. Insane. Look at him. Where's Waldo over here looking for every bush <laughs> trying to find him? I'm not even sure if it's a good idea for them to try and sniff out the bot side because quite honestly, the K should be able to burst out anyone that comes, even if it's just a MOBA Zane, right? So the side of BTK, they kind of have to tag along two with two, but I feel like even if it's like two on two, you know, the carry and the Ruby should be able to burst out any single person that comes in play. But now they see that Zia's on the bot side. BTK looking to engage onto the Lord and they're looking like they're getting the team fight that they're looking for. Ooh, last sanity goes out. Torn apart memories as well. Milo will find Shark. They are down one member, but without the torn apart memories, it may be a counterplay from the side of Game Gladiators. Even Zayn using the heavy spin, catching best player, but he's able to wrap around. Maybe a misplay from the side of BTK if they're not careful. Chicken, Immortality has been procked inside of the full team of BTK. Use the winner, Trunchy, and Nicolette with the snipe to shut him down. Execution style in BTK will regain their composure in the Lord Pit, but they're going oh. in for body. Zia! Hit with the snipe, Nicolette trying to get another kill. Forced to go back to the base. Still getting burned over there with the damage. And it looks like Bloodthirsty Kings, they don't want the Lord. They'll, they want the game ender. They want to take this to a game number three, and they may be able to do that just yet. Nicolette will go ahead and shut down best player Hoon and Zia by themselves against the full team of the Bloodthirsty Kings. Can they hold them off? Hoon back to the base, forcing region. Zia hit with the knockup, but down goes the base. Crystal! And BTK is taking us to a game number three against Gaming Gladiators. Oh, this is the exciting match that we've been all waiting for. BTK able to get victorious on this second game of the Vesta 3 series, putting it to a one-to-one -one against pretty much the strongest team in North America. And I definitely feel like if there's any team that's able to kind of upset this rival, it's definitely going to be BTK, especially with the all-star lineup that they have.
10, 5, and 34 is the overall team KD. And you can look at the assists across the board. That is a lot of assists for the side of the Kings. I love seeing series go to a game number three in a great way to kind of end the last series for the day of the most anticipated match between the two powerhouse teams of North America. BTK showing up, stepping up to the plate and performing, shutting down Game and Gladiators, finding a way to deny them on their game plan for Moba Zane with the crowd control. Pull out the Akai, pull out the Mathilda combination, and you kind of got a best of everything you need to be able to be a bully on the neutral objectives. And that's what we've seen right there is Moba Zane able to claim these turrets, these turtles, these lords, and also BTK able to close out this game to take us to game number three up against GG. Yeah, and if you take a look at all the members for BTK, they've all made a significant impact in that game. Milo dying twice early on, able to get a lot of shutdowns, especially onto that late game. Nicolette, again, zero deaths. We talked about this Novaria being a problem in especially the utility dominated jungler drafts. And Novaria definitely is extremely annoying here. I don't think the Novaria is going to be available on the very third game. Basic is going to be the one that is the rich guy. And you know, the impact that he had on the Brody, especially early on, able to pick kills after kills, especially since he had so much kill pressure onto the gold lane. The sandbag goes to Moba Zane on the Akai, definitely well-deserved, tanked up, soaked up so much damage and was able to get a few of those retributions coming off. And when we talked about Cold World, right? He was able to use the guiding win to kind to defend and uh you know displace moba zane to put him in a much safer position now take a look at the team fight heart participation across the board for the side of btk 90 percent for basic 90 percent for nicolette and a hundred percent for mr cole world yeah 10 to 5 on the scoreboard to finish that out as well massive damage taken over there mostly from uh, moba zane over there for btk on the other side best player you know on that box you pick up and honestly i feel like with the way that draft kind of worked out, I've, Gaming Gladiators put themselves in a pinch, right? They allowed them to get the Navaria, they allowed them to get the Mathilda, and then they allowed Moba Zane to get a hero that they can't bully with crowd control because he has the heavy spin. And that's what really worked out in their favor, not only to keep Moba Zane alive, but some great rotation, some great focus on the objectives is what made the difference for Bloodthirsty Kings in game number two. Now, was it finding the needle in the haystack though, UA? Was it the <laughs> fact that they were able to pull off that almost godly composition that works really on BTK's play style. Can they get that again? Because I don't see Gaming Gladiators allowing them to get a Mathilda and an Akai combination again. I think if they lost the Mathilda and just had the Akai, it would be a little bit harder. Or if they lost the Akai and had the Mathilda, it'd be a little bit harder because they need the Akai to be able to engage and take the neutral objectives, but they need somebody to be able to get them out to safety at the end of it. And speaking of safety, some amazing matches already on the boards so far for the final series of the day. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the replays from the last game that we just saw between BTK and Gaming Gladiators. Yeah, again, Milo right here creating the impact, especially early on, soaking up so much damage here. He, his Alraga armor got taken off, but I honestly felt like Chicken kind of outplayed himself, especially towards this mid to late game, right? He was kind of kind of go into the back line, but he was just getting punished back to back. But when you take a look at BTK's draft, you talked about the haystack, the, the needle in the haystack. I don't think it is all luck, right? The Brody that does well against carry pretty much provided the damage that the side of BTK was looking to have, right? The Novaria also is a great matchup to go against the Vexana onto the mid side, has the mobility, has the range to outrange the uh, Vexana. And if you take a look at the damage dealt onto that hero, you can't see the bar once again. So it, it's providing kind of the same exact picture that we've seen kind of in game one, but it is just a reverse, right? Basic picking up that early game marksman dominating in his lane. Novaria also winning in that matchup. You could argue that the 50-50 between best player on the Barats, uh, on the Boxia and the Akai is quite even, but I think we're going into the draft here, Weezy. Third game? That's right, game number three, final game of the day between North America's powerhouse teams, Gaming Gladiators and the Bloodthirsty Kings. The only time we'll see these two face off in the regular season, may be able to see them again in the playoffs, possibly the grand finals if both sides are lucky. But luck has nothing to do with it it's definitely going to be execution and that's what these teams are doing today executing btk not able to claim game one gaming gladiators taking it away from them with their very smooth finish but game number two 
able to find their momentum, their proper footing in BTK, even in out this, this series. Now, I know we kind of had our opinions about, is that the needle in the haystack? Is it luck? Can it happen again? From what it sounds like with what you were saying, you believe it can. From what I believe, I think it can too, but a couple of things have to be checked off the board. Number one, Zane has to find a jungler that can get to these neutral objectives. The reason being is these turtles is what adds up to the side laners winning, right? That's what helps Chicken get online. That's what helps Basic get online. That's what helps Milo get online. That's what helps Zia get online. And these are the players that make up the difference when it comes to the engagements, the split pushing, and the damage needed for the 5v5 engagements. I think Gaming Gladiators put themselves in a pinch. They allowed the Mathilda to walk. They allowed the Akai to walk, which allowed Zayn to take these neutral objectives and play for what he's more known for, being that bully inside the jungle. Now, does he pick up the Akai again? Possibly. They don't have first pick, though, which will put him in a little bit of a bind. If they let the Mathilda walk, I could see Gaming Gladiators possibly taking this up. I don't think they'll let BTK have that, and it should be a possible ban uh, for the, to finish off the first phase for BTK. Yeah, well, the Navaria gets taken off the board. The Fredrin is still available. This is what the GG strategy was during game one, is picking up the Fredrin quite early. And honestly, since BTK is dropped, it's still the same bands here. They take, they, they, they took off the Joy. They took off the Nolan. It's quite traditional here coming through. But I would say this, though. This is a tricky situation where do we want Zia to go on the carry once again? He didn't get a kill on this game two, but he dominated during game one. So maybe we give the carry again. Maybe we pick up the early game marksman. Once again, it is still the same exact opening. Best player able to pick up this Fredrin, but I think this time BTK has a lot more steam in their arsenal. I think the Ruby can be a good pickup. The Navaria already gets banned out. So maybe the Fairmus or the Vexana could be an early pickup. Or the Mathilda and the Akai instant lock-in from the side of PTK because they pick up the Frenchman. <laughs> what is going on right now? I mean, hey, if they're not going to ban it, you might as well just pick that up, bro. Honestly, I really think that helped them so much in that game and it would work out again right here. Yes, you have some other additional options on the table. The Vexana could be a strong pickup, but you might actually just let that walk. No, they're going to go in for the carry, though. And the Mathilda combination. Okay, at least they got the Mathilda here, which is going to guarantee them safety when it comes to Zane being aggressive with these frontline composition junglers. For the side of Game of Gladiators, though, I mean, they had the uh, carry last game, and Zia, he just didn't really step up to the uh, platform to be able to fight it out. I really didn't see Zia having a heavy impact in majority of that game. There's a lot of overextensions. He was trying to burst them down from the bush, and even when they tried to get a backdoor play on the bot side, it was just a little awkward with not having the proper positioning. As soon as they saw Zia down, they're like, okay, free Lord. They're missing a member, and they're able to make the most out of the situation. So jumping into this game, maybe getting Zia online should be the focus for Game of Gladiators as they are going to go ahead and finish their first phase of this draft, picking up the CC alongside Ooh. the Valentina. I'm scared here because I do think the counter to the CC is going to be the x -Borg, right? But if they want to have the set potential, Matilda is not going to be the one that pins down anything for basic. It's going to be something like the Akai, right? But they have to choose. Either they take the Akai, ban the x -Borg, or it's going to be the vice versa. And there's also mages that are available, right? You could grab the Faramis early on. You could grab the Vexana. But again, if these heroes are not being picked up by PTK, they're going to get banned out by the side of GGN. This is a very tough situation the akai Ooh. gets picked up i think that's a good response because that does help the carry so much more and we saw from the side of gg carry was unable to get a kill off in the game too but this time around with the akai pinning down it might just smell trouble for the side of gg to be able to deal with the single target damage that the carry has but this works in Gaming Gladiator's favor, though, because they have the Valentina. So now they have the mm. Heavy Spin, and that was a staple of what helped BTK take the neutral objectives. So I think this is a good start for Gaming Gladiators inside of this draft. Now it's just going to be a battle of who uses that Heavy Spin first, and that's what Hoon's going to be looking out for. He's just going to wait for Mobazane to use the Heavy Spin, and then he's going to do it right after him, or, if anything, at the same time for these engagements, which is going to be a little bit more challenging for the Bloodthirsty Kings jumping into game number three. I think it's a good read from the side of gaming gladiators to be able to put a little bit more contest on the neutral objectives. But I do want to stress a little bit on in terms of the winning matchups and the winning lanes, right? If GG is, you know, using the same strategy that BTK used in game two, they're going to pick up the Brody. They're going to pick up the Herod, which does traditionally well against the carry. But no, 
they actually allow the Harith and the Brody to be options of Zia. They do take away the Exia, so that's something that maybe uh, Zia likes to play against the carry. The Arlot's export gets taken off the board. The Yuzong is still available. The Terizla, which does really well against um, the back lines and the front lines of Gaming Glider, is going to be a potential. Nicolette, with no mages being banned on the board, picks up the Faramis. That's going to be a strong dual mid, mm. especially since Valentine. Valentina doesn't have the best clear early on. Yeah, and it puts Valentina in a bind where do you go for the Nether Realm or do you go for the heavy spin for these neutral objectives? But you can't get both of them. You are gonna look mm -hmm. at Zia picking up this Brody. This is gonna be a Brody versus a carry again, similar to game number two, but it's gonna be on the opposite side of the table for both teams. This time Zia is not the carry. He will be the Brody. He didn't have a strong impact on the carry, and maybe this is the difference. Can we see basic though? have the impact in the carry that Zia did it for game number two. One more pick on the board for both sides. Now, they run in the double support method for BTK. That's kind of like a hit or miss in my opinion. We see it on the international scene, sometimes work, sometimes not. But in the NA scene, it hasn't really been as promising. Honestly, I want to say most of the time we've seen a double support meta, it just really hasn't worked out uh, because there's just not that much damage anymore. When you're going in for um, a Mathilda and a Faramis and then an Akai who's not really that heavy of a hitter himself, it puts a lot of pressure on Basic to kind of bring that damage to the table. And if he falls behind on these neutral objectives, if BTK does not get these turtles, then it's going to take even longer for basic to deal the damage necessary that btk is going to be relying on you know i do want to see a terizla coming out from my low the side of gaming gladiators do not have kind of the true damage shred the export that counters the terizla the uh carry that counters it but no milo is going to pick up this dragon now the draft coming from both sides is quite interesting here zia grabs up the the, the brody deals you know quite good against the carry and also has torn apart memory to deal a lot of aoe damage to go against the faramis once again you talked about the hoon matchup where he has to decide between the cold altar or the heavy spin there but cc i feel like is a raw element that might be able to kind of carry the game since i don't actually know if yuzong should be able to handle fried chicken on this hero but both drafts has been locked in shark picks up the minotaur that has been banned multiple times in today and i feel like that might be very very tough for the side of btk to handle because that is an aoe knockup that can kind of uh you know keep the uh cold altar the heavy spin and also the black dragon at bay you know i love seeing series go to a game number three regardless of who <laughs> wins this one man i'm just excited that we're able to get to this point as we are now jumping into the final match of the day the bloodthirsty kings up against game and gladiators btk able to take game number two gg victorious in game number one but hey we're just getting started as match three has officially began who will be able to claim victory in this series and once again btk is going to be the underdog in this series but they had a great game too and quite honestly the game one opening was also quite good for the side of btk so it definitely feels like they understand how to deal with the aggressiveness coming out from gaming gladiators and even give them a small lead up to an advantage but for the side of gaming gladiators they have to hold strong right this is a team that has done so well pretty much throughout the whole entire tournament and now they are faced with a potential loss against the, the the late kings that have that that they have done so well to deal against here yeah we are gonna have to kind of pay attention to shark though over there on this minotaur he is gonna have the minoan fury for the knockup which is gonna keep zane in his tracks even when he tries to go in for that heavy spin on the neutral objectives on top of having hoon who's running the valentina with the heavy spin at his disposal i think it would be better for him to pick up the heavy spin instead of the uh, nether realm but I, I feel like it's just gonna be situationally dependent on what's uh there for the taking when it comes to the neutral engagement, so maybe the heavy spin just to zone out BTK will be his game plan, unless he's going to play for survivability. In that case, it could give BTK the advantage to be able to get these neutral objectives. But we are seeing Zia and Basic on the bot side, a flip around of the carry and the Brody. Now, how will this play out, right? Both of them has the damage necessary for the late game, but Zia will be able to survive a little bit better. Having that Corrosive Strike, having that Flicker at his disposal, whereas Basic's going to be a little bit more stationary. He didn't even go in for the Flicker. He went in for the Purify instead. Looks like he's worried a little bit about that uh, crowd control provided by Shark. 
Yeah, and I'm a little bit scared for the carry versus the Brody matchup, right? The Brody has dominated pretty much that whole entire lane, and he's even able to kind of get a late game advantage if he is looking for four. So, like, you know, the Brody is quite strong, and we were seeing some early game marksmen like the Bruno dominating into that gold side. So, I definitely feel like Zia has a great chance onto the bot side, but the turtle is now started for the side of gaming gladiators. This time, BTK not even looking to contest on the neutral objective yeah they need to be careful though is this is what gaming gladiators wants they know they can snowball if they continue to take these turtles then they'll be able to pretty much have an advantage on the side lanes with the xp boost provided as you are looking at zia who can play a little bit more aggressive on the brody you stack up some gold on top of that and it'll give basic a harder time yeah, definitely a harder time for the side of basic onto the gold lane, but this is a matchup that he is quite familiar with. Now, if we take a look at the mid side, right? Hoon has the black dragon for and so no utilities for the side of gaming gladiators, but I don't think a team fight is going to break out yet. So it's going to be interesting to see how this black dragon comes through. But again, onto the bot side, you can see that Zia is having a much greater time shoving the lane, has the gold advantage, has the XP advantage over basic and it's already a level difference now you know zia with the brody especially in terms of the early game has a lot of impact has a lot of kill pressure so the side of btk really have to be careful to make sure that this gold lane matchup does not snowball out of control yeah i mean he does have that black dragon he didn't go in for the heavy spin he didn't go in for the nether realm but in so instead, something else entirely. I wonder if he's going to hold on to that, though, especially with this uh, turtle spawning gun. I mean, yes, he can drop onto the back line if necessary, but needs to be careful as he is a back line himself. Moba Zane, though, mm. pulled back to safety again. This Mathilda and Akai combination proven to work in their favor. Speaking of Mathilda, though, Mathilda Airlines in effect onto Hoon, but is going to disengage back to BTK's jungle. I do want to say that Cold World is extremely good at using the Matilda ult to engage and disengage for his own safety. But Milo, double Petri. Yeah, Hoon caught with a lot of CC and Nicolette will be able to shut him down. First blood for the Bloodthirsty Kings. And that's off to a good start as you are going to see this turtle spawn in and they do have the numbers to take this. Yeah, they do have a small advantage now with that pick off, but it seems like the gold lead is still inside of gaming gladiators favor, right? It's about a 1k gold lead. They're even going to be the one initiating the buffs up. So definitely it seems like gaming gladiators, they have a much stronger opening. The Fredrin paired up with the knockup coming out from the Minotaur is just a little bit too much to handle for the side of BTK, especially in the early game objectives. And there goes Brody showcasing the survivability, a three man gank on the bot side before whom can even get there there and he's still able to find himself alive with that corrosive strike and also that flicker combination which means he is still going to be able to sustain himself on the bot side turtle will go to the gaming gladiators the second turtle of the game uncontested in their hands yeah but the gold lead is still close right we saw gg able to have that 1k gold lead now after the objective it is still onto 1k that just means that basic is able to grab up actually quite a good amount of gold onto the bot side and that is you know quite good for the carry right they have the heavy spin to be able to pin people for the carry to get that free hit but is that going to truly be enough to deal with the frontline presence that the minot and the fredrin has that is a question that we kind of have to ask btk to see if they're willing to show us here yeah and speaking of showcasing some things heavy spin in the mid lane from over zane back to safety he goes now written a lot of benchmarks it's the highest anticipated game of the nact spring season so far and for 2024 nact spring regular season we have hit our highest peak concurrent viewers over 15,000 viewers make sure you guys Ooh. leave a like and share the stream and cheer on your favorite team yeah it's definitely the match to watch for and especially since we're going on to a game three a very classic game and zia oh. here oh. looking to get bursted oh. down <laughs> Yeah, one for one trade, though, is basic will fall. Both marksmen losing out on that engagement. Zia gets an assist, but basic gets a kill, which means he is going to be favored a little bit more on that trade off. Yeah, do we call that kind of like the Dragon Ball Z where both members kind of kill each other? <laughs> but again, you know, the side of BTK, they have the ability to deal a lot of damage. And we haven't seen, especially in the series, that the carry is you know that significant of a pick right the brody deals quite well especially in the one versus one position there's plenty of great early game marksman but zane 
gets denied away with the buff there. He has the retribution. Uh, the retribution is coming up in 15 seconds. And best player also has retribution here available. All right, UA. We said it, right? These turtles are going to start adding up. Once they get this third turtle for Gaming Gladiators, if BTK does not find a test, then it's going to be a, a hard time. And it looks like they are finding one, though. Look at the bot side. You are looking at basic stripping down the turret. We'll be able to find that in BTK's favor, which means they did find a proper trade-off to work in their favor. Yeah, but look at the gold lead. Like, it's literally nothing compared to, you know, both of the members. And another guiding win saving the Akai from a bad situation. Cold World really standing up to the, the, the tanking ability that Shark has. Like, it's definitely, you know, one for one here in terms of the roam position. Like, both of them are making significant impacts. And, you know, it's quite hard for Shark to, you know, deny a lot of the utilities coming out from Cold World here. So, BTK quite in a good standing here they have the bot side tower it has been traded but basic has the time to kind of scale quite well here in the mid game yeah and speaking of scaling black dragon from milo Ooh. trying to seize the opportunity double petrify basic we'll find zia another realm keeping btk alive moba zane will shut down hoon two for none trade btk stampeding through may be able to take this mid turret with the advantage of the separation or a top side they need to get some more real estate on the map is right now gg has a slight advantage since they have two turtles up against them, up by 700 gold. Yeah, and I think it's quite interesting here that Hoon hasn't really picked up the Nether Realm versus the side of BTK. The Nether Realm has been quite impactful in a lot of these team fights. So I do think it's time for Hoon to kind of step up to the plate and deal with the aggressiveness that Nicolette has because right now Nicolette is playing a much better mage than uh, Hoon there. But top side here, basic looking to engage. No and Fury does get procced by Shark, not gonna knock up any members of BTK. Milo will take down Fried Chicken. Now the seize of opportunity. Basic will claim the tier one turret. BTK getting what they came for, but Mopa Zane needing to get out of there. Hit with a little bit of CC, but oh saved God. by the guiding win provided by Cold World. It's just the guiding win from Cold World is just looking so good. And look at the zone coming out from the backside. Cold World actually doesn't have that much armor or defense. And he only has, oh, the, the bonk comes through. Yeah, but Basic able to claim the tier 1 turret in the mid lane. BTK inching their way up the map against Gaming Gladiators now are leading in terms of gold and in terms of turrets on the map up by 2. Stripping down Gaming Gladiators to their tier 2 turrets and controlling the early phases. We are now hitting close to that 10 minute mark. Lord is in play. Gaming Gladiators has been able to take majority of these neutral objectives as BTK has been able to claim the turrets. But who will be able to claim this first Lord? Yeah, and you know, the side of BTK, they're kind of playing this bully ball formation, right? They group up as a five man, they get the picks that they're looking for, and they're able to siege up pretty much any objective they are wanting. But the side of gaming gladiators, they're kind of struggling in a lot of these four versus five, five versus five formation, and the circling wind comes through. Yeah, Mathilda Airlines for the knockup. Hoon very low. Milo smells low HP, a shark in the water, out for blood, a terrifying quadruple knockup with the furious dive of the Black Dragon. And Milo, Shaw Essence activated, sustains himself, gets out alive, best player. Very low, uses Appraiser's Wrath onto the side of BTK. Tries to get away, back to safety. The chase though, oh. furious soul grip from Milo, able to take him down. That is gonna be two members falling for Gaming Gladiators. BTK, all five members standing strong. The 7 to 1 scoreboard. The goal lead is still quite close for both teams, but it definitely feels like the side of BTK has the lead in a lot of these team fights. And I honestly feel like it's due to Milo. Milo is playing quite perfectly here. Cold World is going to be the one that's saving grace for the side of BTK, getting some huge sets with the Circling Eagle. And of course, Zane right here, still zero deaths on the board for majority of the players of BTK. They're just team fighting quite well. And the bully ball style, it might be you know in time for zane to kind of turn that leaf getting his heroes back together the akai seems like it's gonna be the right answer to deal with a lot of the aggressiveness that gaming gliders can provide you know this this mathilda and akai combination is giving gaming <laughs> gladiators such a hard time i'm surprised that they let btk do this again with how well they performed in the last match it was like gaming gladiators was confident on possibly having an answer but btk Still kind of outperforming them and scaling a little bit better. There is seven to one right now in terms of uh kills over there for BTK. And oh it looks no, like they're gonna try and climb in for even more. Circling Eagle Moba Zane is gonna ride the guiding win, is gonna proxy the minions as well. Milo a dive in on the fried chicken. 
Praises Wrath from best player. Connecting on a basic. Nicolette very low. Is going to go back. But Cold World able to sustain the team and keep them alive. Yeah, now BTK has the turn to be able to siege onto this mid tower. They had a great entire fight there, but the utilities of both teams are still available. The Purify on Cold World and Basic up for grabs. The Flicker also for the whole entire team of Gaming Gladiator is available, but both teams have not decided to pull the guns now because honestly, the Lord is coming up in 90 seconds. This is going to be a very important Luminous Lord, and the side of BTK seems like they have the map available. They even have Zane onto the boss side and even with Cole world not scared to kind of just zone away some of the members away from their buff away from their jungle providing so much vision for the side of btk to work with and basic all over the map right now three one and three leading the way outscaling zia outclassing at mm. least for the last two games he did it on the brody and now he's doing it on the carry against the brody and doing an amazing job on top of that 3600 goal lead for the side of the bloodthirsty kings as they are now in control of this game at the 12 minute mark it looks like we're going to be playing into a late match here UA, for the final match of the day yeah and this is where it's extremely exciting but again gaming gladiator is one of those teams that is able to get a win in the late game regardless of the scores early on so pdk they definitely still have to hold it tight they cannot just throw and just do their wombo combos without really using their brains like they have to make sure they get the right pickoffs but again i feel like hoon is lacking a little bit in this department but circling wins coming through yeah, Mathilda Airlines, in effect, Heavy Spin is going to go out from Hoon using the IMU against BTK, but is it enough to stop them? Moba Zane on the chase, but now the counterplay from Gaming Gladiators. Minoan Fury for the quadruple knockup. Nether Realm has it's been sustained. knocked out over there from Nicolette to keep them alive. Cold World will find Shark. Down goes the Roman for GG, and now the counter back from the Bloodthirsty King's Chicken. Very low tournament memories from Zia. Finds one, takes down Cold World. A one for one trade. <laughs> a whole entire team fight and it's a one for one trade a beautiful fight coming out from both teams but you can really see the nether realm uh, uh sustain coming out from nicola is just too much to handle you can also see hoon picking up the heavy spin using it early on and you have zane there trying to defend onto that but look at milo right there gets the two-man petrify he's able to get onto the backside picking off hoon multiple times in pretty much all of these team fights here yeah, and the next Lord is in play. Gaming Gladiators in position. Best player trying to bait out BTK to take this fight into the Lord Pit. The last Lord went over to the Bloodthirsty Kings. Gaming Gladiators has been struggling a little bit in the later half of today's match. BTK has been able to find the advantage they're looking for. Speaking of advantage, Lord Very Low, Reggie. Black Dragon from Lilo circling around. is going to drop down for the Petrify. Zane will be able to claim the Lord for the Bloodthirsty Kings. Maybe able to get some bodies to praise the wrath from best player. Is going to connect on to Milo, knocking him airborne, proc the immortality. Cold World, very low himself. Nicolette will find fried chicken. Hoon is going to find Milo to respond. A one-for-one -one trade so far. Zane with a lot of CC. Trap inside of the full team of Game Gladiators. Will pull no back way. Safety from Cold World with the guiding win. Cold World taking all the hits, though. Torn apart memories from Zia to seal his fate. Three members down as Zia finds Moba Zane. A three-for-one trade. Oh, that's a huge turnaround for the side of Gaming Gliders. And once again, it's the Brody Impact, right? The Torn Apart Memory AOE deals so much damage, especially when the members are low on health. And the multiple AOE pretty much counters the uh, the, 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 the Faramis ultimate that's coming through to sustain the members of BTK. And I felt like that was even a small misplay coming out from the side of BTK. Zane was in a great position to kind of just hide in the bush and get that Risa off, but they chose to go for for the risk and the risk did not pay off the side of gaming gladiators now able to clear this luminous lord giving them another chance in this series that's right and now at that 16 minute mark we are getting to the late game right over that 40,000 gold threshold btk up by 2,000, but everybody getting to full build you are looking at basic Doing some damage, Minoan Fury for the knockup on a Nicolette. The silence in effect for Milo. Triple knockup on a BTK, but Basic will find Shark. Not going to stop them on the push. BTK, Milo rotating around. Basic finds a double speedy light wheels. He's going to find best player. BTK looking to claim some real estate. Milo very low, though. Chicken will get the kill. Able to get back to safety as well. BTK looking to siege onto this tier 2 turret in the mid lane. Yeah, a little bit of overaggression coming out from Milo there. You know, he's unable to kind of get the kills that he was looking for, but did pop the Purify of Chicken. Unfortunately, it's still a two-for-one trade for the side of BTK as they look to go ahead and do that bully ball once again. 
able to grab up the mid tower, the top side tower. I'm not sure if they're looking to siege here, but definitely a good push for the side of the Kings. Yeah, I mean, they don't have the minions in play anymore, but they got a lot off of that play, right? Opening up the base, taking down two inhibitors, stripping Game and Gladiators to their last inhibitor on the bot side with half HP and stacking up some kills on top of that. 6 to 11, BTK kind of living up to their name right now. The Bloodthirsty Kings dominating on game number three, the final match of the day up against Game and Gladiators, who needs to find a way to turn this back around. They didn't have an easy time against the Mathilda and Akai combination, and it looks like it's the same thing again for game number three. And I wonder why they kind of let this walk through, knowing that this kind of favors BTK's playing style, and they're performing today. Game and Gladiators, if they want to turn this around, it's really going to start with Hoon. I mean, he has to open up really well with uh, this Valentina. He either needs to go in. I would say I wouldn't even go in for the heavy spin right now, unless they're going to go in to try and close it out for BTK. Then, yeah, you can use the heavy spin to stop the minions. But outside of that, I think it's going to kind of profit him a little bit better now to go in for Nicolette's Nether Realm to keep the team alive. Or if he does go for the heavy spin, possibly get this neutral objective. But he has to be careful as with the late game items, BTK can easily burst down a backline. And you're correct. There's just too much to choose from from the side of Gaming Gladiators to try to pick the ult of BTK, right? I do think the, the sustain coming out, the utility of the Nether Realm is going to be the best option here. But the Black Dragon coming through here. Ooh, he goes in for the nether realm now. Look at Hoon. He picked up the ultimate from Nicolette, but it, does he have enough time to close the distance? They have to go in. Nether realm activated. Who will get this Lord? But no one feared for the quad knock him up against BTK. Lord will be claimed best player with the retribution. Zia finds Zane Basic, finds best player. Zia takes down Milo for the double kill. The siege is not done though. Cold World Basic trying to get back to safety alongside Nicolette. Game and Gladiators putting BTK on their backs for the Lord play, turning this back around in their favor. Is this going to be a comeback for the Gladiators in this series? It, def it definitely looks like there is potential there. They're able to get that team fight in their favor along with the objective. Now, four man going to be marching down onto the mid side here. And I think, you know, Shark had a great ultimate there, able to get a lot of knockups and best player with the retribution, able to take the Lord now in favor for the side of gaming at, uh, Gladiators. It is a three versus four defense. Zane and Milo is coming up but that is going to be before the lord hits onto the bot side tower i don't know if they're going to be able to take this though i mean the lord is going to be bursted down the base is still intact for the side of btk as they were not able to shut down the inhibitors but it makes them a little bit more comfortable now i mean if they would have lost that lord btk could have closed out that game and that just shows <laughs> you that now that we're in the late mark hitting that 20 minute threshold it's going to go down to the wire between who has better micro and macro for these team fights now, it's definitely going to be anyone's game, but BTK still has the advantage in terms of the towers, right? The mid and the bot side tower. They also have a lot of ultimates that Hoon kind of has to pick and choose from. Is it going to be the heavy spin? Is it going to be the nether realm? They have to make a decision here. Oh, circling eagle. Speaking of decisions, Black Dragon, Milo, a little premature. He's going to turn back around. <laughs> Did you see that? He just completely changed his mind like, right no. there. And hey, I don't disagree with him. That's not the fight you want to take right there. And, you know, the side of BTK, they have the circling eagle. It's it's definitely possible that they look for the engagement. But right now, I think it's going to be a bad choice for them to even look to get any part of the map because the Black Dragon is not available. And without that, the gap closing for Milo along with the Petrify is not going to be enough for the side of BTK to get a convincing win here. They got to space out the time, make sure that Milo is able to get the Black Dragon up and available. And the, quite honestly, he can't even look to push onto the bot side, right? The second that they see the Black Dragon on there, they're going to look to find man siege for the side of Gaming Gladiators. And 8 to 12 is the overall scoreboard. 20 minutes in. The gold lead really does not mean too much. What does matter is what ultimate Hoon is willing to take. Yeah, possibly controlling these lanes, right? If you can put some pressure on a split push, possibly, you can gain control of this map on these neutral objectives as you are looking at 20 seconds to this Lord spawns in, and we can pretty much confirm this should be the last Lord of the game for either side. And, it, and I don't even think it's going to boil down to somebody taking this Lord. I think it's just going to boil down to getting the pickoffs and trying to close this out because mm -hmm. the respawn timers are way too high to handle. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. And 
I definitely feel like in terms of the team fight, BTK has a lot more in their arsenal, especially with the Black Dragon Petrify shutting down Hoon almost every opportunity he gets. So definitely we have to watch for Milo to see if he can get onto the backside. Of course, Shark is kind of going to be the tank that goes into the front to deal with the Nether Realm if he's able to get that sustain off. And again, the damage coming out from Brody, it is still immense, but at the same time, we're heading into that late game where a lot of the teammates of BTK has some armor to be able to deal with the turn apart memory that they have. The shark looking to go in here. Yeah, Milo opening it up with the petrified black dragon. Nether realm. Oh, that's a huge. Little early from Hoon. A big play for BTK as they still have it over there for Nicolette if they do want to take this fight. Milo does not have that black dragon though. Looks like Gaming Gladiators, they realize they need that utility back. So they're going to disengage a little bit, but it opens up the opportunity for BTK to take this Lord. I mean, look at Basic already chipping it down, using Speedy Light Wheels, Cold World, Boba Zane, Nicolette, zoning out Gaming Gladiators from finding the opportunity. The taunt on the best player. The knockup, though, the response back. Gaming Gladiators, if they want to have a chance, they need to find a way to get inside of the Lord Pit. But Basic, oh, basic. shifting focus over to best player, finds the jungler. Back to safety, best player goes. Nether Realm activated over there from Nicolette to keep BTK alive. And now it's a small window. They will be able to take this Lord as Gaming Gladiator is not able to close the distance. And with that major objective, a chance for BTK to possibly close out the series. I mean, I don't even see the Lord's HP right now. I'm imagining it's about 25% oh, HP. No. Okay, it is very low. You're gonna see the knockup though, the airborne fly from Milo. Terrified immortality being proc. Lord, not even at the retribution mark yet. Milo will fall Zia. We'll be able to shut him down. Circling Eagle connected. Corrosive Strike from Zia trying to get away from Cold World. And now Gaming Gladiators does have the numbers, but look at the minions already at the base. Crystal taking it down to 50%. Yeah, GG's, they definitely looked for the opportunity there. They knew Nicolette did not have the mana available to cast any spell, so they looked to engage. It was a four versus four situation. And also, uh, you know, in terms of the marksman, it's not available. Basic is on the Whoa! bot side here. So they're looking to get these fights without Basic. Now, it's kind of like the banana split strategy that they're looking for. I'm not sure if that's exactly what BTK needs to, in order to take the wins in these fights. Yeah, and Hoon used the Nether Realm and Owen Fury for the knockup on the BTK. They're going in for it. Basic finds best player. This is big. The Bloodthirsty Kings, a heavy spin on the wall, catching Shark, circling Eagle, Cold Roman, Matilda Airlines connecting. Shark immortality has been procced, but Chicken joining the party. Both sides down, one member, but best player out of the playing field means Game and Gladiators does not have a retribution. Yeah, and now BTK actually gets the rise up, right? 40 seconds for best player. They can kind of take their time, make sure this Lord is sink and it's guaranteed for the side of BTK. And this is huge for the Kings of the Kings here, right? They're getting the upset that they're looking for. It is into that late game where both teams pretty much have to make these high IQ plays. And BTK, it feels like their comp is just slightly better. There's just too much great ultimates that BTK has that, you know, the side of gaming gladiators have to choose and now the Lord is coming down. Yeah, it looks like BTK will be able to claim this with no contest. A big target to be able to close this game. I mean, look how long it took with their <laughs> entire team trying to burst it down with no contest. We would have been sitting there for days if both of these teams would have been fighting it out on a Lord dance. But BTK now having a major advantage to be able to close this out with the Luminous Lord on their side. But it's definitely not still a guaranteed, right? The Lord is going to be marching down. It is going to be a plus one for the side of BTK, but it is coming down onto the mid side. I don't like the Lord typically coming down the mid side. Top and bot definitely feels like it's a much better banana split to split the enemy teams. But we are going into this 25 minutes where pretty much the carry scales onto the maximum potential. The Brody does not have the impact that he has, especially early on. And of course, the Black Dragon form along with the Petrify has been kind of the death of the side of GG. And BTK trying to go in for the game. Ender Milo started early, drops down the Black Dragon. Petrify forcing out the Nether Realm over there from him with the IMU. A lot of mobility on the board and utility being wasted. Boba Zane, heavy spin, catches the best player. Basically, we'll go ahead and shut him down. Speedy Light goes down, goes the Lord though. Game of Gladiators trying to hold him off, not trying to let them to finish off this game. They still have minions to work in their favor though, and they do have the numbers as Game of Gladiators is one short with best player falling. Do they go in for the game ender? Min is on the top, Min is on the bottom, Minions in the mid, and the circling eagle. 
for the connection. Base crystal, 50%. Immortality being proc to Moba Zane. They're not done though. Milo resting with the uh, Furious Dive. Does oh connect my. the shot. Essence, but minions fall. Zia finds Milo, but down goes a base crystal. BTK able to claim the series the reverse sweep against Game and Gladiators. A 14 to 10, 26 minute masterpiece coming out from BTK, able to prove pretty much the whole entire casting desk along with the whole entire North America that they still have it within them. And again, this is a team full of all-stars. I think that they have the ability to take these wins and definitely they did. 14, 10 and 35 in a fashionable way to take the victories of pretty much the undefeated crown in NACT so far, the gaming gladiators fall to the bloodthirsty kings here. Man, what a game. The best <laughs> series of the night. And that was hard to top off because we had some good series today. I don't think anybody is disappointed with the level of capability that both of these teams provide. The high IQ, the macro, the micro. It was all there. BTK, though, able to pull it off and take down gaming gladiators. Their first defeat of this entire NACT spring season into the hands of Bloodthirsty Kings, who did not have the hardest start when they lost to Area 77. But hey, they found the proper footing and took down the top contender in that number one position, which is going to go ahead and boost them up on that ladder in terms of their rankings compared to the other top eight teams in North America. And this just kind of shows about the underdogs of this North, uh, this NACT so far, right? We got Fiends kind of going up in the rise now. BTK finding their momentum against one of the best teams in North America. Pretty much an uprising revolution for any of the underdogs coming through. And BTK leading the way here in this series. Two to one, 14 to 10 is the overall scoreboard. And I feel like all the members from BTK did quite well, right? The, the, the defensive utility that the Matilda provided, the retributions coming out from Zane, Nicolette with the, uh, the, the, the ultimate coming through pretty much impacting the game in such a huge way that it honestly felt like Hoon wasn't even there at the whole entire game. And also Milo, two, five, and nine is the scoreboard, but the Petrify along with the Black Dragon form, especially early on, denying Hoon, denying Zia, hitting multiple members, getting the pickoffs that BTK needed in order for them to get the victory here. Man, that was almost a 30 minute game, longest game of the <laughs> night on top of that. And definitely the most entertaining. BTK, I, if I had to give one player an MVP, man, it'd be really hard to choose between Basic and uh, also Cold World on this Mathilda. I mean, mm -hmm. Basic definitely shined in the last two games with not only the Brody, but also the carry. But the Mathilda saves. I mean, look at the Forgotten One Cold World. The Mathilda saves is what really kept BTK in the game for a lot of these engagements on the neutral objectives. What was Zane taking 300,000 <laughs> damage as the sandbags? the highest I've ever seen. The carry is going to go to basic though over there and then the rich guy for Zia. Yeah, the kill participation across the board is painted quite well. But again, Nicolette, I feel like definitely shined quite well, in, especially in the mid lane matchup and also Cole World, right? But once again, it kind of feels like the draft coming in from both teams, they came out with the same exact draft from all three of the games. But, uh, you know, the, the heroes kind of has been swapped around. And this time around, BTK is able to get that victory. And, you know, you talked about the Matilda arriving in the utility, and I definitely agree with that. That. You know, he was able to save multiple members, Zane, countless of times in this series. And also, you know, Nicolette's called Alter has been so much utilities for the Kings of the Kings. <laughs> well, I'm lost in words. If you can see behind the scenes, I think this game really got me and a lot of the audiences at the edge of our seats. It's the longest game this entire show so far and the, the most viewers for the shows. So definitely something that was unexpected. Nobody predicted this, right? Nobody, none of the casters predicted PTK's comeback, but they did. It really shows that Moba King might be back. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm not even upset that I lost my <laughs> prediction. I'm more just excited. <laughs> for how good of a series that was between both of those teams. I mean, I'm just proud to, to know that if, if it's BTK, if it's Game and Gladiators, whoever represents us on the international level, or if it's any of these other teams in North America, we're looking stronger and we're scaling through the meta. And that, that's what's really important about this. Yeah, and you know, for me, 
it's so exciting to see kind of like the triangle now between all the teams, right? We, we were talking about how BTK lost against A77. This time they took out the best of the teams. This just proves that, you know, none of the teams are unbeatable in this series. And, you know, the dark night is rising. The revolution is starting. All the young kids are coming together and they're taking out some of the crowns of the crowns. Yeah, this is... For many seasons, this is the first time that GG got defeated in the regular season by BTK. For previous seasons, BTK has tried to phase against GG, but wasn't able to make it until like playoff stage or the grand finals. But this time, they're doing it early. They're doing it in the second week of the series. So I can't imagine what happens in the later weeks. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is just a quick showcase of what all these teams are capable of today. Not only just BTK and Game of Gladiators, but all these matches we've seen today were just as in, uh, intense, right? I mean, I can't wait to see them compete as we progress further in that ladder. But with GG taking their first loss, like UA mentioned, it means that there is a possibility for other teams to step up to that totem pole for the number one position. And this is just the beginning. A great show ahead of us as we progress through the regular season. Yeah, no, this is something that we definitely love. Once again, you know, all the underdogs are coming in to perform thirsty for the win. And this time around, the BTK is going to be the one that is leading, right? Leading all these young teams and showing, hey, you know, even with a new team, we could still do it. So if we can do it, a lot of you guys can overtake the crown here. And that is what's so exciting about this NACT here. And to really put this show to the pinnacle, we have an interview with the greatest of all time, Goat Milo. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back, Milo. Me. No, I do not deserve yes, that they title. Can hear you now. I'm sorry to all the BTK fans out there. I'll play better next week. I played horrible today. Why, why, why are you sorry? You did a great performance for, especially the second game. I noticed your your export was crazy. You're putting on the jersey now. So Milo, tell us why why are you sorry? Guys, why are you apologizing? I've been trash talking a lot, then I kind of fed today. I'm sorry. My team won 4v5. What, what can I say? I was useless today. Wow. I'll be I don't know how to feel about that topic. Is that humble or is that showing no, up? No, <laughs> I played. Listen, did you not watch the game? I was feeding half the time. My bad to all the fans out there. We'll do better next week. Well, so congratulations to BTK. Congratulations to your team. And some questions that obviously a lot of fans want to know. So first off, facing against uh, gaming gladiators, facing the team that you guys, that you stayed with, you lived with through Indonesia, through a whole, pretty much a whole year. How does it feel being dropped from that team? And how does it feel now to beat them? What do you mean? I dropped them. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I'm, like, like I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Like it, guys, no. don't clip anything. Nah, I'm kidding again. I mean, it's pretty normal. I don't re I'm not really holding any grudges. I have no enemies. I'm just playing, feeding at the time. Hashtag that's normal. <laughs> it is pretty normal. Mm -hmm. Well, so that, um, I heard from the production that before the, sh the game even started, camera there was a camera war going on. Um, between the two teams, um, what happened there? Is there anything yeah. interesting that you want to share? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Poon is a criminal, guys. Poon is a criminal. He, ta he <laughs> takes like 10 pictures of me every night when I was sleeping next to him. That guy's a criminal. <laughs> Can't and, now, and now those secrets are shared. <laughs> yeah, they were just showing the pictures. Like... Mm -hmm. And now, with this strong victory in week two, compared to that defeat in, in the first week, what do you think it changed in this past week? It was definitely mindset and preparing a lot more. Like, we played for two days this weekend. That's two more days than last weekend, where we went up against A77. Mm -hmm. Zero scrims, zero motivation, zero passion that week. It was a lot of mm -hmm. ego. Um, it was a lot of trash talking, looking down on the enemy team, not really caring. <laughs> We, we got stung, you know? That's you it's a humble. really nice L to have early on. It's I'm, I was so happy that my team stopped trash talking right away when we lost. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a good loss. That was a good loss. And now and now it brought you guys so far. And last but not least, with this new roster, how do you like this new roster? How do you like 
Nicolette in mid lane, and as, as well as Whole World adding to that roam position, really bring Zane into his comfort zone. Mm. Well, for the most part, aside from this week, Zane was not in his comfort zone. I think there was a lot of synergy mm -hmm. problems that we fixed through a lot of heart to heart talks this past week. Uh, Zane mentioned that he was feeling really uncomfortable playing with Apple and Chris because Apple and Chris did not even communicate with him. So we solved that this week. Mm. We spent a lot more time together. We hung out, watched MPL, and I guess it paid out. Paid off. Even when I fed, they won. So. Mm -hmm. I guess I can just carry. Well, I'm sure you did something right there. So with, like you said, communication is key, and t team sy synergy, it seems, is what you guys needed, and. You guys got it, so congratulations on that victory. I hope we have you back at this desk. I really love talking to Milo. He's always um, great to have on the show. So the, guys, the next time you get me here, I'm here. MVP, trust me. Zero deaths. <laughs> the next time you see me here, zero deaths, trust me. I'm not dying next week. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I'm not dying well, next thanks, week, guys. Thanks. No, no, no more deaths. Well, we're going to hold you accountable. We're going to hold you to that. He's not dying next week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you, Milo. Have a great rest of the night. Whoa. Oh, I'm still in shock, guys. That series. I, I feel like, in my personal op opinion, I feel like the Rome Cold World really solved MOBA Zane's, the, the MOBA Zane question. It's the, the roamer is really what gets Zane online and gets the team going. Yeah, I mean, I definitely see a lot of improvement in their gameplay from uh, day one with their debut against Area 77. Uh, Gaming Gladiators, I still think they executed pretty well in their matchup against BTK. I mean, it literally went to like a 25 minute, 25 plus <laughs> minute game which goes to show that uh all the objectives were were claimed like it was just down to who could fight it out a little bit better literally down to the wire and that's what i said i love to see it i think uh btk it, it goes to show you know when in doubt that's when they kind of strive the best when their backs are against the wall i mean we've seen this in the nact spring <coughs> season last year uh and <laughs> that's when i kind of was like okay mobile zane he's just built differently <laughs> when it comes to uh, these kind of things. And definitely credits over there to them with that. For Gaming Gladiators though, I mean, hey, you can't count them out. They're still sitting in that number one position and they're still a hard fight. It wasn't an easy battle for BTK. It was a good victory, but not an easy battle. You gotta look at the entire match. It was a 25 minute game, which means they could have lost that just as easily as they could have won it once you get to that point. And that's what it really boils down to. But unless I'm happy, you know, I'm glad to see it go out to a 25 minute game, a best of three, which I've been asking for this entire day. And to be able to not only take me by surprise, but the entire world with a reverse sweep, definitely a good uh, job from the Bloodthirsty Kings. Can't wait to see them in the, the regular season pu push forward, but also see gaming gladiators come back from that as well. Yeah, no, I mean, Weezy pretty much said the whole entire thing right there. It's, it's honestly nice to see a lot of these underdogs kind of performing super well against, you know, the, the, the ones that have dominated throughout. And I think, you know, BTK, especially with this win, has started a trend to come through, right? We've already seen a lot of uprising stars, a lot of upsets coming through. And with this win, I think it, it, it paints the path for teams like Fiends, teams like uh, the Night Horde that has success, uh, successfully, you know, grabbed up some wins here and there to see, hey, Gaming Gladiators, this is a, a possible match. If BTK can do it and we've been able to kind of keep BTK at bay, it's definitely something possible. So I think it's a very great competitive uh, match coming out from both teams. Unfortunately, Gaming Gladiators was the one that did take the loss, but it is only a one to two, right? They're still able to get the points. BTK did not switch them here so you know it just brings up the competitiveness of North America and I'm completely all for it yeah it's definitely an ego hit but not too much damage ha has been done definitely can come back in the following weeks and we're ready to see them but for this series there's an MVP and the MVP will be cool world seems like all the roamers are getting the MVPs today break it down for us Weezy that's right, Cold World on fire with this Mathilda pickup for game number two and game number three. Uh, both of those able to make up the difference, keeping the team alive when it mattered the most, getting them out of those sticky situations that they're put in by Game and Gladiators. 
not only was he able to engage, but he was also able to disengage when it mattered the most. And honestly, we don't usually get to see the Mathilda picked out too often in the NACT regular season. So it's definitely a treat to be able to see inside of uh, the final series for the day. Yeah, and honestly, I love this Matilda pick pretty much from all the way, you know, back in the days when I actually played the professional scenes. And to see the Matilda dominate in such a fashion, like, I have to give respect to Cold World, right? He's definitely been one of those set roamers back in the days, but now he's picking up this utility heavy style assassin that gets to go in and out, you know, definitely well played and completely well deserved as the MVP for tonight. Yeah, for sure. And, and we we were talking about this beforehand uh, with the Roamers don't get a lot of, of, of glory or recognition. But today, uh, the Roamers all got recognition. Every game, whether it's a T-Drill or the Matilda, all doing uh, extremely well. Now, let's take a look at what happened with this exhilarating day so far. So first have Area 77 with a sweeping defeat against <coughs> Bloodhounds. Then we had... Uh, Fiends solidified. Then we have uh, the Night Horde against Devious Activity, uh, getting a two to one. Fiends in the other half solidified a victory against Legacy. And while Legacy and Bloodhound are not looking so, their futures are not are looking pretty brim. BTK came back with a victory, two to one against Gaming Gladiators, definitely setting the show for tonight. Yeah, setting the show, setting the pace. We got to see two series go to a best of three. And uh, honestly, it's been a long night. You didn't see two series go to a best of three and the gameplay just improving with every single team competing. And we're not even halfway through the regular <laughs> season yet. So, I mean, if you think these matches were good, just wait for tomorrow and also the following uh, matches for the regular season. Yeah, no, the revolution is brewing for me. Get to see all the uprising <laughs> from all these local stars here. I keep seeing, I keep repeating it over and over, but I'd love to see all these upsets coming through in BTK. You know, getting this victory tonight is just kind of the cherry on top, again, for the Fiends, for the Night Hordes here. And I cannot wait for what we have tomorrow. For sure. And let's take a look at the standing. So... As a man of statistics, Weezy, I actually thought Gaming Gladiators will be brought down to second place with that. But it seems like they're still on the top, on the top place. So why don't you break this down more on uh, on the placement right now and how the how the third place and fourth place can't come back up with with this current standings. Yeah, I mean, right now, you're looking at Gaming Gladiators tied up with Fiends. Gaming Gladiators losing to BTK right there was huge for all the remaining teams that have a chance to get higher up to that number one position. It kind of evened out the score for BTK. Even though BTK sitting in, in that uh, fifth position, they were able to shut down Gaming Gladiators to make up their loss against Area 77. I mean, everybody on the casters desk even voted against uh, BTK winning that match up against uh, Gaming Gladiators. And to be able to pull that off really kind of negates their upset that they had against Area 77. Now, when you're looking at all these teams and you're looking at the breakdowns, something that we all have to keep in mind is this is a single round robin, which means some of the teams sitting in that high position, that two position, that three position, they haven't faced Gaming Gladiators yet. They haven't faced BTK yet. Uh, they faced teams of a lower caliber, uh, at least that what we've been seeing statistics wise. And when they have a chance to go up against some of the upper echelon teams, that's when you're gonna start seeing this uh, bracket kind of normalize and equalize as we get through the regular season but so far uh, area 77 looking really good btk obviously had a great performance today gaming gladiators took their first loss of the nact regular season definitely gonna have to see how they bounce back tomorrow and that's the cool thing about it too is getting to see all these teams in this kind of mpo philippines uh format the point system fight it out every win matters even if you don't get a victory even Gaming Gladiators taking one victory away from BTK, at least them not being sleep, still works in their favor against teams today who lost with a 0-2 sweep because they still get one additional point as they walk through the day. And one of the most interesting things about the standing is that all the teams are actually quite close. 
it could turn pretty much within a day of time. You can get the plus two, plus threes, and just push the whole entire team up. And we got Fiends tied up the first place, the dark horse of the series. Like that is absolutely unbelievable. And trailing behind, we have Night Horde, we have Devious, and we have BTK. So honestly, all these teams are relatively close. It's been a sick, such an exciting NACT here. For sure. I mean, what a season has it been from the struggling veterans like Bloodhounds, some names that we've known for many seasons, struggling to come back to as well as the uh, as as top contenders like Fiends making a scene, making an entry in this in this series, in this matchup this season. It's definitely a season that's going into the books, a season to remember. And I can't imagine what shows we're going to see in the upcoming days, in the upcoming weeks. So guys, anything else you want to add before we close the show today? Uh, no, as always, a little bit of twists, a little <laughs> bit of turns and burns in the land of dawn all across the table, some upsets, some major victories. And hey, I'm just glad to be a part of it. Look forward to seeing you guys as you progress through the regular season. You wait. I'm glad to be able to get our rush hour duo again after the NACT fall grand finals. It's been a pleasure. And also Liz looking great as ever. Thanks so much for being the host today and hope to see you guys on future shows. Yeah, no, of course, for me, you know, all the viewers out there, we did hit one of the highest peak current views. So definitely shout out to all the viewers out there supporting the teams here. And once again, right, all the uprising coming through, everyone has been playing so extremely well. You know, I cannot wait for what's going to happen, especially in the next few weeks, because, you know, all these teams are so close, tied to tied, and the standings have been quite amazing. Yeah, for sure. And like every game this season and every team has been putting on their A game. So we can only expect more memorable games to come in the following weeks. So until then, stay tuned, stay hyped. We'll see you tomorrow and we'll see you in the next following weeks.